Good. Uh, Mr. Howard, I think we're ready. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner, our, our first witness of, of, of um, today is Augustus Jasper, who's uh, the former governor of, of the um, Virgin Islands. Uh, before he takes the oath, could I just raise one point yes. uh, briefly with um, Sir Geoffrey? Uh, yesterday, I um, identified uh, some documents um, with, by reference to page numbers, which are in the hearing bundles for um, this topic and over which privilege was asserted. Uh, it's obviously quite pressing that we clarify the position of the Attorney General in relation to those documents. May I interrupt, uh, Mr. Howard? Um, the privilege is not asserted in respect of those documents. Very grateful for that confirmation. Thank you, Sir Geoffrey. Thank you, Sir Geoffrey. Um, Mr. Jasper, can, can you see and hear us? Uh, yes, I can. I understand that you wish to take an oath. Do you have a copy of the Bible with you? I do, yes. Uh, could you uh, take the Bible in your hand and repeat after me? I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Could you give the commissioner your full name, please? It is Augustus James Ulysses Jasper. And your professional address? Is Marsham Street, London, United Kingdom. This is the court reporter. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm having a hard time hearing uh, um, Mr. Jasper. So could you prevent, talk a little louder or get closer to your microphone, please? Is that better? Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. You will have received uh, copies of the hearing bundle. Um, in electronic form. Uh, can I confirm that you, you have those with you? I do. Um, and as the court um, reporter just indicated, it's important as we go through your evidence to keep your voice up uh, and to speak slowly. Uh, I think the advice I, I'm now going to give everyone is just, it's always better to shout rather than, than whisper. Um, can we just deal with some background first of all? Um, could you give the Commissioner an outline of your professional background before you took up the role of Governor in the Virgin Islands? Thank you. Um, so throughout my career, I have been a public servant in a number of different areas. That was firstly in a local authority in the United Kingdom, then in the central government of the United Kingdom government, including in Her Majesty's Treasury, the Home Office, uh, the Cabinet Office, and number 10, the Office of the uh, Prime Minister, um, before taking up appointment as uh, Governor of the British Virgin Islands. And um, what was your the period of your tenure as Governor in these islands? Uh, that was from August 2017 until January um, 2021. Uh, was the time uh, that you spent as governor extended at any point? Uh, yes, it was. It was initially for a period of three years and it was extended until January 2021. And what's your current role? I'm currently the Director General of Delivery in the United Kingdom's Home Office. That's uh, responsible for immigration, security, countering terrorism and policing and public safety. Um, you um, obviously will have um, some uh, awareness of the constitution of the Virgin Islands. Um, by all means, refer to sections of that, and we can look at them if, if we need to. But but what what was your um, and what is your understanding of the role of the governor <laughs> in the, the constitution of two thousand and seven? Thank you. Well, as you rightly say, um, the role of the governor is 
set out, both empowered and limited by the Constitution um, of the Virgin Islands 2007. That is um, essentially where, uh, during my tenure, um, but as I know with all governors, um, are taking the direction for their role. As you will be well aware within the um, constitution that sets out uh, defined functions for the governor, um, where I am empowered to exercise uh, those uh, functions. Um, uh, th these include um, section 60, where there are specific responsibilities for external affairs, for defense, including the armed forces, or internal security, that includes the police force, and the terms and conditions of um, persons holding public office, as well as the administration of courts. Uh, as governor, I also had the power to make appointments, again, in line with the constitution. Um, I believe that is section 92, um, uh, relating to uh, the, the public appointments. Um, I also had a role in chairing cabinet, uh, but not having a vote in um, cabinet uh, as well, um, uh, and also chaired the National Security Council. And in terms of the constitutional uh, limitations on the role of governor, uh, what were those? So the constitution sets out the role of governor, as I specified, and also the role of where um, power is, is essentially exercised through others, principally the um, elected government, as is set out within um, the constitutional framework. Um, the, that would be a key part of, of it, but also within in exercising my authority as governor, all of um, my actions and decisions are guided by the constitution and also by laws uh, of the territory as well, which may set out in more detail, uh, depending on what the specific law is, uh, the role of the governor pertinent uh, to that particular issue. Um, it, it has been submitted uh, to the commissioner that for the last 20 to 30 years, uh, governors have sat in cabinet and done nothing. Would you accept that as a characterization of the role of the governor in the BVI? No, I don't accept that. So the governor has a number of roles in cabinet. Prior to cabinet, the governor um, you know, is with, alongside the premier and the cabinet secretary in shaping the agenda as part of the cabinet steering group. The governor then as chair of cabinet um, may sometimes also bring papers uh, pertinent to those areas where there are governor's responsibilities. I mentioned the section 60 areas, for example. The governor also, and in line with the constitution and the spirit of modern partnership, as governor, I would in cabinet often question, challenge, support um, some of the discussions and deliberations um, that were there as well. And finally, the governor also has a role um, in uh, helping to ensure that the cabinet secretary uh, takes forward the minutes or and records the decisions and would um, sign off with cabinet those minutes of the meetings. Could you just explain the process um, by which minutes were agreed? Uh, the process was essentially that the cabinet secretary um, would prepare a draft of the meeting, um, the, which was then would be returned to the next meeting for agreement by uh, or any amendment or comment um, by cabinet and any discussion of matters arising from those uh, minutes prior to um, my signature as chair of cabinet. So the, the whole of cabinet would have to approve the minutes from the last meeting? Uh, yes, the practice was that uh, the first item of any cabinet meeting was the discussion by cabinet of those previous minutes. However, there was a period when um, the record keeping was not kept up to date, um, where the cabinet minutes were not prepared between each cabinet meeting. During those meetings, um, we did not start with the uh, cabinet uh, minutes as the first item. And what was the reason for this uh, slippage in record keeping? Um, 
Well, really, it was, a, it was an area which uh, I encourage that we do get back to good record keeping. It was a core tenant, I believed, of, of approach that we need to have in place. Part of it was due to, at that time, the height of the COVID pandemic, where we were holding very long meetings and making uh, decisions which were recorded as decisions in the meeting um, for sometimes very rapid uh, communication. Um, I did write to the cabinet at one point, encouraging them to um, both get meeting papers in advance, but also we held discussions, which I led to try and encourage that the, uh, we prioritise getting the cabinet minutes back into place and into um, good order. And in, in terms of, of getting the minutes back into good order, um, is that a, um, a function of the governor as chair of cabinet or was it um, a, a something that fell to the whole of cabinet? But the cabinet secretary is, is appointed to, to undertake the, the minutes um, and to take those, but it was um, a decision by the whole of cabinet a number of times where we did not take those minutes. I encouraged that we would hold sessions to agree the minutes and to work through essentially what was a backlog of the minutes. Um, and a number of times uh, in those cabinet discussions, my suggestion was not uh, taken forward by other members of cabinet. Why was your suggestion not taken forward, were you told? Well, it, as I'm sure you understand, I can't the cabinet discussions are confidential, so it wouldn't be appropriate for me to, to divulge uh, independent or in individual ministers or, or members of cabinet's uh, views or those discussions, but it was a, a, a position taken by, by uh, the collective of, of cabinet. As I said, I don't have a vote uh, in that. Your voice is dropping a little bit, Mr. Jasper, so if, if you could just remember just um, to keep it up, please. It follows, doesn't it, from, from um, what how you've responded to earlier questions, that you, your position is that the, the governor does have a significant role to play under the 2007 constitution. Yes, that is correct. But as governor, uh, whom are you accountable? Well, I'm accountable in, in a number of ways as governor. Firstly, I'm formally accountable to Her Majesty the Queen and the Secretary of State, but also I'm accountable to the laws of the territory, to the British Virgin Islands and the constitution that we just um, uh, discussed. I'm also, there is no immunity as a governor. Um, I'm accountable through the frameworks um, of the laws of the, um, of the territory. I also instigated and pushed that a governor should be um, held to account in a way through, through an open approach with the media and also with the public. So I would regularly hold um, discussion sessions or catch ups with the media as well to explain the work of the governor. But there isn't um, an obligation under the constitution of 2007 for a governor to have to appear in front of the House of Assembly, for example and answer questions. That is correct. Nor would you have to appear in front of um, a, a committee um, comprised of, of, of elected officers together with members of the public. Um, that is uh, also correct. And, and so doesn't it follow that under the constitution, uh, there is an absence of accountability to those people who would be most directly affected by decisions that a governor takes? Well, it is, as I said earlier, the, the governor is accountable in, in effect through the laws of the territory that both grant powers and limit powers of the governor and for the constitution of the territory. Those are, are the laws, are the democratically elected laws put in place by well, uh, laws of the territory put in place by the democratic, democratically elected representatives of uh, the territory. So I feel that that essentially gives a strong framework around um, the role of the governor. Would you accept um, that as governor, you, you wear two hats? Uh, 
um, you are expected to speak on behalf of the BVI, but you are also accountable to the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and, and the Secretary of State. So, yes, it, you could uh, see it as wearing two hats. I didn't particularly during my time in the British Virgin Islands ever really find that I was having to consciously wear two hats, um, though, uh, because the interests of the uh, that I swore as uh, and taking up off office were the interest to serve the interests of the people of the British Virgin Islands and to serve Her Majesty. The interests of the United Kingdom are those of the people of the British Virgin Islands, and the interests in my role with the government of the Virgin Islands as governor were the people of the British Virgin Islands as well. So whilst it could be characterised as two hats, for me, really, it was one, one hat in one position, which was about what is in the best interests of the people of the Virgin Islands, as is set out through the Constitution. Um, the preamble to the Constitution contains these words. Affirming that the people of the Virgin Islands have generally expressed their desire to become a self-governing people and to exercise the highest degree of control over the affairs of their country at this stage of its development. And noting that the United Kingdom, the administering power for the time being, has articulated a desire to enter into a modern partnership with the Virgin Islands based on the principles of mutual respect and self-determination. Now, those, or, or that preamble must have been something that uh, you would have had to keep in mind when exercising your powers as a governor. Certainly. In fact, I would say even more than keep in mind, it was a guiding principle. Um, it is not just a constitution, it's also Article 73 of the United Nations. Uh, setting out um, uh, similar principles around that. And so in operating my role as governor, that uh, during my tenure, it was both the, the law of the constitution as well as the spirit of the constitution, um, including a set out through that preamble, which was a key guide to how I operated throughout. And you mentioned Article uh, 73 of the United Nations Charter. The, the point there is the reference to developing self-government, isn't it? Correct, yes. And do you also accept that um, in white paper in 1999 and 2012, um, the UK government committed to a modern partnership with the BVI? Yes, that is. Uh, correct. And those um, commitments the pre uh, that we find in the preamble, in Article 73, and in the white papers come to this, do they not? That the UK government, in its dealings uh, with um, the BVI, whether through a governor or whether through um, other organs of the state, needs to conduct itself on the basis that this is a modern partnership and on the basis that all the steps it takes should be intended to um, develop and promote self-government. Would you agree with yes, that? I yes, I would uh, agree with that. And that was uh, an important part of my, my approach in, uh, in my time as governor. Uh, there is something about in promoting the importance of, of growing self-determination and growing uh, strengthening of the territory itself is also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, about uh, upholding the constitution and making sure also that at times um, I was challenging the elected government to help ensure that um, standards are upheld to take the self-determination ever further and stronger as well. So your voice dropped a little bit. Could you just repeat what you the, the, the last um, part of what you said? Sorry, I'm going to try and move the 
computer nearer to me. So give me one minute if that if that will help if my because I am shouting rather loudly at the top of my voice. So let me rearrange um, my setup here. Is that better, Mr. Rowett? It's sounding as if it is. Good. Um, sorry, could you, um, the, the question was uh, surrounding the last part of my comments. What, uh, Stop. You, just, you, you were um, speaking about um, self-determination and I, I just wanted to ask you just to repeat what, what the last part of what you said. Yes, yeah, so what I was saying at the end was that as part of a commitment to self-determination, um, that sometimes meant that I would need to support, um, encourage, sometimes challenge the um, uh, elected government as well on the principles, for example, of good governance or helping to ensure that uh, self-determination was made stronger through the uh, practices and approaches that were taken forward. You mentioned um, good governance. Um, what did you see um, the role of yourself as governor to be when it comes to, or when it came to good governance? Well, the constitution of the British Virgin Islands is different to some constitutions. For example, the Cayman Islands constitutions, where it is specifically stated as a uh, within the constitution. However, it runs throughout, I believe, um, the role of the governor to promote good governance, to promote um, adherence to the laws of the territory, um, the constitution itself, and the, the principles that are set out uh, within that. So for me, that was something that was core to what I was doing to help um, build up those institutions, to help take forward progress on laws um, that could strengthen the frameworks around good governance, and to challenge good. Uh, or areas where I perceived that good governance was falling short as well. Finally, obviously, the uh, role of the governor as under the Commission of Inquiry Act, it is down to the governor where, um, to, to, who has the power to call an inquiry, as you are well aware, should, those, should there be concerns that warrant it at that level. And um, I called the inquiry because of very serious concerns relating to, to good governance that had been presented uh, to me. And those alleged failings in good governance were key areas that I had no option other than to call the Commission of Inquiry to ensure that they could be uh, looked into. Uh, now, the Commission has sent you what we call a, a warning letter. Uh, do you have a copy of that? It's dated the 4th of October, 2021. I, I do, yes. If I could explain, Mr. Jasper, the letter is confidential, but what it, um, its purpose is, uh, um, is to give uh, the recipient notice of potential criticisms that may be made of them uh, in the Commissioner's report. Now, under the Commissioner's protocol concerning potential criticisms, a participant uh, can raise a, a potential criticism of another. And in this case, um, the elected ministers who are participants uh, have raised criticisms of you. Um, the Commissioner also determined there was another criticism that ought to be put to you. Uh, and um, you were then asked uh, to provide a response to that. I should make clear that these potential criticisms do not represent the provisional or concluded view of the Commissioner. Uh, the reason you are giving uh, given an opportunity um, not only to have notice of them but also to respond to them is to ensure that you are treated fairly. Um, you have provided a, a written response to those criticisms, is that right? I have, yes, that's correct. And um, do you have a copy of that with you? I, I do, yes. And can you confirm that it's dated the 14th of October 2021 and carries your signature. Uh, both of those are correct. Yes. Um, you've um, annexed to it a, a, a document, but can I? Can you confirm that you are content that your written response, together with any accompanying documents, 
uh, should stand as part of your evidence to this commission? Uh, yes, I am content. Thank you. I'd like to take you through um, that written response, but as we do so, to um, put, put it in a wider context and, and show you some other documents um, on which you might be able to assist the commissioner. Now, the first criticism, potential criticism that is raised is that uh, your statement and actions led to a perception of disrespect for elected governments. And uh, the example is given that in December 2020, uh, you briefed the press um, that yourself and the deputy governor were to bring forward the integrity in public life bill, uh, making no reference to a previous decision of cabinet to approve uh, integrity in public life policy. Um, I think we've provided you with a minute of cabinet. As the page number 345 at the bottom of it. And it's the cabinet meeting number 30 of 2019. Do you have that? Um, which bundle is that in, uh, please, Mr. Wright? I think it was provided um, uh, uh, by email as a separate document. I believe I have that. If it is, um, if you look at the number thirty of twenty nineteen, yes, and it, it the, the, when you look at the page that says thirty of twenty nineteen, it should have the number three nine six at the bottom. Yes, I can confirm I've got that. It's um, the minute of a cabinet meeting on the seventh um, of November twenty nineteen, and I should explain, Mr. Jasper, that when the deputy governor. Um, gave evidence, uh, which was on, on day 17 of our proceedings, I uh, canvassed uh, this minute with him. And if I could ask you just to turn through, please, to page 402. Let me know when you've got there. Yes, I am on page 402. Um, now this refers to memorandum number 378, 2019. And then it indicates that, that you as governor um, was bringing this memorandum uh, to cabinet and it's headed integrity in public life policy. Um, am I right to say that you were the person bringing it to cabinet? Um, that is correct, yes. It was, I believe, a paper prepared by the Deputy Governor and I was bringing it to, to Cabinet. Um, if we look onto the next page, it says that, that uh, page 403, that you, you presented um, the paper. Um, and you explain that, um, or the Premier raised a, an issue as to what the approach was in other countries with respect to drafting integrity legislation, and in particular who would determine the chairman of, of the Integrity Commission. Um, he, he explained that in some countries the Governor General selected the chair and others the Prime Minister would choose the chairman of a commission. Um, the deliberations then continued um, discussing various aspects of the policy and if you go over to page 404 
there were further deliberations and in the course of which running through the document, um, you said that um, the bill wasn't meant to be a straight jacket, but would help to raise standards and help people do the right thing or carry out the right intentions. Um, you also said that the public service must be free of corruption if the goal was to develop a world-class public service. Um, the Premier pointed out the importance of appointing true professionals to the Integrity Commission, and he referred to the use of retired judges. Um, and the importance of having a chairman of an integrity commission who was not partial. Um, you then at 32 said that um, this integrity and in public life policy was the component of a wider suite of proposed legislation, including the Public Service Management Act and the Whistleblowers Bill. You stated AG had mentioned that he drafted the Whistleblowers Bill, but there were elements already included in the Public Service Act, and therefore it was being amended. Um, you also suggested that there be consultation with the public service as stakeholders as a first step. You concluded that um, the last part of the deliberations that's recorded is that the chairman stressed the need to get the integrity and public life bill right. It was not just about passing legislation, but that the effectiveness of the implementation phase was important. Um, the decision was that cabinet reviewed and approved the draft integrity and public life policy. Um, and, and there was this part of the decision that cabinet was asked to take to decide that the bill entitled integrity and public life 2003 be reviewed in line with the policy and incorporate a review of the register of interest and complaints commissions act. So against that background, Mr. Jasper, could, could you just explain firstly, the circumstances which saw you bringing uh, an integrity in life policy to cabinet in November 2019. Thank you. So um, the first thing was that this was areas of work that had been taken forward by the deputy governor's office uh, and hence it was for me to take those to cabinet. As you noted in the minutes this was part of a suite of, of reforms um, including the public um, Public Service Management Act, which the Deputy Governor was also working on um, with colleagues across, uh, across government. So it was for me as the in, um, Governor uh, to take the, this paper to um, Cabinet. But how long had the, this work been ongoing for? Um, the, the work on the Integrity in Public Life Act, I'm afraid I haven't got the exact dates of when it had started, but had, this had been for, for quite a while preceding this prior to the, the um, uh, draft act coming to uh, cabinet as was discussed at this uh, meeting that you refer to. But, um, so, so what, Sorry, what... policy I believe it was, I said, yeah, and, and the Integrity in Public Life um, policy that would then guide the act. But have I understood this right, that in terms of the integrity in life policy and the whistleblowers bill um, and the Public Service Management Act, um, the, the entity that was leading on that at that time was the, the governor's group? Yes, that is, uh, that is correct. And presumably, although you can't be precise, the work had been going on for some time. Yes, the work had been going on for some time, uh, but it also involved um, consultation and discussion, including with um, the, the Premier, uh, and as was here uh, with other colleagues at, at uh, Cabinet as, as well. But it was a, a significant piece of work that was being undertaken by uh, my group, or the Deputy Governor's Office, uh, and hence, uh, as the uh, it was a paper that I brought forward to to cabinet for cabinet's uh, approval, which, as you can see from the notes, they subsequently uh, did approve that and decided that the work um, goes forward, and decided that the under the as is noted under twenty three three, and decided that the deputy governor's office takes it forward with the attorney general's chambers to draft uh, the new public. Uh, draft the new um, bill. 
if you turn up the um, bundle one of the governance bundles, that we send the hearing bundles for, for this hearing. It's page 339. Tell me when you're there. Uh, I am there. Is this the speech from the throne? Yes, so this is the, the, the speech from the throne, 14th of November 2019, so just a week after you had brought that paper to Cabinet. You're delivering the speech, but it is prepared, uh, as you explain, on the next page um, within the Premier's office in consultation with, with ministries. Now, if you go through to page 344, The, there is reference there to um, legislation on integrity of public life being brought forward uh, to promote, preserve and promote the integrity of public officials and public institutions. And then there's also reference to uh, whistleblower legislation. So at that point, when you are delivering the speech from the throne, was it your understanding that the uh, Deputy Governor's Office would take the lead in taking this legislation and these policies forward? Yes, that is correct. And just to elaborate a little bit on this, that you will see in the speech from the throne, um, there are, as I state at the beginning of that uh, speech, it is myself delivering it, um, but it is a, a speech that is prepared within the Premier's office in consultation with um, ministries. It's then, the speech is then deliberated and uh, approved by the elected government of the Virgin Islands. Within that speech, you will see a number of different bills. This is essentially the legislative programme of the government. And the preparation and development of those policies and bills goes through to the respective ministries. So some of those may be the Ministry of Natural Resources and Labour and Immigration. Some would have been through to, for example, Ministry of um, Education or the Premier's Office, for example, on things like uh, um, uh, looking down it, I can see things such as Customs Management and Duties Act, and some would fall to the Governor's uh, group, such as, for example, in this case, the integrity, um, as we've discussed, integrity in public life policy, but there were also, within that speech, other areas, such as the, I believe, the Police Act, um, and also the Witness Anonymity Bill. And so what was completely normal practice was for um, the respective lead at cabinet to bring their paper from their respective ministry or group, which was what I was doing in this case, in the integrity and public life policy. And then it was established practice and policy that the respective lead, after a decision by cabinet, would then communicate that uh, respective policy uh, uh, more widely, including to the public. So I read the perceived criticism or alleged criticism um, that the governor or myself as governor um, uh, talked about the integrity and public life bill um, but that was completely normal practice that I as the, the uh, attendee of covenant who had taken that paper talked about it similarly if we had taken an education uh, policy or an education act I would expect the minister of education to be talking about that afterwards or if it was the police act I may be talking about, or police policy um, afterwards. This was um, no disrespect, it was near completely following the established uh, practice and procedures of um, uh, cabinet approaches. Can we come back to that uh, in a moment, but um, just sticking with the chronology. So we're in November 2019, you've given this. There are various documents, and I don't want to, uh, to show you all of them, but that show um, that work was going on 
um, between um, different departments and the deputy governor's office uh, in relation to integrity of public life. So if you turn up page 470, please. Let me know when you're there, Mr. Jasper. Zero. Zero, please. Yes, I am on page uh, 470. Um, and if we're both on the same page, this is a memorandum from the Director of Human Resources to the Permanent Secretary in the Deputy Governor's Office on the 12th of November 2020, making comments on an integrity of public life bill. Um, so so that, that indicates, does it not, that at least in November 2020, uh, the Deputy Governor's Office was still taking the lead in relation to this bill? Uh, that is uh, correct. The Deputy Governor's Office were taking the lead in relation to that. Um, as was noted at the Cabinet on the 7th of November, as we just discussed through those uh, minutes, um, and as is expected, the Deputy Governor's Office or would consult others on the development of policy. And what, what role in this process would you as Governor have? Well, I am the manager of the Deputy Governor, as well as head of essentially of the Governor's Group, to which the Deputy Governor's Office uh, falls within my uh, remit. I also obviously constitutionally have um, responsibility for the terms and conditions of public uh, offices within the territory, of which in, in this case this um, was part of um, or linked to and part of um, that responsibility as well. We're now a year on from um, speech from the throne. And if I could ask you just to go please to page 483. You should have a, a cabinet memorandum um, 505 of 2020 dated the 13th of December 2020. Yes, I have that. That has been produced by the Premier's office. Um, and in terms of background on, on integrity of, on an Integrity and Public Life Act, it refers to um, the good governance principles, the constitution, that efforts have been made since the 1990s to introduce public service into integrity legislation in the BVI, um, and previous governments have recognized the need for a framework to guide, support, and assure that the conduct of public affairs by public officials conforms with internationally accepted standards of integrity. It refers to 2003, a draft of an integrity in public policy. Sorry, you were breaking up. Could you start that last part, please? Yes, certainly. Sorry, Mr. Kazdan. The paper, Mr. Jasper, refers to previous efforts that were made to introduce public service integrity legislation. And it notes that those were being made since the 1990s. And it refers to a, a draft of 2003, um, but which didn't advance beyond the consultative stage. Uh, but uh, some did find its some sections did find its way in, in the Register of Interest Act. On at four, it refers to the 11th of January 2018, when Cabinet considered a paper titled "Status Report: Strategic Direction for an Improved Public Service." And, and what said is that Cabinet approved the Good Governance Strategy, requested full development and implementation of the following within the first quarter of 2018. Public Service Management Act, Integrity Commission, Ministerial Code. 
um, there's then at five on the next page reference to um, the Public Service Management Bill, the establishment of a working group to review a draft ministerial code. Um, it notes at seven that the um, Cabinet had noted via memo 55 of 2020 the Premier's update on progress made to ensure um, good governance in public affairs in the first 11 months of his government's administration and noted that the integrity in public life will be among several pieces of good governance legislation that will come to cabinet during the course of 2020. Um, and then says that the, the need for integrity legislation was championed by the current premier and minister of finance, noted that when he was appointed leader of the opposition, he also championed this cause. Um, it then um, continues through, it makes reference to an integrity commission. Um, And then in terms of the decision um, that uh, Cabinet is asked to take, we see that at 492. Um, where Cabinet is uh, uh, reviews and notes a bill which was attached to the paper that we've just looked at, headed Integrity in Public Life Act 2020, um, decreed that Cabinet in the, the decision taken in cabinet memo 378 2019 so that's the memo that we looked at at the start where the deputy governor was deemed to be given the sole lead on this matter and then approved that the deputy governor and the premier's office work in collaboration on this matter with the premier's office as the lead seeing that the scope is wider than public offices now um that when the Premier's office introduces its own bill. Prior to the matter coming to Cabinet, were you aware of that development? I'm sorry, the, relating to the development of this paper specifically? or Yes, so, so as, as I understand the sequence, in um, September 2019, yes. so, and I, I said that uh, I erroneously said that speech from the throne was a week after that. It was in fact in November 2019. But in September 2019, we have you bringing forward to cabinet a minute where you introduce a suite of bills, including integrity in public life. Then in December 2020, the Premier's office brings to cabinet an integrity in public life act of 2020, which rescinds the memo that you brought to cabinet. Were you aware that the Premier's office was going to take that step before it arrived in front of cabinet? I will need to fully refresh my memory here um, on the exact sequence of events. But what I was aware of at the time was that the Deputy Governor had been working with the Attorney General and with others, including permanent secretaries across the uh, public service to take forward the cabinet decision uh, of the cabinet of November 2019 that we previously discussed um, to to um, develop the integrity in public life uh, bill. I believe I was not consulted on a different bill that came forward um, by um, uh, the Premier um, as was uh, you just outlined came into the cabinet of um i believe 18th of december 2020 if it was that uh, that cabinet uh, there um i do recall and in fact if i go down in the bundle to 494 i then wrote to the deputy governor and the attorney general who had been working on the integrity and public life bill uh, setting out um that the um uh that the a separate paper had been tabled to the one that they were working on um or had been um, working on so from my recollection of of the time and looking at what is here when i went into that cabinet meeting on in december 2020 i had been under the impression that uh, the deputy governor's office in partnership with all the others who, who uh, we've just discussed were leading uh, on this 
and uh, the Premier presented a, a different position in FUNAT Cabinet paper. If you um, <clears throat> look at the next page in the bundle 494, This um, is a letter dated 18th of December 2020, um, which you sent to the Deputy Governor and the Attorney General. And you write um, of your gratitude to them and their um, officers and colleagues for the work they've done on the Integrity and Public Life Bill. You describe it as a positive demonstration of cross-ministry collaboration and say, I fully support the intent behind the bill, which is to improve good governance and transparency in BVI. You continue, as you know, Cabinet Memo 378-2019 set out that Cabinet had agreed the Deputy Governor would work up a policy and liaise with the Attorney General's Chambers to take this forward. At this week's meeting of Cabinet on December 16th, Premier presented his own paper and separate integrity in public life bill. bill. As I step out, I believe this is consistent. I'm sorry, I'm losing you because there's a little bit of background noise cutting you off, Mr. Marat. Mr. Marat. Um, what I'll do, uh, Mr. Kazdan, is I'll read that paragraph again. Um, what you've written, Mr. Jasper, is this. This is the Attorney General and the Deputy Governor. As you know, Cabinet Memo 378 of set out that Cabinet had agreed the Deputy Governor would work up a policy and the Attorney General should make this. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm still losing you. The, the, it keeps dropping and now we're hearing a dog barking in the background. Tribute to my reading skills. Certainly, um, uh, though, those who are not um, uh, speaking, such as Mr. Jasper, Mr. Rawat, if, if they could mute, that that may help. Uh, but um, uh, Mr. Rawat, uh, could you read that again? Yes. Thank you. Um, what you wrote in your letter, uh, Mr. Jasper, was, as you know, Cabinet Memo 378 of 2019 set out that Cabinet had agreed the Deputy Governor would work up a policy and liaise with the Attorney General's Chambers to take this forward. At this week's meeting of Cabinet on December 16, outside of that decision, the Premier presented his own paper and a separate integrity in public life bill, which you describe as the Premier's bill. And then you continue, as I set out in Cabinet, I believe this is inconsistent with section 60 of the Constitution, which clearly sets out that terms and conditions of services of persons holding or acting in public offices are a responsibility of the governor. And you say that accordingly, pursuant to section 43 of the constitution, I'm requesting that you and your officers, officers continue and complete the work underway on the integrity and public life bill, being cognizant of the premier's bill to ensure that the final bill reflects all ministries of government and most importantly delivers good governance and integrity for the people of BVI. I look forward to seeing a final draft of the Integrity and Public Life Bill early in the new year, in order that I can take a paper to Cabinet early in the new year. Um, now that's as of the um, 16th of uh, December, uh, or 18th of December, two days after that Cabinet uh, meeting. Um, now, What's said in the potential criticism that's raised by the Attorney General is that, on behalf of the elected ministers, is that the example is given that on 3rd of December 2020, the former governor briefed press that the deputy governor and he were to bring forward the integrity in public life bill, making no reference to previous cabinet's decision to approve integrity in public life policy. Um, but breaking that down um, and keeping to the chronology, uh, firstly, um, 
what do you understand by the reference to previous cabinet's decision to approve integrity in public life policy? Sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Just, but you, you are now on mute, I think. Yeah, apologies. Um, so the, the previous um, cabinet was the cabinet we discussed, which was the 7th of November, I believe, 2019 cabinet, at which, um, as we uh, highlighted earlier, I took a paper forward on the integrity and public life policy prepared by the deputy governor. The deputy governor then in good faith took that work forward, um, having had cabinet's agreement to take it, it forward as such. I know he consulted, as you also highlighted, across a range of different ministries and individuals. Um, and um, that was the, the position that I had been, been following on, on uh, since that cabinet in November 2019. I have to admit the, my memory on, on recalling exactly each cabinet, but looking at when we come back to the 18th of December, 20, sorry, 16th of December, 2020 cabinet, I believe is the second one you're um, referring to, which I believe was after um, the point that I had made a, a statement, as I said, which is very normal for I to do or the respective minister or lead um, to do on any matter that's that's been to, to cabinet and has had cabinet's approval on. So that 16th of December cabinet meeting was, was after that point. I do remember being somewhat surprised at the time that the having uh, operated in a fully partnership approach as was my intention throughout my tenure as, as government, as governor uh, with the gov elected government, the uh, premier uh, brought forward this paper um, that was separate to the decision that had been agreed at the previous cabinet and um, without the wide consultation or partnership approach that I um, uh, could have mitigated any sort of potential for there being two different bills out in on the same um, subject. Thank you. Um, but what you appeared to have done in from your letter in, on the 18th of December 2020, uh, it, take the decision that work should continue uh, on the bill that the Deputy Governor had been working on, and that ultimately there would be a paper that you could take uh, to Cabinet. Um, what was the basis of you taking a paper back to Cabinet in circumstances where Cabinet had rescinded uh, your original paper? So the, the letter you refer to, I just for clarity, that is the 18th of December 2020 letter to the Deputy Governor and Attorney General, I assume. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, as I said, I was somewhat surprised that the Premier, when I had been attempting to operate in, in strong partnership throughout, um, brought a separate paper on integrity in, in public life uh, policy without um, the, the partnership consultation uh, on it. As I set out in the letter in the integrity in uh, that, that letter of the 18th of December 2020, at that point, um, my concern rightly was for the um, responsibilities that I had um, relating to um, the uh, uh, section 60 and the terms and conditions of public uh, officers. And we did have the work underway in the public integrity and public life bill to take forward um, work to uh, improve those conditions through the, the standards setting as part of the integrity and public life bill. So that was my interpretation of the work that needed to continue on that uh, part of the um, uh, area of work, the integrity and public life bill as is listed in that um, letter and was wanting that to be uh, cognizant of the separate bill that had been um, put forward, which is in the letter referred to as the Premier's uh, bill. Um, and, and you refer to section 60 um, because, and you say that you, you, you raised in Cabinet that the Premier presenting his own paper was inconsistent with section 60 because that gives you responsibility for terms and conditions of, of public officers. 
but but you then um, you, the request that you make to the deputy governor and the attorney general is based on section 43, which says in any case in which the governor is required under this section to consult the cabinet, uh, the governor shall act in accordance with the advice of the cabinet unless in his or her opinion such advice would affect a matter for which he or she is responsible under section 60. Just explain to the commissioner in, in sort of working terms why section 43 allowed you uh, to take this step that we see in this letter. So I'm working off memory here from the events at the time, but reading it and my recollection of the events were that I was taking forward um, the policy, the integrity and public life policy, which was linked to the terms and conditions included to the codes for public officers um, uh, as well. So those conditions of public officers as part of the responsibility under section uh, 60. A separate bill was, um, or separate, uh, uh, policy bill was was presented, which I wasn't confident um, and been consulted on or involved in, despite my constitutional responsibilities. And hence, um, I uh, wrote to the deputy governor and the attorney general. Um, the um, as is, as you set out, um, quoting section forty three of the consultation, um, that. Uh, um, I, I was taking it, it forward on my, my view that um, the that this work needed to, to continue as part of the responsibilities re relating to section 60. The, the, the last uh, piece of correspondence I have to show you is at page, page 560 in the same bundle, please. You have there uh, an email um, from the Attorney General. I think it's to um, Parliamentary Council, so it's Council in her chambers, headed Integrity and Public Life Act. And it says, the Integrity and Public Life Bill is now internally controversial. Please review the attached correspondence. Um, we need to resolve the current conundrum where the Premier bought a version of the bill after DGO had been working with Chambers to produce a draft. Grateful for your <laughs> resolution, the government would like for the bill to be introduced into the House of Assembly later this month. Um, can you help at all with, with whether uh, between your, your uh, letter to the Attorney General of 16th of December, 2020, or 18th of December, sorry, um, and this email, you had any discussions with the Attorney General? about the integrity and public life bill. Thank you. This email you refer to is, is the 8th of March, 2021 email. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Um, the, uh, obviously I was not serving as governor at that point. I'd, I'd left office in, in January, uh, 2021. So I can only talk for the time when I was um, governor, um, if that is okay. But to answer the question specifically in terms of, of in that, period when I was still um, governor. Yes, I did discuss with the Attorney General and the Deputy Governor the integrity in public life uh, policy and how this could be um, taken forward um, uh, effectively. Um, as is alluded to in that um, email of the 8th of March, although it's not for me to, to um, presume uh, anything on behalf of uh, the Honourable Attorney General um, on it, but it did, to use the words, internally controversial um, around that. And I would have spoken, I believe, um, after the exchange of letters on how we take forward this area of work to ensure that there is a, uh, the, the integrity and public life policy is, is, um, is forwarded um, uh, in its development. Uh, would that have, um, in terms of discussions, would that have involved the Honourable Premier? Yes, so I, I'm, I'm sure I would have spoken to the Honourable Premier about it. Um, 
Unfortunately, despite multiple requests I, uh, for regular meetings, I had encouraged weekly meetings, um, then also encouraged at least every second week a meeting. These weren't always responded to, um, but when I did have the opportunity to, to discuss with the Premier, I, I would on a number of uh, matters, including these kind of, kind of areas, if there were any disagreements. My, my aim was to have more regular meetings so that we would, as I said earlier, strongly committed to uh, a modern partnership and a strong and effective partnership and strongly committed to a, a strong relationship uh, with the Premier as well. So I had hoped that there would have been more regular meetings to be able uh, to enable these kind of discussions or to prevent the kind of situation where um, we are in the middle of Cabinet with a, a bill being presented, which, uh, as was in the um, uh, 16th of December 2020 Cabinet, which hadn't been um, widely consulted on and clearly took, uh, its, its work or development had taken both myself as, as well as other members um, somewhat by surprise. But the, from your perspective as governor, um, is this a, a fair summary that, that you considered that, that the matter properly lay with the deputy governor because of your responsibilities under section 60? Yes, it lay with the deputy government in, in relation to the public um, holders of public office, those in uh, the terms and conditions of public officers, it, it's uh, clearly related to um, well, my responsibility, but the deputy governor taking forward that uh, on my behalf. But just to, to stress a point, which is really important, everything I took forward, whether it, uh, whichever part of section 60 it, it fell under, I would take forward in a partnership approach with the elected uh, government. And that was a, a key tenant throughout my, my time as governor. That was one of my guiding principles. We talked earlier about uh, some of those guiding uh, principles. Um, and that was you know, the, the, the a core part of the constitutional relationship. And so even if something was assigned um, constitutionally to my group or was an area that cabinet had assigned to me uh, or two areas of my group, for example, later during the COVID crisis, there was uh, or COVID pandemic period, cabinet requested a function to be assigned to the deputy governor, which was more about the, the health response and setting up a, a contact center. Um, uh, but taking that, that forward as per a cabinet uh, decision, still important that that was taken forward in, in partnership approach with the um, elected government. You have the, um, the third bundle, which has, it's mostly made up of correspondence. I do, but you'll have to bear with me because it's electronic. So I'll have to just open that up on the system. Thank you, I've located the third bundle. Thank you. Um, it should have the front cover that just says additional material provided by elected ministers. If you go through it, please, to page 28. I'm on page 28. Is that uh, Ben Merrick visit follow up? Yes, uh, a letter dated 18th of June 2019 uh, from the Honourable Premier to Ben Merrick, who was the director of the Overseas Territories Directorate at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. 
um, and um, the Honourable Premier uh, is responding uh, following a visit that Mr Merrick paid to the BVI in, uh, earlier in June uh, and following a series of meetings. Um, what the Premier said was, um, we discussed a number of important issues on which I stated the Territory's position and he then set out the following. Under the heading Register of Interests, uh, Register of Interests of Ministers will be made public immediately following further consultation with the Governor. I'm going to pause there. This is in, in June uh, 2019. <clears throat> um, was there further consultation with you about publishing the interests of ministers? I believe there, there was, and I also believe with the Attorney General um, as well. And what was the outcome of that consultation? Um, I'm afraid I don't have that document here unless you can refer me to it in the bundle. So I'm operating from memory. But I believe the outcome of that was that the um, uh, that there would be uh, amendments to the Registry of Interest Act required in order to take forward um, that uh, position. What's also said under the heading of Integrity Commission, uh, an Integrity Commission will be established by the end of 2019, led by the Premier's office as the lead minister. Now, were you aware of, of, of that aspect of the discussions with Mr. Merrick? Uh, yes, I can see I was uh, part of that uh, meeting and was copied, as is down on below on page 29, was copied uh, that letter um, as well. That letter included a number of things which weren't uh, fully taken forward um, in, in terms of some of those commitments. Um, we come back to that, but but if if the um, premier is is committing to establishing by the end of 2019 an integrity commission led by his his lead ministry, uh, would you not have been aware that it was his intention that in terms of integrity in public life policy, it should come within the ambit of one of his ministries? No, that's not my recollection of that discussion or that went down on. Um, that letter, that letter is, is obviously one from the, the Premier, I'm, uh, I don't have here the note of the other of Mr Merrick's uh, uh, conversations of it, but there's an important point here which is this letter as I see from the date is the 18th of June 2019, um, the position on the integrity and public life policy I believe was presented in 2018 first to Cabinet, where it was agreed of the arrangements for how it would be taken forward. Um, it was then presented after this letter in the 7th of November, um, or I believe it was 7th of November, the November cabinet that we discussed earlier in 2019, again where cabinet um, agreed that it should be taken forward by the deputy governor's office. This, this letter may refer to that any, any acts need to be taken, need to be taken by a uh, elected member of government and uh, so that may be what's referred to there, but I can't um, uh, make assumptions beyond that. Thank you. Um, in fairness to you, uh, Mr Jasper, I should say that um, you have not had access to, to all the records that would have been generated during your time as governor and, and that you yourself might have generated in terms of letters. And so you're, you're dependent really on what the uh, commission has provided to you. Is that right? Uh, that is correct, yes. In that case, um, can I uh, urge you uh, perhaps to not to speculate if I appreciate that time has passed. So if, if you cannot remember something, please do say so. Um, just before we leave this letter, there's a, just a couple of points to draw to your attention. Um, on, there's a heading called tender waivers. And, and when um, the Premier states the, the territory position, he writes this. Tender waivers are exceptions to the normal tendering process that should only be done for legitimate reasons that are clearly explained in the decision. Um, if you can remember, um, this appears to be an issue that was raised in the meeting with Mr Merrick, um, but why was it being raised? 
I, from memory, I remember uh, being concerned and making these concerns both to Cabinet and to Mr Merrick in uh, Foreign Office, uh, or Foreign and Commonwealth Office as it was then, um, about the uh, practice of tender waivers um, and my concerns that uh, we, which I made also to the Premier um, and, as I said, to Cabinet, that, uh, that the laws requiring tenders to be undertaken uh, were not always followed and encouraged that we should, in the interests of value for money for the people of the British Virgin Islands, um, that there should be uh, the correct approach taken to tender waivers. Um, there are a number of matters on this this letter refers to in particular the recovery development agency in the UK loan guarantee that we may need to, to come back to. But under transparency and accountability, the Premier makes this point. Government of the Virgin Islands remains concerned that the numerous questionable actions by the past administration in terms, and then in brackets he writes, i.e. BVI Airways deal, Pier Park development, uh, where sufficient evidence exists, but legal action is not pursued to date by the responsible authorities. Um, and then he makes a second bullet point, lack of accountability and transparency by the previous administration should not go unaddressed by law enforcement. And then um, says, as discussed, all actions deemed necessary to re-establish and strengthen um, transparency and accountability will be explored and implemented by my government. However, this must be done in concert with the requisite authority sending a strong message that questionable actions of the past administration will not be tolerated. So in terms of, of, of the part, and let's pick one, the BVI Airways deal, but past actions of a previous administration, uh, was the Premier, uh, was the Premier's position that insufficient action had been taken in relation to, to those events? Uh, Mr. Rout, sorry, firstly, could you remind me what page you're referring to page there in the bundle? Page 29, I'm sorry, I should have drawn that to you, but um, it, on, the, on the same letter, but at page 29, I won't read mm -hmm. it all out, but you'll see under transparent yeah. accountability, uh, the Premier refers to um, numerous questionable actions by the past administration, but then also uh, laments that um, legal action has not been taken. Uh, and um, whilst his administration will take all actions deemed necessary to re-establish and strengthen transparency and accountability, this must be done in concert with the requisite authority sending a strong message that questionable actions of the past administration will not be tolerated. So I just wanted, if you can, if you can remember, just to give the Commissioner the context in which uh, that, that issue was being canvassed. Yes, well, of course, I can't speak for the Honourable Premier, he will need to um, explain his own context uh, to that. But uh, I can recall that uh, there was deep interest, rightly so, um, uh, not just amongst elected members or amongst uh, myself as, as governor, uh, but also I know within the, the public uh, of the Virgin Islands into some of these um, uh, deals that are, or developments that are referred to there. Um, I was aware that the Pier Park development had been the, the uh, subject of a um, Auditor General's report, I believe. Um, the BBI Airways deal was also subject to um, a report, a special report by the Auditor uh, General. I believe uh, both of, well, the BBI Airways deal is now uh, further to a subject investigation um, by the, the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force. So of course it would not be appropriate for me to to comment further on anything that is a subject of a, a, um, an ongoing investigation, I believe. Were representations made to you uh, when you were governor that um, those projects should be the subject of a commission of inquiry? Yes, um, representations were made uh, to me. Um, the Premier had, uh, and in Cabinet, it was discussed about a commission of uh, inquiry um, into those. They had also been put to, I know, to my uh, predecessor as well, the, the notion of a uh, commission of inquiry um, into one of them, uh, at least. In relation to, to the position that was taken on them, at that point, they were still the subject of 
um, or, or BVI Airways was the subject of um, uh, uh, audit and then an investigation. And there was a route through um, to, uh, or a way to go on the conclusion um, of those. What about others like Peer Park? Or, um, I, I mean, we'll, we, we can look at this later on when we look at other correspondence, but there was also uh, the, the cost of the school wall. Um, why um, didn't you have commissions of inquiry in, in other projects? So, those I um, should be very clear that as governor, one of my most difficult decisions was to call the Commission of Inquiry. It's not a step I would have ever wanted to have do uh, or undertake, uh, have done rather, or undertake, should there have been any other way to, to avoid um, doing so. Um, with those specific ones that you mentioned, there was still um, investigations underway at that uh, point. But for me, calling the Commission of Inquiry was really because of the cumulative concerns that were presented to me about uh, good governance, which covered not just specific um, reports that you've mentioned, although those, some of those themes, I saw the practice continuing. So the practice of, of for example, tender waivers conti continuing, the practice of, um, for example, employing consultants without competition, the practice of, not um, uh, allegedly not complying with the laws of the territory. Um, also some of the practices of appointing people to, to boards, statutory boards with little transparency or openness in uh, the process. Uh, or sometimes that uh, there was uh, some of the institutions hindered in carrying out their work to look at some of um, alleged uh, areas um, which may need to be looked at in more uh, detail. So at that point, uh, when I believe in we had discussed and looked at, at the, those issues. Um, the concerns were, uh, were presented to me uh, uh, later relating to a cumulative set of concerns, um, as I've outlined, um, including more, more widely um, concerns that had been um, relayed to me, um, many allegations, including from uh, a, a credible public officers, uh, leaders of some of our institutions, as well as credible members of the public um, of serious concerns relating to intimidation of public officers, serious concerns uh, relating to allegations of decisions being directed outside of processes, um, and most concerning is uh, also allegations of links to organised criminality and to um, those involved in the cocaine trafficking uh, trade uh, as well, including allegedly um, at, uh, uh, amongst those in the highest uh, holders of office. Mm -hmm. So the, my decision on the Commission of Inquiry was due to a, a cumulative set of um, uh, concerns rather than one specific report such as the BBI Airways or Elmore Stout High School Wall, um, as you referred to. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, I, I've, I've noted the time and I wonder if it just gives the stenographer a, a break. Certainly. Uh, Mr. Jasper, we have a, a, a live stenographer uh, and he needs a break after about an hour or so. So we'll, we'll just take a five minute break uh, and, and then come back to resume your evidence. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Good, Mr. Rowett, I think we're ready to resume. Thank you. Thank you, um, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner, I should just explain, I, I, I've been asked by um, Sir Geoffrey just to put two additional questions yes. on the uh, matters we've been canvassing with um, Mr. Jasper, um, and, and I'm quite happy to do so. Mr. Jasper, sticking in, in the first bundle, bundle one, if you go please to page 478. I'm sorry, which, which, which bundle? Bundle one. Yes, thank you. You have it, Mr. Jasper. Um, can you confirm that is expedited extract of the 2nd of December 2020? No, you, you should be in the, the, the governance bundle, part one. Yes. Oh, sorry. Four. Can you repeat the page? Is it four seven eight? Four seven eight, and it should be the um, it's it, it, your statement to the press. O opening remarks by His Excellency the Governor at Governor's catch up with the media. Yes. So, so that on the, December the third. That is the example that is given by the Attorney General in her potential criticism of you. Um, and that's what's referred to. So, so in that, if we look at 478, um, you start off by um, paying tribute to the public officers, but then if we go over to the next page, In that um, you say, and it's at the third paragraph, you refer to the successes and great things we're achieving as a territory. It's important that we also address any areas that could hold us back. And you then continue, I would like to spend some time talking about the governance of the territory. Uh, and you refer to seeking to make BVI as successful as possible can be with equal opportunities and high standards of governance for all. Um, and then conclude that paragraph by saying that at previous briefings you've discussed the things you need to put in place to achieve this for more transparent practices to laws which protect against corruption uh, you um, refer in the next paragraph to hearing time and time again that people want reforms and more and you point to the people of the vdi as our greatest asset um, you then say when I talk about improving governance, despite what some may say, I do not do so as a criticism of BVI, but based on what I believe the people of BVI want. I, like the majority of people here, want BVI to be as successful and self-determining as it can be. You then say, recently I've had a number of concerns and allegations put to me by the community. I will not go into specific details as they are purely allegations, but I will broadly speak to the areas that they touch on. I do so after much deliberation because I want to be transparent and open about these things and to find out more about what we may be facing. Uh, the first one you um, point to is many people are concerned about transparency when it comes to public projects and funds. Uh, you refer to the Auditor General having written numerous reports detailing common areas in this area, tender waivers, interference, contract splitting, inflated prices. And you continue, as you know, investigations are underway on some matters which I cannot comment on. Comment on. But you then refer in the final paragraph on that page that the deputy governor and yourself continue to work with local institutions about how we can address these challenge. And you refer to Auditor General, Com Commissioner of Police, Complaints Commissioner, Financial Investigations Agency and the Registrar of Interest doing important work in specific areas of concern. Over the next page, um, you then say, second, many are concerned about the number of drugs and cash seizures and gun violence recently taking place in the territory. And, and then you refer to um, 
these make it very clear that the territory is vulnerable to drug trafficking, serious organized crime and all that comes with it. But you say criminal investigations are underway. But you then go on to, we're taking immediate steps to bolster security in law enforcement agencies that with the support of NSC, you've invited UK police officers to provide extra support uh, to the joint task force. The third point you make is that you've heard the community raise concerns relating to intimidation and victimization in the territory. You say these have been put to me by a number of individuals in senior positions across the public service, even the media industry in our community. You again say that you will not go into specific details as they are shared with confidence. But you then conclude, I want to be clear that no one in this territory should be afraid to raise a concern. It is a con constitutional right to have freedom of speech and everyone should be able to do their job without fear or favour. My office and the Deputy Governor's office are always open to any individual seeking to raise a concern or ask for help. We will put in place a process for these to be shared in confidence. We will also bring forward measures to strengthen our institutions in response to these concerns. The Deputy Governor and I will shortly be bringing forward the Integrity in Public Life Act, which will bolster the ability of our institutions to ensure accountability. I've tried to um, briefly summarize that statement to the press, but um, the question I'm asked to put to you is this. Why did Mr. Jaspert not make clear that the whole cabinet was united on the importance of this legislation? Um, as I've said be, before, um, it was quite common for the respective lead from cabinet uh, to talk about their respective areas. Um, when the Minister of Education talks about an education responsibility, he won't necessarily name check the Minister of Natural Resources or the Governor or, or any other member. Um, and similarly here, I believe I was talking um, uh, about the, the, the position of taking forward this and mentioned the work that was the uh, uh, Deputy Governor was was taking forward. That is a, a normal, a normal uh, approach, and was the the uh, both precedent and uh, uh, processes or policies that, that were in place. Um, if you turn to four nine six, please, in the same. Button. You should have a statement by the Premier on the Integrity in Public Life Act 2020, uh, and it's dated the 22nd of December 2020. Uh, yes, I have that. Um, in this, the uh, Premier writes, my team and I pledge that if given the opportunity, uh, we would ensure that uh, legislation, and this is long, he describes this as long outstanding legislation to strengthen the accountability of public officials and to guard against misconduct and abuse of office. He says, if given the opportunity, we would ensure that this legislation go from being a discussion to being a reality. And then points to one step, such step in the passage is the passage of the Integrity in Public Life Act, which is currently a bill and recently came before cabinet for recommendations on 18th December, 2020. This draft legislation was prepared and submitted to cabinet on the initiative of the Premier's office. Uh, may I say it is important to note the role that the Premier's office and your elected BVI government is playing in driving the process for our territory to have this legislation. The Premier continues, this initiative of the Premier's office is important for two reasons. Uh, it, it represents our continued maturity as a people who have long been in control of our affairs. And two, it represents our commitment to strengthening governance, which remains important for having a stable economy. Um, the statement continues, the integrity in public life bill maintains priority on your government's legislative agenda. In fact, by the first quarter of 2021, this bill will be back before cabinet for final consideration, then before the House of Assembly, and then wait for the assent by the governor. Uh, your elected government believes in promoting and enhancing ethical conduct standards, and that is why we are walking the talk and we're driving the initiative to consolidate laws relating to prevention of corruption and the award monitoring and investigating government contracts and prescribed licenses. What the uh, 
um, a statement also says is additionally the bill seeks to make provision for a code of conduct and declarations of interest for public officers and may I say that both the integrity and public life bill and the code of conduct are reflective of the best regional and international practices and standards for such legislation he adds cabinet has approved that the premier's office will work in collaboration with the deputy governor on this particular matter the Premier's Office is the lead department on the work to finalise the Integrity and Public Life Act because the scope of the legislation is wider than public offices. Uh, and the question that follows from that is this. Is it not clear that the government was offended that Mr Jaspert had presented this legislation as his initiative alone in the context of the other matters referred to in that media briefing? Uh, thank you. I'm afraid I can't speculate as to how uh, other people, aside from myself, felt about things. If uh, that is for them to to describe how they uh, how they uh, feel about it, but I've explained very clearly um, the the position on this and um, why, as is normal practice, there's no no intention of any disrespect. It's I, um, around it. It was purely normal practice that the respective lead from cabinet would talk about their respective policy areas um, in more detail. That was a, a well-established practice um, and one that I was uh, simply following, but I'm afraid I can't, can't talk uh, on behalf of the, the elected uh, members of government. Thank you. The, the, the Premier, Mr Jasper, is giving evidence uh, tomorrow, so um, uh, perhaps he's, he's, he's someone that we can raise um, uh, this issue with. Um, Mr. Jasper, before I, I, I move on, I, I've, I've um, dealt with the first potential criticism that, that the Commission has raised with you. But is there any other matter in your written response that you want to draw the Commissioner's attention to? Um, do you mean in relation solely to the first uh, criticism? Yeah. Or do you mean relating to the other? Um, in relation to the first one. No, the, the only part that I will draw uh, attention to is um, the approach that I took to the partnership throughout, which was to, to, as it's both in the spirit and in the letter of the Constitution, to work on behalf of the people of the Virgin Islands, to work in partnership with the elected government. I worked, obviously, in partnership with two uh, different administrations uh, during my tenure, and also to a clear commitment to stay professional and courteous in that relationship at all times. In a relationship, there are times when, when there may be constructive challenge, constructive insight uh, put into it. I can't obviously comment on the reasons for why some of the correspondence you will have seen from members of the elected government, whether that was correspondence put out into the public domain or correspondence uh, in letters that were sent. Uh, sometimes I believe fell short of a professional um, tone. I, I can't speculate as to reasons why uh, the elected members of government uh, uh, took that approach, but I can be very clear and confident in the approach I took, which was about always trying to get back to a North Star of partnership and guiding principles for the best interests of the people of the territory and uh, operating in a professional and courteous way um, with all of the elected government. Thank you. What you have um, provided to the um, commissioner um, as um, in support of, of, of your position that you sought to pursue a, a partnership of mutual, mutual respect with other members of the cabinet is the letter that you pr produced and wrote on the 5th of May 2020 and you set out there uh, eight suggestions for the uh, conduct of cabinet to make it more effective. Um, I'm not going to read out the detail but they are meetings should last for a maximum of three hours Discussions should be focused on the topics of the agenda and the specific dis items being discussed. Uh, interventions, questions or points raised are brief, focused and specific to the item being discussed. Uh, interventions and discussions are about the strategic policy issues being discussed and collective cabinet and not about any one member of cabinet. Public officers and external experts presenting to cabinet are given the space and opportunity within time limits to advise and brief open and frank discussions within the confidential remit of cabinet is valued. Papers 
uh, stroke proposals are submitted at least two working days in advance being placed on the cabinet business agenda and with sufficient time in advance to cabinet Sec secretary for circulation and agreement through the cabinet steering group in line with the cabinet handbook uh, meetings start on time unless there are exceptional circumstances um and, and just explain to the commissioner what compelled you to to write uh, making those suggestions to other members of the cabinet thank you well that letter was not the first uh time that i had raised matters relating to the conduct of cabinet i had raised them within cabinet uh, but also even if you go back in the governance bundle three for example page 19 is, the, is a note of a meeting between the Premier uh, and myself of the 24th of May 2019, where in that uh, meeting uh, I encouraged uh, that papers should come to the Cabinet in advance. Um, this is partly part of, of ensuring it's not just about that there's respect for everybody around the Cabinet table, but actually it's about good governance and making good decisions for the people of the Virgin Islands. That, if cabinet is getting papers in advance, if there are um, discussions that are actually focused on the topic in hand and not off agenda items, uh, if members are able to, to as I put down, you know, uh, uh, make interventions or to have uh, their points uh, debated, and um, that those who who turn up were treated with respect as well and were able to, um, particularly public officers, were able to give frank and fair um, advice. Um, obviously, it is a decision of the, the elected members of Cabinet as to whether they adopt that advice or not. That's their prerogative. But making sure that Cabinet was making policy on the basis of facts and knowledge. These are all, I believe, good principles for decision making in the best interest of the people of the Virgin Islands. But they're also principles that were encapsulated in the Cabinet Handbook. The background to that specific letter was that we had had a series of meetings which had often started late by a member of cabinet, often um, uh, uh, delaying the start of, of cabinet when cabinet, uh, all members ideally should be there on time to start promptly. That uh, topics not covered by the agenda were, were brought into the meeting, which often delayed conversations. Or at times that uh, if somebody did raise a constructive um, point, there was often um, uh, what I perceive to be, and there's my perception, particularly when it was directed against myself, I can only speak for that, but I perceive there to be um, uh, an aggressive, uh, could be at times an, uh, an aggressive or disrespectful approach to how comment, frank and fair discussion was um, treated uh, within that. So part of that letter was, was as I put at the beginning uh, of it, it, they were suggestions. I made clear that these are initial thoughts and Cabinet colleagues will no doubt have had their own thoughts. Uh, my intention was, was to help us uh, make good decisions for the people of the Virgin Islands through what is the highest level executive decision making body in terms of, of Cabinet. Before I move on to the um, second potential criticism, there are a, a number of matters that, that are not being pursued uh, by the uh, elected ministers, but which uh, do feature in the material uh, uh, and evidence that has been put before the commissioner. Uh, and I think in fairness to you, I, I need to put them to you. Um, if you turn please to page 113 in the bundle, the same bundle we're in, Uh, Mr. Wright, I'm afraid my bundle only goes up to page 89. Are you? It is in the same bundle that included the letter to Cabinet, or are you talking about a referring to a different bundle? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Jasper. I mean, you, you, um, asking you to go somewhere else in the bundle is probably not helpful. You have more than one bundle. Um, the bundle I'm speaking of is, is bundle one of the governance bundles. So it's the bundle in which we found the, the press 
that we were just looking at a few moments ago. Okay, thank you. And could you remind me the page, please? 113, please. 113, thank you. Tell me when you're there. I am, uh, I believe, on the correct page. Um, if I give you the context, this is part of the position statement that has been submitted to the Commissioner on behalf of the elected ministers, and they have all uh, signed this document. Um, one of the um, matters it canvasses, and this is in relation to the relationship uh, with the UK government and, and areas of disagreement is the conditions that the United Kingdom government imposed uh, in order for the BVI to access a loan guarantee of $300 million. Um, and what's said at paragraph um, 24 uh, and one of the examples that is given of the sort of conditions that were imposed was that um, the Recovery and Development Agency was set up. Um, it was a, an agency on which the UK, um, through the governor, could appoint uh, individuals. Um, it, it was an agency where uh, the arrangements were that, that essentially um, the UK, could, it is said, could dictate where funds would go. Um, in the context of the loan agreement, um, some of the uh, conditions that, that followed included, for example, having to divest um, of assets that would be better held in the private sector. Um, what's said in paragraph 24, though, is from the very first day of its mandate, um, the newly elected government came under heavy pressure from former Governor Jasper to agree and sign up to the terms of the loan guarantee agreement while it res resisted doing so on the grounds that it was unwilling to put itself in the position of sacrificing political and democratic control of so central a priority of its economic policy. Um, an extraordinary briefing war broke out between the elected government and the governor and the FCDO in which the latter sought to refute the government's suggestions that the loan guarantee and the RDA would have such an effect. We need to couple that with, you, you don't need to turn it up in necessarily, but it's the response that the elected ministers have put in uh, to the governor's position statement, and that's the position statement of the current governor, also uh, refers to this. Um, and that's at page 917, um, Commissioner, and I'm going to, uh, it's paragraphs 52 and 53. Um, a paragraph 52, uh, the ministers observed that in seeking to mitigate the risk of the UK's contingent liability, and that's in relation to the loan guarantee, uh, which is a clear policy imperative for both the proposed loan guarantee arrangements and the protocols for effective financial management, the FCDO has attached broad conditions and demands regarding the conduct of the economic policy in the, of the Virgin Islands. And, and what's said is that encroaches on financial freedom of manoeuvre, but also upon the island's legitimate aspiration to govern and make important political and economic choices for themselves. Um, the governor, and that's the current governor, presents this as a choice of the Virgin Islands government, but in a relationship of such unequal bargaining power, that choice may often not appear a real one. Uh, this is so particularly when, as in the case of the loan guarantee, the FCDO has informed the government if it rejects the loan guarantee, it will not look favorably under the PEFM on any alternative borrowing. And when it was accompanied by intense and unusual pressure from the governor, and now that's a reference to you, who went so far as to place the papers for signature before the premier, immediately upon swearing him in. The first question is, um, 
did you uh, put uh, the incoming administration under pressure to uh, sign up to the loan agreement and its terms? Uh, thank you very much. There's a number of points uh, that you draw out there. I have to first state I don't recall um, uh, pressurising the Premier to, to sign as he was sworn in. That's not a, something that I, I factually um, uh, recall um, for my recollection of events. But just to explain a bit about the, the loan guarantee or the offer of the loan guarantee, because the intention of it and this was something that with the then elected uh, uh, Premier, uh, the former Premier, uh, I should say, was something that was uh, developed um, initially um, through the co consultation with, with the UK government, essentially with one aim, and that was to support the people of the territory to recover. In fact, if you go to bundle uh, three, uh, page 48, as a letter from Ben Merrick to Premier Foy, um, confirming, and I quote, um, the loan guarantee, the, uh, the quote starts here, the sole intention of supporting the Virgin Islands to lead its own recovery. And that was why the loan guarantee was designed exactly in that way, that it should be a BVI led recovery. And for me, and I talked to earlier, it was really important that my guiding principles were about the constitution, were about supporting self-determination, were about supporting article 73 throughout. And that was why, whilst yes, the UK did give significant uh, grants uh, to the tune of about, um, I think it was about 15, 16 million uh, dollars to various projects and about 80 million uh, uh, dollars, I believe, uh, of support in the aft uh, aftermath of the storms to the affected territories in the region. Actually, the UK, uh, the position that the loan guarantee was, was taken forward on was to support the territory itself to design its own recovery to design its own approach to recovery through an act that the House of Assembly, the BBI's House of Assembly, voted on and took forward the Recovery and Development Act. Um, and also the, to design their own plan for recovery. So for me, this was an important point about helping to, to take forward a stronger and more self-determining uh, approach to the recovery um, of the territory. As to intense and unusual pressure, to quote those words that are in there. I don't recall um, uh, putting such pressure on, but I do recall being very clear throughout uh, my concern about the pace of recovery and that this was an offer, an offer given in good faith to the territory to help the government, should it wish to, bring in um, more money at a cheaper rate than they would otherwise be able to, to likely get. Um, with some clear principles built in about transparency, accountability, um, in terms of how that money is spent in the interests of the people of the Virgin Islands. So if I applied any um, intensity to wanting to, to see the recovery go forward, this was because if I was waking up every morning at that precise point, I could pop a few miles down the road, or not even a few miles, and it would pain me to see children educated in a tent outside of school. It would pain me to go and see the central administration building and to see uh, public officers working incredibly hard and I applaud their effort uh, or their work to recover from the territory and their commitment to keep going to work even though there were very difficult circumstances when the recovery um, uh, they were working in offices that that sometimes had no windows due to the impact of of the hurricanes or were a tent down in the customs dock in in uh, the west end for example so if I had intensity to my desire to move forward on supporting the recovery of the territory, that's something I, I stand by as, as, as a good thing. And I hope that that was um, reflected across um, uh, others, that there was an intensity to ensure that children were educated not in tents, to ensure that public officers had fit and proper buildings to operate out of, to ensure that elect electricity critical uh, roadworks, to ensure that all of the, the recovery was, was going at pace. That was my, my intensity out of the interest that I had, um, the oath that I swore to, to serve the people of the, of the Virgin Islands. It's up to the elected government uh, as to how they wanted to take that forward. It was their, their decision in terms of, of the funding approaches and how they wished to take uh, what was purely an offer and solely for the intention of supporting 
people of the Virgin Islands. Uh, uh, but it was, it is rightly so, a devolved choice um, and a, a, a devolved um, uh, approach, uh, the financing arrangements of the territory, as you're well aware under the constitution. And so it was up to the uh, elected government as to how they wanted to go forward on the loan guarantee. You um, refer to a, a, a letter from Ben Merrick to um, Dr. Orlando Smith. Um, in that same bundle, can you look at page 64, please? Can I confirm that is the a page of transcript? Um, no, it should be a, a letter, page sixty-four, in the bundle in which you found um, a letter from Ben Merrick to uh, the Honourable Premier. I, I'm sorry. So I, to confirm that is bundle three. Yes. That bundle correct? three. Bundle three. Um, Thank you. Twenty-fifth of October, twenty nineteen. Letter. And sorry, as I've had to open up a different, this one was only given, uh, I have electronically. So could you just remind me the page number, please? Uh, 64, please. That is the... Uh, that is letter of the 25th of October, 2019, addressed to Lord uh, Ahmed. It's, it's a letter from the Honourable Premier Andrew Foy to Lord Ahmed, Minister of State for Overseas Territories, and it concerns misinformation at high level technical meetings. And the, um, the, the context of it is that um, there has, uh, the, the BVI government was developing a revised recovery and development plan um, with which the um, Foreign and Commonwealth Office was, was um, had had input and there had been uh, technical meetings between the two governments. Over on the other page though, page 65, at the top there, what um, the Premier writes is, you'll recall that during my recently completed trip to the UK, we held private discussions about the relationship between the governor and my government. Um, ongoing developments cause me to wonder whether the relationship between my government and yours has really been reset as we aimed to do. In addition to differing characterization of the territory's recovery and rebuilding process, it pains me terribly to report that advancement in recent high level meetings continue to be impeded by misinformation, misstatements and assumptions not based on fact coming from the office of the governor in these deliberations, as has been the case prior to and subsequent to our meetings in London last month. The result of this misinformation has seemingly led to a cynical tone encroaching into the sessions, which my team has often intimated. To elaborate, it was brought to my attention that in our technical meeting of October 24, 2019, the Office of the Governor accused the BVI government and our technical team of trying to tamper with regulations for the Recovery and Development Agency Act, which they said were already approved in Cabinet. The fact is that those regulations have not been approved. And the um, um, Honourable Premier then refers to a cabinet extract of October 11th, 2018, and says it's very, that cabinet extract is very clear that the cabinet of the day only approved the principles to inform the final drafting of the regulations for the RDA Act. Now, the, the point of, of, of drawing your attention to this, um, Mr. Jasper, is not limited to whether there was um, accusations being made of tampering with regulations. But, but a, a wider point, which is that um, there was and had developed, um, a, 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 if you like, an atmosphere of mistrust between yourself and the elected ministers. So take the first point first, please. Uh, and that is that, you know, the accusation that the BVI government tried to tamper with regulations. 
was that accusation made? Um, I'm afraid I can't recall that um, uh, being made. I don't think I would have used language uh, such as that. That's not something I have a recollection um, of. And, and what about the, the, the wider point that it does point to um, a lack of trust between yourself and the elected ministers? Well, I'll refer back to what I have said already. Um, in my relationship with the elected government, uh, as I said, I, I served with two administrations uh, in my tenure as governor. My approach was always the same, to be guided by um, uh, a spirit of modern partnership, to operate um, in the interests of the people of the territory, to help take forward self-determination as per Article 73 um, of the United Nations, and to, to help ensure that there is good governance as well um, across uh, uh, all areas uh, um, as well. That didn't change. Um, you will see from various different uh, public statements that were put out by members of the elected uh, uh, government, I should say the current elected government, and the tone of some of those letters that often there were assertions or insinuations put out um, about uh, about myself in those, or a tone that I wouldn't always, I myself didn't always feel was professional um, and courteous in a way that uh, um, uh, the sort of those those points were handled. But that didn't alter my approach. My approach was always to to aim to try to work in partnership always to put the people of the Virgin Islands first and always to operate with the realms of the constitution and uh, in a professional um, way uh, and courteous way throughout. Another reference um, to you appears at page uh, 918 you, you, in, the, in bundle one of the governance bundle. You, you don't necessarily need to look it up. I can just uh, summarize the point. But at, at paragraph 60, um, what um, the ministers say, and this is in their response to uh, the government's, um, to the, the, the current governor's position statement. As the ministers have previously sought to highlight, the former governor adopted an expansive interpretation of his section 60 responsibilities with which the cabinet did not always agree. And they then go on to um, give, um, as an example of this, your uh, argument, or it is said that you argued um, that measures to contain and combat the pandemic should be led by yourself and the Department of Disaster Management uh, in accordance with the Disaster Management Act. Uh, notwithstanding that there were other statutory provisions that governed um, uh, um, uh, an outbreak of this sort and would assign responsibility and powers to the Minister of Health. Um, starting with that and starting with um, disaster management, uh, is it right that when it came to the Disaster Management Act and when it came to disasters, that you took the view that section 60 meant that you had to take the lead. Thank you very much. The Disaster um, Management Act sets out clearly the role of the governor, but also it is a lead that is about partnership as well. So the uh, Premier would co-chair the what is called the NDMC, the National Disaster Management Committee uh, with myself. Um, we would have representatives from across all of the ministries um, at those meetings um, as well. In fact, I recall when the COVID pandemic first hit and we, we held a, um, I can't remember the exact acronym, I think it was an EOC meeting or an DMC health meeting. Um, I remember sitting alongside uh, the Honourable Premier and the Honourable Minister for Health as well. That was the partnership uh, approach in, um, in action. So. Whilst uh, the section 60 it does give uh, responsibility to the governor for the security uh, of, of the territory, um, as you rightly say, and the Disaster Management Act does place the governor uh, in a certain role there. 
Um, it also is important, as, as is written throughout the Constitution, but also how I acted was to take that forward in a, in a partnership approach with uh, the, the, the across the elected government. But if we look uh, more um, closely at the, um, the, the question of disaster management, um, and I can take you to the um, correspondence if you need to see it, but it, it's right, isn't it, that, that towards the end of 2020, um, the, res the budgetary responsibility for the Department of, of, of Disaster Management and, and the, where it was located uh, meant that it um, moved from the governor's group to another ministry, is that right? Um, uh, so yes, there was, and I, sorry, you'll have to give me the page number for the letter, but it was a letter I wrote to the uh, Honourable Premier at the time uh, uh, relating to this. This was a, an interesting example where there was a very clear um, position in terms of both constitutionally and uh, under the laws of the territory in terms of the Disaster Management Act. Uh, and as I had said, I had always operated with a clear approach to partnership. Part of, I think, a good partnership is that you consult, you treat each other with respect, and you engage each other if you are going to do things that may affect the other partner. This was, I have to admit, quite a strange um, occurrence because without any consultation, without any engagement, without any discussion with myself, uh, the Premier took forward um, an amendment that affected an area that I was responsible for, through um, the, the budget um, approach, as you, uh, as you highlight. That was for me um, when I had been committed to a partnership approach and at least in the letters that the Premier would quite frequently send to me, he would affirm his, um, well, at, least he, at least he would uh, affirm his commitment to the partnership. It was surprising that an approach was taken that there was no consultation, engagement or discussion about it. And I think um, if you could refresh my memory on what page in the bundle that the letter is, I will be able to, to be more specific. But I do remember at the time being somewhat uh, uh, disappointed at uh, the approach that had been taken um, without uh, consultation. What's there? I'll, I'll tell, I'll, I think let's take it in stages, because it, it, if you need to refresh your memory, you should do. It's page 885 in this bundle. Thank you. Yes, I have it. Uh, on, on the available correspondence we have, this seems to be the first uh, letter that's written. Um, and it's the intent then to move the Department of Disaster Management from the Governor's Group to the Premier's Office. Um, and you say in this letter, you express your disappointment, you say this is not a partnership approach to governance. And you set out um, your obligations under the Disaster Management Act and say that it's consistent with the clear connection that there with the clear connection between disaster management and your responsibility for internal security um, and uh, afforded you by section 60. Um, now that's that was you expressing uh, your position. Um, I think the we can look at it, but if you go to eight, uh, 888, you're then writing that disaster management um, should be presented correctly in the budget estimates as being under the remit of the governor's group. So um, what was the position? This was, um, I, I can take you to the letter that the premier uh, wrote on the on the 9th of December that you're referring to here, but we may not need to look at it. But you had written to express your disappointment. What was the position as of the 18th of December? Uh, where did the Department of Disaster Management lie? Um, according to these letters, uh, I believe legally the responsibility as per Disaster Management Act 2003, placed the responsibility um, with the uh, uh, 
governor. Um, and there's also uh, the position as per the uh, um, the, app, the letter that is in there where I refer to the Disaster Management Act 2003. In terms of the budget, I'm afraid I, from uh, memory, cannot recall exactly where the budget was in, in the cycle of the House of Assembly debates at that time, whether it had been passed um, or not at that uh, point. But the position on disaster management itself was uh, legally very, very clear in the Disaster Management Act 2003. Um, does um, just in terms of the budget w w was the effect that um, I'm just thinking what practically occurred w was the position that that in terms of of um, whilst you might have had statutory responsibilities under the Act did the budget sit with um, uh, as a result of these changes w was the budget moved from your group to another ministry. So I refer to the letter just below, um, as I refresh my memory on this, the 22nd of December 2020, that is page 889. Um, that was, I believe I was actually on um, a holiday then out of territory and uh, Mr David Archer as Deputy Governor was acting Governor at the time and that implies that he, I will read that, I've assented to the appropriation 2020 one Act 2020, but clarified that in doing so, do not endorse any purported regroupings or movement of financial controls within the budget estimate, unless in line with current governance structures, and until these are altered through a proper lawful process, including where necessary, assent to legislation reallocating responsibility. So from that, I, I take that the Act was signed off uh, in terms of the appropriation, um, Act uh, by the acting government at the time, but with that important uh, position put in that obviously um, it needed to be lawful in terms of uh, the positioning of um, the disaster management uh, function. You look at the um, bundle three. Sorry, I'm, um, at 218, please. Um, can I confirm that is a memorandum from the Attorney General to the Premier and Minister of Finance? It's to you, dated the 21st of December 2021. Correct, thank you. Um, this is advice on, on what seems to have been the dispute between um, yourself and the, and the Premier, which was, um, should the governance and control of the Department for Disaster Management vest in the Governor? or in a Minister of Government. Um, and the advice of the attorney was in short that the Disaster Management Act of 2003 vests authority for the, the Dis Department for Disaster Management in the Governor uh, without ambiguity. Um, the Act can be re-amended to assign responsibility to a Minister of Government and what's suggested is a, a mediated solution between yourself and the uh, Premier to uh, try and resolve the dispute. As of the time you ended your, ended your tenure, Mr Jasper, um, where did the Department for Disaster Management sit? Um, I believe it, it sat uh, through the Disaster Management Act uh, 2003, it sat as the Attorney General um, says in her advice, um, the Disaster Management Act 2003, the Act, I'm reading from 2A of her letter, vests authority for DDM in the Governor, there is no ambiguity or absurdity in the legislation 
um, and she goes on uh, on that sense. I, I believe that was the position uh, uh, as when I left. And did you have budgetary control for it? Um, the I refer back to the the letter from the uh, acting governor at the time that the Appropriation Act uh, was uh, signed off, um, and but the position was that the governor is is responsible for uh, disaster management. Um, another issue that that arises, and again, it's not um, something that's been pursued against you, but. Uh, it, it has been uh, canvassed with, with um, Governor Rankin, um, but, but it's this, it's the question of who chairs cabinet in, in the absence of the governor. There appears to have been a, a, a dispute of in, a, and a difference of interpretation of the act, in, of the constitution rather, on the basis that the, the premier's view was that uh, where the governor is not present, uh, cabinet should not be chaired by a deputy, but should be chaired by him as himself as the premier. Um, I think, is it right to say that your interpretation of the constitution was that you could have your deputy chair the um, cabinet? Thank you. When I started uh, or took over uh, my tenure as governor in 2017, the practice uh, that I walked into and the precedent was that the, uh, in the absence of the governor, uh, the, the governor chaired. Now that governor could be the, the acting governor uh, or the deputy to governor, essentially the person fulfilling the function of the governor um, as the chair of cabinet. But that was, I received advice from the Honourable AG at the time, um, uh, Baba Aziz, who confirmed that position um, with myself, uh, uh, well, with, with cabinet actually, uh, that the the person fulfilling the function of governor is the chair of um, cabinet, whether that is the person of myself or whether it is the person of a another individual who is fulfilling the function uh, of governor. Um, I don't actually have that advice in front of me. I'm sure it's in one of these bundles, but if you uh, if we know the exact point, I can probably quote more directly. But I I do remember the, the position that. I was advised by the then AG. And I believe my last cabinet meeting, um, which was a few days before I left, the, uh, uh, well, no longer new, but the Attorney General now, um, uh, Honourable Dawn Smith, uh, advised that uh, a, a different interpretation um, and also advised that um, cabinet could be chaired via uh, video link as, um, as well, which I did subsequently. Um, do as uh, governor in the territory at the time. So um, for the majority of your tenure as, as um, governor, uh, the advice of um, Baba Aziz on um, the interpretation of who should sit under the constitution, who can chair a cabinet, was that in governor or the deputy to the governor. Correct. The, the, the final uh, point I'd like to canvas with you before returning to the potential criticisms um, is uh, the question of how um, the governor ought to approach the question of, of interacting directly with um, public officers. If you're in the bundle B3 and you turn up 122, please. Go to 120 first. Can I confirm that is a letter of the 6th of May 2020 from the Honourable Premier to the Baroness Elizabeth Sugg? It is, and it is headed uh, overreaching by UK government officials. Um, and what the Premier writes is that he continues to be concerned with the many transgression of the Governor 
that are far reaching beyond his special responsibilities as outlined in section 60. He says, I've written to your office on many occasions expressing concerns with the governor's continual actions of usurping the people of the Virgin Islands' desire to become a self-governing people and to exercise the highest degree of control over the affairs of their country at this stage of its development. The letter continues that um, there appears to be a lack of due respect for the ministerial advancement of this territory and protection against overreaching as there is a consistent showing of solidarity with the governor in the face of his numerous and continued transgression against the government and people of the Virgin Islands. Um, the Honourable Premier goes on then to make some further points, um, including, for example, um, that in the pandemic, the Health Emergency Operations Centre had been uh, established and successfully so, um, and that its membership includes a permanent secretary, a Ministry of Health and Social Development, Chief Medical Officer, BVI Health Authority, and the Director of Communications and the Director of Department of Disaster Management. Going on to um, 122, um, uh, and having set out all of those uh, entities involved in the Health Emergency Operations Centre, the, the Premier continues, with this solid structure in place, it was a surprise to learn that apart from this structure as approved by Cabinet, the Governor in his office summoned some members of the HEOC to discuss COVID-19 and a message under a message sent from her govern the Governor's office on 7th April 2020, without any prior discussion with the Health Minister, who has the legal authority for the handling of all terms, all matters related to any health pandemic. He then sets out the mail and then continues, this is a very genuine concern of overreach into the public service of the Virgin Islands by the governor, through the, by the FCO through the governor and the governor through his office, even though ministers have been legally assigned the responsibility of ministering of their departments and ministries as is in keeping with the constitution. He continues that public officers have privately expressed concerns in confidence that the governor and the governor's office are making direct contact into ministries and departments and have requested that a proper protocol be established so there is a clear understanding how the governor's office should be interacting with ministries and departments. Um, for those public officers who've been in the public service for a significant period of time and have institutional knowledge and understand how the mutual relationship across ministries and departments worked in the past, they have expressed a high level of discomfort to me privately. I've asked them to express the same with the deputy governor about the governor's office's actions, which some may have been hesitant. While some may have been hesitant because the deputy governor reports to the governor, I'm sure that some may have mustered the courage to express their concerns without fear. Um, and the um, letter then returns to setting out the constitution, but at the top of page 124 refers to the heavy handed approach by the governor in his office to abuse his authority within the public service to summons police public officers is not appropriate. Um, if you go to page 130. Let's start at. Um, one, two, seven. Um, at 127, you have a 19th of May letter from the Honourable Premier to yourself, um, saying that he had reviewed a draft letter from you um, uh, other correspondence and police commissioner Michael Matthews radio interview of the 8th of May 2020 um, and, and says that statements you're making are unfounded as you allege uh, and this is concerns about uh, using military personnel um, in the BVI. Um, the, the Premier then sets out a, a number of specific points um, including um, that this has been mediated through the NSC. And one of those on there was the audit, or, or Attorney General whose term of office expired on the 10th of February, 2020. Um, again, what it ends with 
is, um, and this is at page 130, having set out the powers that you have, the Premier expresses the hope, as you contemplate on the or exercise of these powers, you consider the following. Exercise of powers under the Constitution must be in accordance with the preamble of the Constitution. The Constitution is underpinned by democratic values that pervade BDI society. Um, and he then sets out a number of those values, including the generally expressed desire of the Virgin Lions Police to become public, to become a self-governing people, and to exercise the highest degree of control over the affairs of their country. And, and the point that the um, Premier makes is that you have a, a, a penchant for unilateral exercise of constitutional powers, in some cases even perceived to be in violation of the Constitution. And that is indeed characteristic of the home rule that was practiced by your predecessors on the ancestors of Virgin Islanders decades ago. So there are two instances that I've brought to your attention there where the Premier is expressing in, in strong terms uh, concern with examples uh, that you, uh, Mr Jasper, um, were engaged in what he calls uh, constitutional overreach. Do you, uh, did you take uh, the Premier's warnings on board? So firstly, as you see in those letters, there's a number of, of assertions which uh, I have to record were, were unfounded and uh, in terms of, of what was written there and if you some of the correspondence uh, clarifies the misrepresentation that the Premier presented in those um, letters. Um, so that was uh, in terms of these specific examples I'm happy to talk through um, on those areas but uh, to, to say that uh, security is not the constitutional responsibility of the governor that was the insinuation is um, a slightly strange position um, to take and that was one where my interest was in protecting the security as I'm constitutionally bound to of the people uh, of the uh, territory. Um, so I have to, admit, have to say I, I refute the, the assertions that are uh, uh, in these uh, exchanges. Um, go to 210 in the same bundle. This is a letter of the 17th of December 2020 addressed to you from the Premier um, and it relates to um, the use of the government information service um, in the BVI. Uh, and he explains that that resides in the Premier's office. And just to summarize the, the point of the letter, um, the, the, it points to that um, during the extenuating circumstances created by the hurricanes, um, the, there was a change in um, the access that the governor's office had to GIS, which is described here as unusually privileged. And there's now a need uh, to return uh, the method and function of the territorial government's official communications apparatus to its regular mandate. And, and the um, Premier writes, we have been pleased to extend the courtesy to the governor's office. And, and so um, what he explains he's done is that he has instructed um, the permanent secretary in the Premier's office that the director of communications and GIS will no longer be responsible for issuing communiques or providing public relations coverage on behalf of the governor, governor's office and the foreign and commonwealth development office. Um, it, it, he writes, it's more appropriate for the governor's office to be responsible for communicating its and the FCDO's country business plan and activities for its own separate channels. Um, he notes, however, that he and requests that in the spirit of cooperation as a courtesy to him and his office uh, and his position, that he should receive such communications from the governor's office and the FCDO uh, prior to any communications rather, prior to their being issued to the public. He, he notes that as leader of the overseas territory, he must be aware beforehand and not learn of information in the public domain. Now, um, <clears throat> at 226 in this bundle,
Um, the Premier is responding to a letter from you, which we haven't seen. But he again um, explains, and what he does here is he explains the difference between your role as um, the uh, representative of the Queen as the head of state and his as the head of government. And he then goes on to uh, set out again um, by reference to um, the role in the past of the Government Information Service, um, a decision that he would, and we see this at page 229, um, instruct uh, the Director of Communications on the Permanent Secretary and his directive that it's not responsible for issuing uh, communiques or providing public relations coverage uh, on behalf of the Governor, Governor's Office and the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Uh, that is a matter uh, for them, but that in the spirit of cooperation as a courtesy, he should receive your communications. Um, he says that uh, GIS will be approved to issue communications where there is a partnership between the territorial government and the governor's office on specific projects and initiatives. Now, I'm giving you this background, Mr. Jasper, and I'll add one little more detail, and that is that um, we've heard evidence, the commissioner has heard evidence that um, the Premier also requested that um, any inquiries to uh, ministries or officials uh, should go through his office. Um, and Governor Ranking provided two draft memoranda to the um, commissioner as part of his written response, which showed that. So bringing um, those threads together, um, and I can take you to your response to the Premier, which is at 243, if you need to see it, but the threads are firstly the concerns that were being raised by the Premier, and it's an example of constitutional overreach, was that as uh, Governor, you were going directly to public officers, rather than um, as you should have done through his office. And secondly, that it was not for the um, BVI government, and certainly not for its, um, its information services, to be disse disseminating uh, information that was produced by the uh, FCDO uh, and the UK government, uh, you as governor being an extension of the FCDO and the UK government. So taking the, the those are the, the reason I want to draw this is that it's, it's focusing on the point of constitutional overreach by you operating essentially outside your section 60 powers. Uh, thank you very much. First, let me uh, be clear that there was no constitutional uh, overreach. Secondly, it would also help, I think, to explain the difference between the UK and the Foreign Office, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, FCDO, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, as it is now called, and the government of the Virgin Islands. And the governor has a role. Um, uh, uh, as is set out in the constitution where I act um, uh, within those uh, parameters within the constitution, but I act um, as part of uh, uh, the government of the Virgin Islands as well. And the authorities through the constitution of how I exercise those, if you go to section 46.1 of the Virgin Islands Constitution Order 2007, um, uh, the executive authority of the Virgin Islands shall be vested in Her Majesty and section 46.2, subject to this constitution, the executive authority of the Virgin Islands may be exercised on behalf of Her Majesty by the governor. Now, obviously, it goes on um, with other sections where a large part of that authority is rightly um, uh, delegated to um, elected members of government. But it is a misrepresentation, unfortunately, by um, in those letters to present it that the governor is is solely a, a foreign office uh, or FCDO uh, institution. The governor is actually a BVI institution. It is BVI's constitution uh, and the uh, constitution order 2007. Uh, and it is under that uh, approach that I was fulfilling my role. So it is therefore wrong um, uh, for the governor acting through the constitution of the BVI acting in the role that I have um, for the government of the, the uh, uh, Virgin Islands to be blocked from communicating out um, via 
Government Information Service, the GIS, as it was called. That was the first part, and that was something that I uh, resisted. There is a fair point, I think, that Foreign and Commonwealth Office communications, or UK solely communications, um, sometimes the Governor's Office may, may act as a postbox for those communications, um, and that is fair that those um, uh, uh, could go out to via the gov Governor's Office, the, the FCDO team there, um, rather necessarily through GIS, although sometimes it may be that um, there is a, a collaborative approach to that message. But um, my, my role as Governor of the, of the Virgin Islands is to be exactly that, Governor of uh, the Virgin Islands, and hence it's completely right that the Government Information Service supports the um, in fact, so, uh, or the position that I had as uh, governor. Relating to the second point about um, uh, going to public offices and uh, working with public offices. This is something that, uh, or only going, I think, believe, um, in one of the letters, it refers to, to the idea of only going by the Premier's office. Now, as part of the constitution, I, I am bound to operate within the realms of the constitution so also is the Premier or any other member of government. And so it would be constitutionally incorrect to direct um, uh, that all uh, communication or all interaction has to only happen um, with the approval of the Premier. And that is, uh, I wanted to draw up the exact part in the Constitution, but um, the time I will summarise it from memory and we can maybe come, come back to it, but essentially it's clear that the, the Governor has the ability to, to go uh, to, get, to get information from ministers and to um, involve or inform the Premier when he does so. There are also areas where I directly involve public officers due to my constitutional responsibilities around the terms and conditions of public officers, um, around obviously Section 60 uh, responsibilities more widely on security, um, etc. So if the Premier put forward a position that was unconstitutional, then of course I uh, would not be able to operate that position I would need to operate to the constitution of the Virgin Islands uh, for the interests of the people of the Virgin Islands. Thank you. Um, but if I, um, I think, are you, are you, uh, you have section 56-7 in mind uh, when you were saying that you have a constitutional right to approach ministers and officials? Yes, that's correct. If, uh, section 56, uh, uh, 7, the governor acting in his or her discretion um, may at any time request from a minister any official papers or seek any official information or advice available to that minister with respect to a matter for which that minister is responsible under this section and shall inform the Premier of any such request. Um, but... Um... That section refers to ministers. So, so what's the basis on which it allows you to um, approach a public officer rather than a minister? So as the basis of carrying out my constitutional responsibilities under section 60, there are a number of areas where I would engage with public officers. These include, for example, the chairing of what was called the TSAC, the Territorial Security Action Group that included public officers uh, working and responsible for aspects of the nation of the territory's security and hence clearly is within my constitutional remit to engage with them. It included also for example the criminal justice advisor group, the CJAG as it was called, um, and clearly that links to the administration of courts uh, under section uh, 60. Obviously also there was engagement with the terms and conditions uh, of public officers. Uh, a regular engagement would be for example with the director of HR uh, on various uh, matters that may relate to uh, uh, terms and conditions of public officers. At other times, I would engage with the minister um, uh, or ministers um, with a framework for where we were collaborating together. One example um, I can recall is with the Minister of Natural Resources, Labour and Immigration, where the UK funded, for example, support to map the, I believe, the seabed of the territory and to do work to help preserve the the coals um, or the, the natural environment uh, where I remember uh, the minister and I jointly went on, on visits together. Um, other areas where I'd engage with the public service, for example, um, as, as part of being governor was to, to be connected into the communities 
And so my office would often contact ministers' offices, um, going through the minister to arrange, for example, a visit to a school or a visit to other uh, areas of public uh, service. Finally, the other area where in increasingly towards the end of my tenure, as, is, as I believe concerns escalated amongst public officers, or at least what was presented to me, I did engage with public officers because they presented with me uh, serious allegations of intimidation, serious allegations of political interference, serious allegations um, of direction um, that they felt uncomfortable with. And so uh, I did hold a number of meetings with public officers who sought um, to see me to report incompetence about the pressures that they were being placed under. I saw that as part of two folds. One, my responsibility around the terms and conditions of public officers, if they're being uh, allegedly directed to do things that they believed were wrong. So, uh, part of my role was to support them on that. And secondly, my duty under uh, the constitution and under article 73 to support the security and the good governance of the territory to help make sure that um, there, was, there were avenues for um, issues to be aired, discussed, and for me to then make decisions if required for how to ensure they could be investigated or dealt with through the respective uh, authorities. Thank you. Just, just to focus on the, the, the question I, I asked, you, I think your evidence to the commissioner is that um, you were acting constitutionally because section 56 7 does allow you to um, doesn't mandate that you must in your communications with any um, parts of government go through the premier what it specifically refers to is that you can request official papers or seek any official information or advice available to a minister uh, with respect for which that uh, to uh, to a matter of for which that minister is responsible. And you then have to inform the premier of any such request. Um, is your position that 56-7 allowed you to approach public officers or is it because it does not mention public officers that, that there's no restriction on you uh, discussing with public officers? Thank you all. Um, as I made it clear, my interpretation of 56.7 clearly doesn't require me to go solely through the Premier. Um, so it does enable me to, to engage uh, uh, request information from ministers, um, or as it says, any official papers or official information. And in areas where I have responsibility, I do engage with um, public officers, as, um, as I said. I don't see that in, in conflict with um, uh, the constitution, in fact, see it as, as fully part of me fulfilling my constitutional responsibilities. There were also one of the um, parts of the bundle you mentioned was about officers in my office um, engaging with other officers across the public service. Um, now, this uh, my office was made up of officers who were employed by the government of the Virgin Islands and also some who were employed by the United Kingdom government via the Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office. And there were areas where officers um, would rightly engage at a, at a, uh, a sort of working level to uh, support the interests of the people of the territory, for example. And these were areas that I, would, I took to brief cabinet on um, to make sure that they were informed. But areas, for example, in supporting programmes to restore electricity in the territory, about 25% of all of the electricity restored or the poles that were put back up after Hurricane Irma were funded by UK government uh, support. Building, for example, um, uh, water reservoirs, repairing sewage uh, arrangements, repairing police stations in, across the territory, etc. These were areas where um, the practical arrangements um, in terms of how this support would be done, there would be a dialogue running through um, between officers in my office and officers in respective uh, ministries, um, for example, uh, public works where it relates to, for example, sewage. The other area where there would be a very regular flow of communication between my office and um, and other ministries was on a practical level where my, my officers would regularly deal with their counterpart officers to fulfil the functions that I have as governor and to fulfil the functions that a minister uh, may have. An example of that is 
is Land. Um, I have a fantastic officer in my office who deals with most of the, or had a fantastic officer in my uh, then office, um, who deals with uh, um, the, the, for example, papers relating to, to um, uh, land that I had to, to sign off for. And they would regularly be in touch because of the, the files and bundles of paper would be moving around the various ministries en route to agreement. So there was the sort of routine engagement as you would expect for the functioning of any, any government. Um, and then there was um, the, the engagement that I undertook uh, correctly and in line with the constitution as per my responsibilities and uh, duties. In terms of the specific one that you refer to here, I see that in one of the letters, uh, I believe the one you quoted from the then, from the current premier to Baroness Sugg, um, was, I believe, um, following a discussion at Cabinet where uh, we, there had been ongoing discussion about the support that the UK would, could or would provide to the British Virgin Islands going through the period of the pandemic. And so it seems me having alerted Cabinet to that ongoing discussion, it seems quite, quite normal that a, uh, not a significant matter that an officer in my office would um, reach out to officers in other parts of the ministries uh, or other parts of government to ensure that there could be a proper dialogue about the support that could be provided in the most effective way. Thank you. If you take it back, Jasper, to, to page 122. Sorry, I'm between bundles. Could you clarify, uh, are we on, which bundle are we on? Um, this is the letter we, the first letter we looked at, because there are two aspects of this, the, 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 the two concerns that the Honourable Premier raises. Uh, the first is um, the proper route for by which, under the Constitution, a governor uh, should consult uh, with uh, public officers and ministers, which you've responded to. But the second, which is illustrated here, um, and which is described as a continual concern, of overreach into the public service is consulting um, or, or in fact summoning members of, of a particular um, body uh, without notifying uh, a minister and without notifying the premier. And so what is being done is that the governor and the governor's office are engaging directly and not even having the courtesy to tell the minister responsible what is going on. I'm afraid, afraid that's a statement I don't believe has uh, much credence uh, to it with respect, uh, Mr. Uh, well, as I know you're, you're reading out uh, words from a letter, not, not your own words, but the, um, uh, as I've, as I've highlighted, there are instances where my, my office would, for, to support the people of the territory and in line with the constitution, would engage uh, with officers uh, across the territory. It's included, for example, I would have a discussion about support to, to bring in vaccines to the territory. Uh, and that was a discussion we had at cabinet. I also discussed with the uh, Minister of Health about that. Having had that uh, discussion to, to uh, constitutionally, in a way, uh, 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 under Section 56.7, it is then quite right that uh, the practical detail is, is followed up, enabling um, the UK government um, to kindly donate thousands upon thousands of vaccines to help support and protect the people uh, of the Virgin Islands. So there were regular examples of where there, there would be a high level um, discussion between myself and, and the respective minister, um, and then uh, there would be a practical follow-up on on those kind of measures. They, they, they would also come the other way as well. But there would be discussions back from from officials in, for example, Ministry of Health about when the next batch of vaccines is coming or the timelines uh, around that. And that that is what you would expect as part of a a healthy position. But if I just take a step back, because we've talked quite a bit here about uh, the the spirit of the Constitution as well and the preamble to the Constitution. And so when I uh, remind myself of the series of letters that the Premier would write with these kind of assertions in, 
Uh, I also remind myself of, of being quite confused at times when uh, this, the, the preamble to the constitution has a clear commitment to a modern partnership. And so in a, in a partnership, you would expect there to be uh, dialogue with the elected government. You would expect uh, ministers and the governor to be, to be talking and engaging. And so for me, that, uh, that spirit of, of, of the modern partnership is something that I think is, is important to, to get the best uh, of the relationship for the people of the Virgin Islands. Thank you. Um, just, to, I think, to summarise what, what you're saying, uh, you, your position first is that you do not accept that your conduct amounts to constitutional overreach. Is that right? Correct. Thank you. That um, there is nothing in the constitution that requires you to only communicate with the through the premier or his office. That is uh, correct. And that um, what you may do as the governor aside, um, there is nothing improper you say in office, uh, your officers in, 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 in the governor's group uh, communicating with, with other ministries and department within governor, government at, without the need to um, take it to a higher level and alert a minister or indeed the premier. Well, as a matter both of, of the partnership approach that I talked about, and as a, as a matter of being always open with the elected government, um, I think, uh, uh, I can't recall every single instance, but I'm pretty certain that I would always be, be raising issues with the respective uh, minister. The working level um, inaction of the various conversations is something that you would expect in the functioning of, of any government. But uh, so if my, my officers and the ministry officers uh, and uh, we're engaging, uh, following conversations between uh, a minister and myself. That is something that I would expect, and I believe is you know falls uh, within the limits of the constitution. It would be wrong, I believe, and would have been unconstitutional if those were prevented from happening unless uh, there was prior approval of the premier, which I believe was the position you were referring to, and that position that was put forward by the premier, I believed, was. Uh, not with merit in the constitution. Thank you. And you don't accept that they, they may have been instances where um, you, you did not, um, or, or if you like, you, 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 you or your office um, sought information or took steps uh, without um, consulting the minister or alerting the premier as you ought to have done. I'm certain there were times where the expediency of the circumstances uh, meant that I may have to. So if I describe my first few, first few months in the territory, um, I arrived and within two weeks, the territory was sadly uh, devastated by two um, uh, mega, mega, mega uh, hurricanes, uh, hurricanes Irma and Maria. As part of that, there were very, very many decisions and immediate interactions that needed to be taken to um, ensure that lives were saved, that property was protected, that the territory uh, did not suffer further from um, any law and order concerns. People will recall, sadly, there was uh, instances of looting, or that people did not suffer further from, from a lack of access to water or lack of access to sewage, etc. So I uh, don't recall every single moment of all of those events. There were many, many things that were happening at the time. Um, but I do remember, yes, there would have been times I would have been engaging with public officers, um, partly also because communications were very poor during that period. Um, but in line with the constitution, I did everything I, and the spirit of partnership, did everything I could to ensure that the uh, uh, elected uh, ministers or elected government were fully engaged in that. So for example, during the period where uh, we were in immediate hurricane response, uh, held a daily meeting with open to all elected uh, uh, members, uh, obviously including the, the then Premier, um, also actually opened that up to, to other members of with the, with the then Premier's uh, uh, idea and support to do that, to other members of uh, the House of Assembly uh, as well. But uh, in terms of interaction with public officers, yes, there were times when um, uh, I feel confident for the need to, to protect lives, to prepare the territory for disaster. Um, 
to, to, to support the immediate aftermaths, to restore law and order uh, effectively. There are times when, when I had to, with the expediency and due to lack of communications, um, engage with public officers. And those are things that, that would, be, would be done. But uh, uh, as an overall framework, there was always a framework for engagement with uh, elected um, ministers uh, uh, um, as well. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes engagement was uh, difficult. Um, the, you'll recall I mentioned that I, I wanted to, to try and establish a routine of regular uh, one-to-ones or meetings with the Premier um, and suggested those weekly so that if there were any disagreements or any potential areas where either one of us inadvertently could be um, uh, uh, misunderstanding each other's intentions or inadvertently could be undertaking things that we, we uh, wanted to discuss further. I want to ensure there was a good space, which you'd expect as part of a strong commitment to partnership uh, for that. Unfortunately, that wasn't uh, an approach that we, uh, was fully supported by the Premier, but I, I still made sure that the Cabinet or for other interactions and areas uh, that I, I uh, upheld the constitutional um, approach as far as I could. Commissioner, I, I'm going to move on to a different topic. Um, I don't know whether this, this is a, a convenient time to have a, a lunch break. Uh, so, certainly. So in terms of Mr Jasper, we, we, is it just um, criticisms two and three? Yes, and then there'll be some other specific matters that we'll need to go through. OK, good. Um, Mr Jasper, uh, we'll now break for, for, for lunch for half an hour. So we'll uh, come back at um, uh, t t two o'clock, uh, I guess, seven o'clock uh, your time and Sir Jeffrey's time, but um, in, in, in half an hour's time. Good. Th thank you very much.
Good. Thank you, Mr. Rao. We're ready to continue. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Mr. Jasper, can I take you back to um, your written response uh, to the warning letter from the Commission? Uh, potential criticism two um, concerns the um, register of interests. Just before we start, um, the, the evidence on this, um, Sir Geoffrey, the, the, the election ministers have made two um, two uh, criticisms of uh, Mr Jasper. Uh, this is the uh, second one uh, concerning uh, Section 13 of the Register of Interests Act 2006. Uh, and this is in relation to uh, a, a request, it said, that um, uh, Mr Jasper made when he was the uh, governor uh, of the Registrar of uh, Interests uh, concerning information, I think, about the uh, failure of elected members to uh, make declarations. Uh, when um, this was raised some time ago, um, you were ambivalent, or, or perhaps more, more accurately, uh, I wasn't clear as to what you were saying, which may, may be a different thing, uh, as to the position, uh, as to the uh, as to your position in relation to the registrar herself. Um, I, I assume uh, that the elected ministers say that the um, registrar of interests has uh, uh, breached section 13, but is that assumption correct? What's the elected minister's position? You sum it up correctly, sir. So uh, the, the elected ministers say that the, um, uh, the registrar did breach section 13. Yes. Um, and, uh, and has anything been done about that? Um, I, I, I'd, I'd need to understand a little bit more about what you mean, has anything been done? Well, has, it, uh, has, it, has, has any action been taken uh, against her in respect to that breach? Well, I, I, it's not for me, I think, to, to say whether they should or shouldn't. I think um, the outcome of your inquiry may well be reasonably awaited for these things. Um, plainly, it depends on... It Sorry, depends sir. on all of the circumstances which you're inquiring into. Um, I, I, I didn't, I, with respect, I didn't ask whether um, what should happen. I just asked whether uh, that breach has been raised with the registrar uh, and if any action has been taken against her. I, I, I can't help with that. The, the, the ministers, elected ministers, are only seven members of the Assembly. It would be for the Assembly to... Uh, take any such steps and see whether they agreed about it. But, has, um, but have any steps been taken? You may not know. I, I, I genuinely don't, but I have to say I'm not entirely certain what the relevance of the question is. The, the, the issue first is whether or not a, a, the governor invited her to breach her oath and to break her, um, her, her duty of uh, confidentiality. It, it, it may well be thought by members of the House of Assembly that if those were the circumstances, she was put in a very awkward and invidious position. As I submitted to you before, um, clearly the correct approach, uh, I submitted some months ago to you, could be arguably to have taken a different approach in connection with ref ref going to court. I recall we had this exchange some time ago. But I, I, with respect, sir, I, I simply can't answer your question. And so it would be sensible for me not to say yay or nay to the precise question at the moment. OK, thank you. Mr. Rowett. Thank you, um, Commissioner. Um, Mr. Jasper, the potential criticism uh, relates to you. Um, and it is, I think, in, in light of the exchange between the commissioners, Jeffrey, I, I perhaps just set it out as, as it has been formulated by the Attorney General. The former governor requested information from the Registrar of Interests, which could at least arguably be considered as a breach of her oath of office and of Section 13.1 of the Register of Interests Act 2006. Such a request risk conveying the impression that the laws of the Virgin Islands do not apply in full 
to the office of the governor. So if I just uh, draw to your attention what section 13 says, 13.1 reads as follows. The registrar and any person appointed or designated to assist the registrar in the performance of his duties under this act. A, shall before assuming office subscribed to the oath of confidentiality referred to in schedule three. B, shall not save in accordance with the provisions of this act or otherwise in relation to any court order, disclose information. One, relating to any declaration or matter in the register, or two, that he has acquired in the course of, or in relation to his duties, or in the exercise of any powers or performance of duties under this act. The oath itself, which commissioner is your, your page 75 in the bundle. Yes, thank you. The form of the oath is this, uh, Mr. Jasper. I, being the registrar of interests, stroke a person appointed, stroke designated to assist the registrar of interest in the performance of his duties under the Register of Interest Act 2006, solemnly swear or affirm that I shall keep confidential all declarations and other information in connection with or relative to members of the Legislative Council and the Register of Interests, which has come to my knowledge in my capacity as Registrar of Interests, a person appointed stroke designated to assist the Registrar of Interests, or in relation to such office that I hold, and I shall not disclose such declaration or other information except as authorised by and in accordance with law. The point that, as I understand it, that um, the potential criticism goes to is that a registrar under the Act is um, not allowed, save uh, in spe specified circumstances, uh, to disclose information relating to any declaration or matter in the register. So they cannot disclose information that is that goes in the register or details of the register itself or information that he has acquired in the course of or in relation to his duties or in the exercise of any powers or performance of duties under this act now it's right isn't it that um the registrar of interest is a constitutional position Uh, that is uh, correct. Yes. And um, in terms of lines of reporting, does the registrar sit as part of the governor's group? Um, she she does in terms of uh, budgetary uh, group reporting, but is obviously independent in, in terms of how she uh, well she, she operates to the, the constitutional uh, approach and the and the act. Now. Um, you would have had, therefore, um, pointing responsibility for the Registrar of Interest, is that right? Uh, yes, that is correct. And as um, part of your role as Governor, did you meet with the Registrar of Interest? Uh, yes, I did. And presumably you met with her on, on more than one occasion? Yes, as governor, I uh, appointed a number of people who are, uh, including those who held sort of constitutional posts, uh, and would uh, meet with them um, uh, from time to time to discuss their their terms, their conditions, the the operations of their, uh, or how they were fulfilling their their post. Um, in uh, meeting with the registrar of interest, did, did you appreciate? that her role was one that went to standards of good governance? Yes, it is a fundamental uh, core part of standards of good governance. Uh, but really, it's not just her role. Her role is the embodiment of, in a way, the function that is responsibility 
of the, as is prescribed under section 112 of the constitution, it is the um, uh, application to the members of the House of Assembly, including ministers, section 1124, um, and the holders of such other offices as may be prescribed by uh, law. Um, and it is really about upholding the, the uh, governance of the territory for, um, through the declaration of uh, interest. She was fulfilling that, uh, that role, but it is a constitutional responsibility on elected members to declare their interests as is set out in, in section 112 of the constitution. Did you, um, or, or in um, meeting with the registrar, um, did she uh, disclose to you um, information or, or that her role um, could not be fulfilled without um, members compli complying with her requests and with the requirements of the registrar, Register of Interest Act? As part of uh, meeting with the Registrar of Interest, she made clear that her role um, could not be fulfilled without compliance. And she presented um, serious concerns that she was hindered in fulfilling her role, hindered in fulfilling the constitutional duties um, by members of the House of Assembly, including by um, members of the elected uh, government. So, she did highlight the problems she had in fulfilling her role and hence upholding the good governance uh, that the constitution demands uh, in this uh, matter. Um, did she um, disclose um, to you uh, the names of members of the House of Assembly who had not complied with the requirements uh, of the Register of Interest Act? The, so the, the Registrar of Interest did not disclose the registry book, did not disclose the, the interests, um, but she, she did in the course of um, highlighting to me what she felt, um, well, what she believed were very, very serious constitutional infractions by uh, members of the elected government and members of some members of the House of Assembly, um, that they were not complying with their requirements under the constitution to, um, to uh, uh, declare interests. And she had repeatedly uh, asked for those who were not complying to comply. Um, and I think uh, the Registrar of Interest was put in uh, an incredibly difficult position by the lack of compliance uh, by those uh, uh, that she had repeatedly asked for compliance from and um, was, um, to quote her, I believe uh, she, she was ignored um, in her efforts to ensure that the Constitution and the Act was upheld. Did she, um, to say, did she give you the names of members of the House of Assembly who had not complied? We know she did. We've got a document. She did by way of a report, if I can refer to, I'm afraid I don't have the bundle title, but I believe you have sent it to me. She did, this is going back a, a while, she had made um, her concerns to previous governors indeed, and then um, she did further after continued uh, lack of compliance and continued efforts to get compliance from um, elected members. She did um, uh, uh, send me a, what was entitled, if you have this in front of you, but a status report on members of the House of Assembly non-compliance with the requirements of uh, Section 3 of the Registrar of Interest Act 2006. Within that report, she highlighted um, uh, incredibly serious um, concerns relating to, to members who were delinquent in the compliance of uh, the responsibilities uh, under the Act. I received that report I memoed back to her on, or my office did on my behalf, uh, on the 20th of December, 2020. Um, uh, just noting uh, to acknowledging the receipt of it, I did not correspond on the, back to her on the specifics of any named member within there, obviously aware of the issues of it. And I 
I'm conscious that the registrar was placed in an incredibly difficult position by such a serious breach of the um, uh, compliance that was required by elected members. So I just stopped you. I, I, I think I, I cut across you and the reason was because we, we, I don't think we could quite hear some of what you were just saying. So could you just repeat what you just said, please? Uh, which part? All of it or? or the, the, the last the part. Beginning, middle or end. You've spoken of uh, uh, that the, um, you, you received report from the uh, registrar to, uh, of the extent of non-compliance. Uh, and you, you, you then went on to say that you, you took that seriously. Uh, and I think you were explaining the reason why you took it seriously. Yes, I took it seriously um, because it is a, a fundamental breach of the constitution. I will quote the section in the constitution, section 112, there shall be for the Virgin Islands a register of interest, uh, which shall be maintained by a registrar who shall be appointed and may be removed from office by the governor acting in his or her discretion. Section 1122, it should be the duty of any person to whom this section applies to declare to the registrar um, for entry in the register of interest, such interests, assets, incomes, and liabilities of that person or of any other person connected with him or hers may be prescribed by law. It then goes on to say that who it applies to, which is section 1124, to all members of the House of Assembly, including ministers. And under section 1125, it says that um, failure to comply with or the making of false statements in purported compliance with subsections two and three, um, uh, uh, then sanctions, to quote, which may be imposed, may include the suspension of a member of the House of Assembly from sitting and voting in the House for such period as may be prescribed in such a law. So for me, when I am informed of this, and if I go back to some of the earlier statements, throughout my time as governor, absolutely critical was to support the self-determination of the people of the territory, to support Article 73, both in upholding strong governance and security and self-determination, and to support the ongoing democracy uh, and the advancement of the territory for the benefit of the people of the territory. If something is reported such as this, which goes to the heart of that good governance, goes to the heart of uh, democratic accountability, that there may be members, uh, there may also be elected ministers who are in breach of a constitutional right, uh, who may be operating without sanctions having been applied to them, uh, as I listed uh, there, and who may, if they were in, in an uh, elected government position, may be making decisions uh, on the spending of public money, of taxpayers' money in the Virgin Islands, without having declared their interests. And you have noted my concerns about the, uh, a, a trend of use of tender waivers. So there was lack of transparency in where contracts were going to. Uh, a trend in Crown land being given out without full valuations or sometimes at subsidized costs. If, the, and this is just an if, because uh, I was obviously not party to knowing what people's interests were, but if that fundamental breach has occurred, that means that calls into question many of the decisions and undermines the, the self-determining and the strong governance uh, of the territory. So yes, I did see this as a very serious um, uh, issue when it was reported to me. The questions I'm asking you are, are directed to establishing what information you received from the registrar. So, so you, you've said that you, she didn't show you the register itself. That is correct. And did she? Did you see people, uh, members' declarations for for those who had actually provided information to her? I did not see any members' uh, declarations. I believe that would, as you've highlighted, she was under confidentiality of those declarations. So, so what you were told by the registrar, and tell me if I've misunderstood this, are, are the names of members who had not provided her with information? That is um, correct. And you will have to guide me as to what I can say in this. Uh, it doesn't matter. Open form. You, you have the paper that uh, uh, you have sent me, which includes uh, her status report, but I don't want to obviously get into the details or name any particular 
uh, individual. Mr. Jasper, if I explain that the questions are directed to what you were told, but um, we, we can keep it relatively high level because the commissioner has taken evidence from individual members and former members as to the extent of their compliance with the Register of Interest Act. But it, it's it, but just trying to pin down what you had. So you had names of, of um, individuals who had not complied. And you also had, did you, the, the years over wh for which they had failed to comply? Uh, that is correct, yes. Um, but what you didn't have um, provided to you by the registrar was that information that she could have entered into a register? That is correct. I did not have uh, that information. The only other part you haven't referred to, just for full disclosure, that I did have uh, was she she informed me uh, of the attempts she had made over successive attempts um, to get compliance from um, members who were delinquent in their constitutional responsibilities. So she did inform me um, of uh, a series of, of both letters uh, that, she, that she had sent um, to to try to encourage compliance. The Commissioner has has, um, has some of those letters and has um, that they have been put uh, to uh, individual members. Uh, th they are letters reminding them of their obligation to complete a, a, a declaration every year. Is, is that what you're referring to? Uh, that is correct, yes. At the time when you were having uh, these discussions uh, with um, the registrar, uh, were you aware that she was bound by an oath of confidentiality? I was aware of the uh, requirement for confidentiality uh, relating to the declarations of, of um, interests. And were you aware that that extended not just to a declaration or a matter in the register, but to information that the registrar has acquired in the course of or in relation to her duties or in the exercise of any powers or performance of duties under this Act? So I was aware of the uh, Registry of Interest Act uh, 2003, if that is what you are. Um, Two Six. 2006, apologies. Um, and, and did you, when you um, met with the registrar, did you request from her details of the degree of non-compliance that she was speaking of? Or did she volunteer that information to you? Uh, she had uh, volunteered information about the difficulty she was having in getting members to comply um, with the uh, Registry of Interest Act and their constitutional duties. She also um, requested my support to, in general terms, encourage members to comply. And I uh, did have that conversation with um, uh, uh, elected members uh, uh, to, 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 in general terms, encourage them to ensure uh, that they complied with their, their duties. Let's break that down a little bit. I mean, uh, the... Um, Registrar asked you to, to intercede to encourage members to complete their declarations. Just what steps did you take then to try and do that? So you'll be aware, and this is not um, the only governor who's faced these challenges, um, but the registrar in the past had written, I believe, to the speaker of the, or the chairman of the, um, I have to, have to just, reference my notes for exactly who that was. To the chairman of the Standing Orders Committee, apologies, she had written to, um, and then there was also correspondence to the uh, then Speaker of the House and to the then uh, Premier uh, as well con uh, concerning this. I also in my time had spoken uh, to uh, to elected uh, members to encourage them to comply um, with the um, requirements. Uh, that is something that uh, I would from time to time have to, 
to um, talk to elected members about compliance with um, with laws. It was not a position I would have wanted to be in. You would hope that they would be ensuring that they were complying fully with um, uh, with the laws of the territory that they themselves have uh, uh, part of the institution that have put in place. Did you um, speak or raise the matter with the uh, the leader of the opposition? Um, yes, I, uh, from memory, believe I, I did. And did you um, raise the matter with the Premier? I, again, from memory, believe I, I did. Um, uh, I will have to recall exactly, but I believe there was a general discussion at Cabinet about the responsibilities of uh, members of government, um, where we included uh, such things as declaring interest as part of that conversation. We also included compliance with the Cabinet Handbook, um, uh, etc. This was a, uh, a sort of a, an induction, if you, if you want, for, for some of the new members of the elected government. Again, you, your voice dropped. You, you refer to a, an induction. Sorry, I don't know um, if my internet is proving bad if I'm dropping out. I will try shouting <laughs> if, you, if you can hear me. So um, I believe the... Uh, uh, so what I was saying was that uh, in terms of the leader of the opposition, from memory, yes, I did raise it with the uh, leader, then leader of the opposition. I also did um, raise the need, um, again, in general terms, uh, with the um, members of, I believe, of, of the cabinet from, from memory. That was, again, from memory, I believe, part of a general um, discussion we had at cabinet in one of our early cabinets um, of this administration where there was a, a it wasn't formally called an induction, but it was a sort of briefing into the role of um, uh, cabinet ministers, which included, um, uh, for example, the, the duties under the cabinet handbook and as part of that uh, declaration of, I believe, declaration of interest. But I'm operating from memory uh, on, on that part, I'm afraid, rather than uh, paperwork in front of me. So. Do you remember uh, an induction for, for new cabinet uh, members, which which included uh, not just the cabinet handbook, but the obligations uh, under the uh, constitution and under the act to complete a declaration of interest? Um, I'm afraid I can't remember specifically what formed part of that. Um, it was one of our early cabinet um, meetings in 2019 under the new administration. In memory, I recall a place of it. I believe it was on Virgin Gorda. Um, as one of the first meetings we held on uh, that fantastic uh, sister island. Um, I had also, uh, as part of cabinet discussions, encouraged members to declare their interests um, and declare any conflicts as well. But I'm afraid I don't have the, the agenda of that uh, specific cabinet uh, to hand, but I, I do recall in general terms uh, uh, that uh, interests were part of the discussion. When um, uh, Mr. Jasper, when when the matter was raised in cabinet, uh, the attorney would have been there or or, or have been represented. Uh, did she uh, then raise any concerns over um, the confidentiality of all of this under the two thousand and six Act? Um, so, from memory, this would have been under the former Attorney General's uh, time, as opposed to the current um, Attorney General. Um, but I will, will honestly declare I cannot remember the exact wording of what we discussed. I do remember um, discussion on declaring interests. I do remember at one point, and this may be on the cabinet records or the file that the then Attorney General um, gave some advice on um, declaring um, interest. I don't recall the um, point about confidentiality being raised as part of that, but I. As I said, I'm, I'm operating from, from memory on, on that point. I don't have uh, the cabinet uh, records in front of me. Thank you. Um, did you, um, in your discussions with the um, registrar, consider referring her to the Attorney General for advice? Um, I'm not sure I uh, can recall that. I am aware there was some advice from the Attorney General relating to the 
uh, making um, the uh, interests public or the declaration of interests uh, public, the, the, which was a, a question. If you recall in the session we had before you broke for, for lunch or, or dinner for us here, um, there was um, a uh, um, discussion related to the letter that the Honourable Premier sent to um, Ben Merrick in the United Kingdom's Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office um, about the uh, <clears throat> uh, publicising, I'm sorry, I haven't got the letter formally in front of me uh, again here, but it was in the bundle we talked about before about publicising the um, uh, registry of interests. I think that was the letter. I think that was the letter of um, September 2019, was it, I think? Um, from um, Governance Bundle 3, page 28, I think. That, is that, um, so and at that point, I believe then there was advice sought as to whether the um, uh, interests could be made public um, as part of also reforms or proposed reforms to the Registry of Interests Act. Advice was sought from the then Attorney General about um, what could be done to strengthen the Registry of Interests um, Act. One of the matters looked into as part of that advice was about making the um, interests or the declarations, uh, those interests declared public. Did you um, give any consideration when you were having discussions uh, with the Registrar that by speaking to you, she might be uh, breaching her oath of confidentiality. Um, I don't recall I did uh, specifically on that, but we did discuss that she couldn't make um, the, the registry book uh, uh, public um, for memory that is, but uh, uh, in terms of the actual declarations. And, and just to be clear, is it's is your evidence that she, she leave aside the registry book, um, she would have had declarations from, from those members that comply, which would have given details of, of assets they may have held. Uh, she did not disclose that kind of information to you, is that right? Uh, that, that, that is correct. She didn't declare. Um, she did not declare the interests um, uh, held. She didn't uh, declare uh, didn't, to me. Um, give any information relating to those uh, those interests under declarations. Mr. Jasper, the the the, um, the, the criticism is that um, criticism is uh, that um, you requested information from the registrar, uh, which could at least arguably be considered a, a breach of section 13 and the oath of um, office. Um, and, and, and it may be that we'll have to have some submissions on the law in relation to that. But um, when you were uh, discussing these matters with the, the registrar, uh, you've said that you, you, you knew what section 13 said. Uh, did you uh, consider that it was um, a breach or a, a, a possible breach uh, of, of section 13 and her oath of office and the second part of the question uh, did she raise with you the possibility uh, that it was a breach of section 13 or her own oath um no she uh, uh she did not and i i did not uh i was part of that you will see on the trail of paperwork uh, on this that um, she had uh, many times tried to encourage compliance and she had also flagged the concerns about a lack of um, uh, lack of uh, compliance um, in, in general terms as have been going on um, for a, a while. I didn't consider that a, a breach that she was um, concerned about the lack of lack of compliance. That was her, her job to do so. I think I've taken that as far as I can. Yes. Um, absent uh, legal solutions on the point. Um, Mr. Jasper, can I move on to um, a third criticism, which is which is um, 
not one advanced um, by uh, the attorney uh, directly against you, but, but arises um, as, as a criticism, in fact, that the attorney makes of previous governor. And this goes to um, the fact and pace of uh, public service reform. Uh, so, so what's said is that uh, a governor is constitutionally responsible for public service reform, but has neglected this responsibility. For example, there is a lack of human resource systems and infrastructure in place to allow policy development. The current pay structures are a significant cause of problems in recruiting uh, to the public service. Record keeping is a matter for the governors in a parlous state. No proposal for the desperately needed transformation of the public service was forthcoming from successive governors and deputy governors until late uh, 2017. Uh, to pull that together a little bit more, uh, the point that is made in the elected ministers uh, position statements and their response indeed to uh, the current governor's position statement is that they have inherited years of chronic neglect of the public service. The effect for them as policy makers is that they are hindered in uh, moving forward with uh, policy because there isn't the machinery in place uh, for policy uh, formulation, policy creation for monitoring and evaluation. Uh, now, do you accept that the public service has suffered from years of chronic neglect. Firstly, let me just briefly take a moment uh, in terms of the public service, just to say that during my tenure as, as governor, I was supported by some incredibly talented and dedicated uh, public officers who went through some very challenging periods in rebuilding uh, the territory. Uh, some who I, I worked with are amongst the finest I have worked with in my long career in public service. And I, I thank them for their support to the people of the Virgin Islands and the support they gave to me as governor and the support that they uh, give to the elected government. That doesn't uh, 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 mean that everything was perfect in the public service or that there wasn't a need to um, continuously improve um, or to further modernize or to transform uh, the public service. I do counter though that there has been chronic uh, neglect as that assertion. There have been challenges in taking forward uh, reform of the public um, service. I can highlight uh, some of those as well, but there has been a long program of, of um, uh, plans to improve the public um, service. Uh, if you go to the uh, public service transformation framework, which is in the bundle relating, um, and I suppose we could call it bundle four, is it the one relating on the back of um, the, the letter annex that I sent to you? Um, that includes um, a, a detail of, of the uh, public service initiatives that have been undertaken over the past uh, 20 years. The, um, when I came into office uh, as governor in 2017, Hang on for a moment, Mr. Jasper. Let's just um, just do um, for, for the purpose of the transcript. Um, you um, have, as part of your written response, provided the commissioner with a document which is headed Public Service Transformation Framework 2019, um, uh, issued from the Deputy Governor's Office. Uh, now, um, that's is there a particular um, part of that that you wish to draw the Commissioner's attention to? Uh, yes, so there is a page within that document. Um, apologies, I'm trying to locate the exact page. Is it page five? That is correct, yes. In the, uh, I believe it is, yes, page um, uh, second. If, you, if you just bear with me, um, maybe may, the Commissioner, I'll, I'll put this in the record. Yes, please. Um, 
what, what is said, and, and this is a document which has a foreword that is um, signed by yourself, um, um, or, or the, 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 the foreword includes comments from yourself as governor, uh, the current premier, uh, and the deputy governor. Um, and there is a section which uh, says, in, under the heading context, that the government of the British Virgin Islands, Islands have undertaken several public service initiatives over the past 20 years. And then it sets a figure. Uh, and this figure, uh, in fact, is um, the same as the one that the uh, current governor uh, provided to the uh, commissioner as part of his written response. And it sets out various initiatives. So in the late 90s, there was the National Integrated Development Strategy. Between 1999 and 2005, there was um, introduction of service charges, uh, public outreach and engagement, employee engagement, uh, development of sister islands, coordination work. In 2000 to the present, um, Department of Human Resources and HR reform was established. Um, it, then there was between 2003 to the present, establishment of the Complaints Commissioner Act and Office. Um, then there was 2013 to present uh, financial reform in the establishment of fiscal management legislation, deployment of finance and planning officers, revision of the chart of accounts, uh, a medium term fiscal planning, financial protocols agreed. 2013 to the present, there was also internal complaints management program, revision of service charges and service culture, a governance structure for greater collaboration and decision making, launch of the government's official website, uh, implementation of revised public service standards of excellence. And then uh, under the heading transformation, uh, between 2017 to the present, strategic direction for an improved um, public service, seven broad areas of change, uh, commission of the uh, permanent secretary transformation team, deployment of a transformation unit to institutionalize and drive service-wide change, um, uh, OT employee engagement survey and the good governance framework. So is your point that if one in reliance on this document, what can be concluded is that um, public service reforms or initiatives uh, were being undertaken as from the late 1990s? Uh, yes, what I can in, infer from that document, obviously I was not uh, governor uh, back in the late 1990s, but uh, but yes, that, that document you referred to does set out the range of reforms uh, that had been undertaken. But can I ask you this, um, in terms of, you've spoken of your responsibility for, for terms and conditions of public officers under section 60 of the constitution. Uh, what was the ambit of that, or what, what did you consider that that um, gave you in terms of responsibility? Well, it, it gave me as is as it sets out in the in the constitution, really the the terms conditions that includes um, the public service uh, code, the conditions under which they, they operate. Uh, that includes um, the the uh, ordinance and regulations that uh, relates to uh, the public uh, service. As part of that also, it, uh, through the Deputy Governor's Office, uh, uh, related to the, the um, transformation of the public service, improving their terms, improving the conditions or the operations of the public uh, service. The Deputy Governor led that transformation program, but it was a partnership with all of the ministries, something that was confirmed at Cabinet as that, um, that approach. There are limitations though, to the role that the governor has with the public service. Um, and some of the challenges were down to some of these limitations. So the governor does not, as you know, have a vote in cabinet. So whilst uh, papers could be put forward to improve the terms and conditions, uh, the governor wouldn't necessarily have a vote uh, in cabinet uh, around those. The governor, of course, is not responsible for funding. Um, so to give some examples, I, the, the level of funding given for training to the public service was allocated by the elected government was incredibly, well, I would argue is incredibly low proportionate to the number of public officers, a figure 
I have in front of me is $25,000 for 3,000 offices, but um, uh, we'll need to, to have that checked uh, more widely. Um, also, uh, measures were put in place that could hinder the transformation of the public service. Um, I recall in, I believe it was uh, March 2019, um, from memory I believe it was around then, uh, that the uh, current Premier uh, put a recruitment freeze uh, in place, um, uh, using the budget approach to freeze the recruitment of public officers, which may also have hindered um, efforts to improve the public service. Finally, also, you will see from the, the papers and the bundle that you have um, that transformation plans, despite initially having the support of the uh, both former elected government and then the current elected government, there was a change in position by the current Premier, where he then essentially, um, through his actions, paused the work on the public service transformation. I quote from the Deputy Governor's a letter from the Deputy Governor, which if you have that same bundle that we were just looking at with the, um, uh, which had the, the, the plan, I transformation just... plan in there, there was an exchange of letters where the uh, Deputy Governor expressed, and I quote, how he was shocked and surprised by the position that was being held by the Premier. He went on to say the Premier is basically requesting to bring over two years of assiduous work to a halt because of a desire to see a public service responsibility led by his office. Um, I understand then in the um, submission from the elected ministers, including some criticisms uh, directed to me, there's a submission that the governor is responsible for the public service, which is something that I, uh, and for the transformation, but the, um, uh, uh, as part of that uh, uh, criticism, but the, the work had been blocked by that position. That the Premier had taken um, at that point. You, you said quite a bit and I need to break it down a little bit. Um, the first uh, point is you, you made a point about funding and I think you said that um, there was $25,000 for, for training for, for 3,000 public officers but um, the point that the elected ministers make is that um, in support of chronic neglect is that this isn't just um, about money. It's about support from governors and, and standing behind them from the FCDO and the UK government. So, and that support can come in two ways. Firstly, support that is offered in terms of technical support, training, et cetera. But, but secondly, uh, financing uh, training. So leave aside what budget that the government might choose to allocate to training their 3,000 public officers. Can you assist the commissioner with this? During your tenure as governor, what support did the UK government give the BVI public service? First of all, in terms of training support and then in terms of financial support for training. Thank you. But as firstly, a, there's a very important point, which I, I will labour, and I know we have uh, discussed this before, but as part of uh, being governor, uh, my commitment was to the Constitution, was to Article 73 of the United Nations, the territory is, is largely self-determining. As part of that self-determining is on uh, finance. Uh, the territory has been, in fact, in my time there came, I think, hit the anniversary of 25 years of being uh, uh, proud of being out of grant and aid from the United Kingdom. So the first call on funding for the public service should come from the democratically uh, elected government um, as appropriated through the House of Assembly and the, and the Appropriation um, Act. That is the right point and I, I believe that is the, an important principle that the territory itself sets its, sets its budget. Um, I did not want it that it would be the UK setting budgets for the territory or for the UK rowing back any self-determination. Uh, that was a position the UK never wanted, I never wanted, and indeed the constitution um, makes very clear is, uh, is something that uh, the people of the territory uh, don't want. So I would have always tried to, to resist that. Turning to specifics though, there were areas where um, in addition to uh, or, uh, or adding value to the um, uh, input uh, uh, locally um, uh, to take forward the public service. There were areas under my time where the United Kingdom 
government did provide technical support and did provide some funding and, uh, and expertise to support the efforts to improve the public service. This included, for example, funding um, uh, work by PAI, um, I believe you, uh, who, to undertake a report and review of the public service. It included supporting putting in place a public engagement survey for the public service. I believe this was the first time that that had been undertaken. And it included um, some technical support as, um, as well, uh, including through to some of the uh, uh, areas that ministers had identified where they wished technical uh, support. Uh, there is also uh, uh, public officers had across the overseas territory networks I know do uh, link up um, as well in terms of support. There was a heads of public service meeting which the deputy governor would attend along with fellow overseas territory um, uh, deputy governors um, as well. So throughout my time there was both funding, technical support, advice and backing from the UK government to transform and take forward the public service. But the fundamental uh, part, uh, which the UK and myself as governor and the constitution and I know the people of the territory firmly commit to is that the, the, the uh, responsibility for, for funding primarily lies with the um, elected uh, government. Thank you mentioned the, the, the position of the Premier. Could you turn up in bundle three, please? One, three, seven. Sorry, Mr. Rowett, your voice went a bit quiet. Was that bundle three? One, three, seven, please. One, three, seven, thank you. Which is um, a letter from the Premier to you dated the 10th of September 2020. Um, I'm not I've located that letter, thank you. You've got it, have you? Yes, I have, thank you. It's, it's a it's a long letter, so I I, I won't um, read lots of it out. But the, the point of it is that uh, the, the premier writes with regard to the public service transformation program um, presently before cabinet, and notes that that having reviewed the paper and comments submitted to cabinet on this matter, a number of critical observations were made, which goes to the heart of the transformation exercise. Um, Firstly, is that um, issues involved in improving uh, the uh, delivery of public services uh, were appropriate for the public sector transformation programme, but not issues around uh, legislation programmes or, or politically sensitive issues. And he therefore says things like a ministerial code do not belong in the PSTP. He, he makes the point in his letter that whilst there are human resources management aspects uh, to the PSTP, which are within the remit of the Deputy Governor's Office, transformation of government service delivery should be focused on upgrading the systems and overall structure of government to ensure efficiency is at the heart of the way government functions. Um, and what the transformation should, plan should do is focus on the long-term upgrading of the normal systems of government. The letter then goes on to um, say that there are numerous areas in the proposed plan that has been appropriated to the governor's group, the administration of which is already clearly delegated to ministers and ministries. And the um, Premier then returns to uh, reference the, the, the Constitution uh, and makes two points. So he returns to the example of who chairs cabinet in the absence of a governor, and then um, that um, the governor, it would be inappropriate for the governor to function as the head of government. Uh, the upshot we see is at page 140, um, where um, the governor says that in light of the issues, that uh, the premier rather says, in light of the issues raised, it's the position of the government of the Virgin Islands that the following must be done before the PSTP can progress any further. 
firstly that um, areas um, that um, have been assigned to the deputy governor um, and which rightfully sit with the premier's office or the house of assembly uh, must be addressed secondly the premier's office must assume the role of lead ministry for the pstp and then he says you need a human resource audit and an employee engagement survey now um, this was on the 10th of um, september if you go to page 141 which is the next page in the bundle appear to have written to the, uh, the Premier on the same day. Um, and he replies on the same day, uh, reiterating his position, firstly, that uh, his government's commitment uh, to tr the transformation of the public service into the modern, efficient and effective and accountable organisation that delivers high quality services. Um, but what he says is that um, his position remains that um, it, it is not for the deputy governor's office to take the lead uh, on the this public sector transformation plan. At 171 in the bundle, again, I'm sorry, we, we don't have in this bundle, uh, Mr. Jasper, the letters that you wrote. Um, we were only disclosed the letters that the Premier wrote, but the Premier on the 16th of October returns to public sector transformation. Um, and although, again, it's a, a long letter um, in which um, he reiterates his support for a meaningful transformation of the public service, uh, the, the Premier makes clear that on his analysis of the Constitution, um, which, as he says, it is what must guide uh, the way forward, uh, then there are areas um, of ministerial responsibility within the public sector transformation plan that are inadvertently listed for execution by the governor's group and which need to be restored to the ministry under which they substantially reside. And then on the 19th of November at page 180, He reiterates, um, and I think what, what had followed was a, a proposal uh, for a leadership partnership model, which was proposed by the deputy governor with um, the, his office and the premier's office working in partnership. But the premier rejected uh, the, the, the proposal raised by the deputy governor, which was that he be the chair and the permanent secretary to the Premier's office be um, deputy chair. In the Premier's view, that was not a leadership partnership, but an arrangement that puts the governor's office in charge of responsibilities that are outside the governor's constitutional scope. Um, now, th this was the Premier expressing a view based on his analysis of the constitution and based on his analysis of the uh, limitations that the constitution places on a governor um, and in relation to section 60 uh, it was your, your limitations were related to terms and conditions of public officers but not um, related to matters that more properly fell under other ministries and should be seen as properly falling under ministries now you mentioned that the premier's decision to make the or to, to have his office take the lead hindered the process. Um, but it, you, you can, that takes us to the, you reference a, a letter from the deputy governor, but, but just be clear in what way did that hinder the transformation plan? Thank you. Um, so the transformation plan had been to Cabinet before, and Cabinet had endorsed the approach, including endorsing the approach uh, 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 of the Deputy Governor's leadership uh, of this programme, but also endorsing the approach where ministers, uh, ministries themselves, were leading their respective parts of it. That was uh, clear in the approach that was taken. Um, as you say, I haven't unfortunately got uh, my letters here um, uh, that they, uh, which I'm sure can be got, but I don't have access. Uh, to them, but that was uh, uh, approach taken, and um, that 
was how the, the transformation program then proceeded based on cabinet's agreement uh, of that um, approach. When the Premier, uh, after a number of conversations I attempted uh, through uh, the cabinet steering group, um, and, uh, uh, and I believe we also had a, a bilateral conversation, uh, the problem was that the plan could not go forward unless there was um, it got to cabinet for the agreement to cabinet to then uh, process. So when uh, the offer of which I believe is in one of the letters, my letters, or I'm operating from memory uh, here rather than seeing that letter, but I believe uh, I put forward an offer. I or the deputy governor put forward an offer for taking this forward in a partnership approach to take account of those. Um, issues that have been raised. As I've talked about earlier, my approach always was to, to attempt to operate uh, in a clear partnership approach. Um, that uh, the Deputy Governor is the, obviously de facto head of government, taking that forward then with the uh, Premier's Permanent Secretary. But that was, as you say, was rejected by the Premier and that led to a delay in the transformation programme uh, progressing. The point you made, and, and this is a, 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 the Deputy Governor writing to you on the 23rd of September 2020 on Public Service Transformation Programme. Um, the Deputy Governor explained um, that Cabinet had uh, agreed to um, accepted the public tra service transformation framework on 26 February 2020, agreed to receive presentations from each ministry. And, and he writes, the transformation framework was presented and supported by cabinet and clearly delineated areas of responsibilities and accomplishments for each ministry. There was a full partnership to this point, And I must admit, I'm totally gassed by the recent requested change of path. It has always been clear that the transformation plan is owned by each respective ministry. Under the heading, the Premier's office must assume the role of lead ministry of PSTP. The Deputy Governor writes, I was shocked and surprised, upon receiving the note, I was shocked and surprised of the position which is being held by the Premier. Namely, quote, the Premier's office must assume the role of lead ministry of the PSTP, end quote. The Premier is basically requesting to bring over two years of assiduous work to a halt because of his desire to see a public service responsibility led by his office. This is therefore an alarming and urgent matter that must be addressed. The notion that a public service transformation program should now be led by the Premier's office creates an opportunity for there to be a clear delineation between the roles of the Premier's office and the Deputy Governor's office in leading the public service. The answer to the question of who leads the public service must be addressed with urgency. The Premier's office is responsible for setting and leading the policy agenda of the government. Public service transformation is a programme geared at improving the overall efficiency of the public service and must be led by the Deputy Governor's office, who has overall responsibility for the management of the public service. There is no attempt to guide and lead government's agenda, and there will be varying overlaps when a matter on the government's agenda also results in an improved public service, such as implementation of legislation to introduce e-government and digital transformation. I do believe discussions can bring, bring clarity to this matter. Now, this is September 2020. Were there further discussions then as to who should lead um, on the public sector transformation programme? Um, yes, I recall there were further discussions. I agree with the position you, uh, that the Deputy Governor put forward, and that is a position that uh, mirrors the, the constitutional position around the respective roles, um, that the, the policy agenda of government is set by the elected uh, government, but that the terms and conditions, as, uh, as you saw it, the, the uh, management... Uh, uh, keep your voice up, please. Public service, um, ...is through the Deputy Governor. Is it? Um, uh, through the governor, but uh, delegated through the deputy governor. Um, so there were some discussions uh, held, both myself and the deputy governor, and also um, myself, the premier, and the deputy governor. Um, the, as you made aware, uh, the or you highlighted, uh, the deputy governor put forward a proposal to 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 a cement that partnership approach even further. Um, rightly reflected the fact that it was already a partnership approach um, 
uh, but the Deputy Governor put forward proposals to cement that departure approach even further. And uh, we tried to discuss those with the Premier, but you will have already referred to the letter from the Premier in which uh, that approach, partnership approach, was uh, rejected. And so was the upshot that Cabinet uh, decided that, that the Premier's office should lead on the public service transformation plan? Um, I recall at the time that the paper didn't make it to Cabinet. So Cabinet, uh, we would discuss these issues at Cabinet Steering Group, but I unfortunately I haven't got the Cabinet minutes here of when it did go to Cabinet, but I don't recall at this point it went to Cabinet because of this uh, 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 perceived impasse, as you've highlighted. Okay. Um, if you turn up bundle one, please. And you go to page 913. Uh, if I take you to um, paragraph um, 24, please. I think you um, suggested, uh, or, or your evidence was suggested, if I heard you correctly, was that in March 2019, uh, Cabinet um, had a, a hiring freeze, is that right? You're muted. I'm sorry, you're, you're muted, Mr Jasper. Apologies, that was bound to happen at some point. Um, uh, yes, I, uh, as I said, I was operating from, uh, from memory, but I believe it was around March uh, 2019. It was very soon into the tenure of the current uh, uh, Ed administration. And um, which, which sectors of the public service did it cover? I believe it was applied across the board to the public service. Um, I am again operating from memory, but I believe the chain of events was that the Premier instigated a uh, recruitment or a hiring freeze um, or appointment freeze, uh, which I uh, was done without consultation with myself. I obviously have responsibility around uh, appointments and. Uh, terms and conditions of public uh, officers. Uh, when I asked for that to be discussed and that particular note to be would, um, uh, amended um, uh, following discussions, uh, I believe then the freeze was placed on the budget side of it so that people could not move forward even if they could recruit someone they couldn't actually move forward with a budget uh, position uh, around uh, that post. Just, just so that we can be clear, um, 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 uh, 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 you're saying an appointment freeze was instituted uh, without consultation with you, but um, ultimately the way it was done was in terms of, of freezing budgets, is that right? I believe that is... Um, uh, correct, but I will need to refer to the exact papers to, to the exact chain of events. But yes, I believe it was um, based on initially um, freezing posts, for want of a better word, and then moved to uh, freezing the, the budget. And the effect of freezing of the budget means you had no money to, to appoint. Is that what you're saying? I, yes, it essentially means that appointments could not uh, proceed or there were difficulties in um, uh, in, in appointing um, across the, the public service. Now, if I take you to, to paragraph 24, 
Uh, one of the points that's made, and this is in the response of the elected ministers to the governor, is that the FCDO has consistently pressed the government to reduce the size, growth, operating costs and wages bill of the public service. Uh, no doubt, because of that, an external recruitment freeze in the public service was proposed to the cabinet by the then governor in 2010, which was implemented until 2012. And a further freeze on external recruitment was proposed to cabinet by the former governor in a cabinet paper dated 28th of May 2018 and subsequently adopted. Now you'll see that um, proposal, um, and I'm taking the uh, reference to former governor to be you, it's in the second governance bundle, so bundle two, page Um, that paper is um, a detailed paper, but recorded as a memorandum to cabinet from um, the governor, and it sets out um, <clears throat> information as to employee statistics pre and post the hurricane, in-service retirement trends, management of human resources strategy. But it, the decision that, that was being sought was for cabinet to decide to cease non-essential external hiring, um, agree to advertise technical and highly difficult to fill posts both internally and externally, you know, concurrently in order to fill those positions in a more efficient manner, decide to maintain cabinet's decision to treat scholarship students as internal candidates and decide that essential cases of external hiring be considered by the governor in accordance with section 92 of the Virgin Islands uh, Constitution Order. C could you just first of all explain what um, external hiring means? That is the hiring of persons who are outside of the um, public service. And who um, was to decide what is, what is an essential as opposed to a non-essential external hire? Um, could you just refresh me with the page number you're referring to as well, please? Five to eight, please, Mr. Jasper. I'm afraid I don't have a page 528 in Governance Bundle 2. Are you certain it's in Governance Bundle 2? 1528. 1528. Uh, in Governance Bundle 2? Yes. I'm afraid my Governance Bundle 2 goes up to page 135. Unless I'm mistaken. It. So uh, in my bundle, it's marked bundle one, not two. So it may be that uh, Mr. Jasper has the same as I do. This is uh, come to me as government's governance bundle one. And Let's I see the paper is there. One, five, two, eight, then in governance bundle one. Thank you, Sir Jeff. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I do uh, have that uh, as part of uh, Governance Bundle 1, and thank you, Sir Jeffrey, for the clarification. This is a paper you're bringing forward, uh, and um, tell me if I, if I misunderstood it, but you're recommending to Cabinet that they decide to cease non-essential external hiring. Um, and if you look at D, that 
decide that essential cases of external hiring should be considered by you in accordance with section 92 of the constitution. Um, and and the, the, what the elected minister says that was uh, adopted as a strategy. Y yes, well, I don't have here is the cabinet minute. Um, so I, again, I'm going by, by memory. I have the paper here, but I do recall, I believe that that was adopted um, with the agreement of cabinet. That was partly due to the concern at that point about the budgets uh, uh, of the territory as a whole. What concern was there? I'm sorry, Mr. Mad, I, I couldn't hear the question. What concern was there over budget at that time? At that, uh, at that time, the um, then government uh, administration uh, had uh, put forward a series of proposals relating to concern about the recovery uh, or the impact of the hurricanes on the financial health of the territory and the potential um, impact on revenue. In May 2018, we were still very much uh, as a territory in uh, recovery mode. Um, there was obviously been an impact on tourism uh, revenue um, and there was spending being required to rebuild um, aspects of the territory. It was from the back of that that um, uh, uh, this uh, paper was brought forward where there were requests from the cabinet, uh, the cabinet at, at that time, to look at how we could reduce costs. And this was a proposal put forward about um, ensuring that the public service did not grow with external hires, um, partly out of a desire, if I recall from memory, um, to protect existing public officers should there be a worsening financial uh, situation. Um, I believe there was a further consideration relating to your, your question around, uh, which I'm conscious I haven't answered, but relating to essential cases um, where some guidelines were put in place relating to what constitutes an essential member uh, of staff. I'm afraid I don't have those guidelines here, but I do recall, um, I believe, the Director of HR um, through the Deputy Governor's Office did uh, develop uh, guidelines uh, around essential. Um, if I take you to, to paragraph two, just to understand the, the, the context in which you, you say this paper was produced. F firstly, is your evidence that cabinet called uh, for proposals to uh, reduce costs? There was a, I can recall, again, I don't have the cabinet records from those cabinets, but I do recall um, discussions with the then government about um, the need to look at uh, costs. I do recall that there was uh, a request to look at the cost of the public service. This include, I believe, included, I believe, analysis by the then financial secretary um, relating to aspects of the budgets for the public service, including aspects such as allowances, um, pay, et cetera, for the public service. So yes, it did stem from uh, discussion um, requests at uh, the then cabinet. Um, what's said in paragraph two is that it's recommended that voluntary measures are taken to cease non-essential hiring in the service and to stabilize employment costs, to redirect savings to the areas of highest priority and to avoid payless pay dates. Um, was that a, a real risk that if you didn't reduce costs, you could end up not being able to pay people? As I recall at that point, there was a genuine concern which was raised by the financial secretary um, and by the, the then Premier and Minister of Finance bringing, I believe, the paper to cabinet. Um, there was genuine concern about the state of the territory's economy um, and hence the impact on potential government revenue following the uh, hurricane. So yes, the context was there was genuine concern that um, the territory could be faced with a, uh, a crunch point on its ability to, to uh, finance all that it needed to finance um, at that uh, 
at that point, whilst also directing money towards the recovery of um, the territory. And we talked earlier about the loan guarantee and part of those discussions were about opening up financing routes for the territory and the government um, uh, uh, to avoid um, any potential areas of concern, but also to ensure that the territory's recovery could continue. And do you accept the point that's made by the elected ministers that the FCDO has constantly pressed the government to reduce the size uh, and of its public service? So I um, do accept that there has been um, support from the Foreign and Common, Common and Development uh, Office, or probably FCO as it was at that time, to help to improve the public service, to look at the efficiency and the effectiveness uh, of the public service. Part of that at times did include questioning the size, I believe, of the public service as part of its efficiency, um, but also other areas including um, supporting the territory to become uh, uh, a more modern uh, public service as we talked about um, earlier. Was your um, proposal um, to cease non-essential external hiring then uh, an example of the FCDO uh, pressing the government to reduce the size of its public service? Uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, this was a proposal brought forward by the government of, uh, well, by, by myself as governor, as the paper, but acting in my constitutional role as part of the government of uh, the Virgin Islands. This was not a proposal brought uh, forward um, because of any uh, uh, pressure or, um, from the Foreign Office. Uh, this was a proposal brought forward in response to the Cabinet of the Virgin Islands and the pressures that the government of the Virgin Islands uh, was facing at that particularly challenging period um, after the hurricanes. Travis, I see the time. It's, it's now a good time for a, a break. Certainly. And, and it, uh, perhaps we can then also take, um, stock. take stock. Good. Um, uh, Mr Jasper, we'll have a five minute break and, and then we'll work out um, how we're going to deal with the rest of the day, given, given that we have another witness due uh, at, at four o'clock. Um, but um, let's have a five minute break and then we'll come back and discuss that briefly. Thank, thank you very much.
Good. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, we have a, 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 another witness coming at four o'clock. Um, that is in a, in a few minutes. Um, and we, we've still got a, 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 a few topics to go through with um, Mr. Jasper. Uh, what I propose to do is um, um, Mr. Rowett is going to finish this particular topic, which should not take very long, uh, only a few minutes, I think, uh, today. Uh, then, so far as today is concerned, we will break for five minutes and then um, uh, we'll call the uh, Auditor General. Uh, and, and Mr. Jasper, uh, fortunately, is able to come back tomorrow uh, at, at eight o'clock BVI time. So we'll uh, re recommence with Mr. Jasper at eight o'clock tomorrow uh, to a conclusion. Uh, we'll deal with any application uh, for questions by um, uh, Sir, Sir Geoffrey after that, and then um, uh, come to the Premier, hopefully uh, at 10 o'clock um, tomorrow morning. Uh, and, and thank you, Mr. Jasper, for uh, making yourself available tomorrow just to complete the evidence, which will be um, uh, very helpful in, 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 indeed. Good. Unless there are any observations on that, um, I'll ask Mr. Rowett to uh, proceed to a conclusion on this topic. Good. Thank you very much, Mr. Rowett. Um, Mr. Jasper, can I take you back into bundle one, page 913, please? Mr. Jasper, can you hear us? I, th I think you're muted, Mr. Jasper, but we can see you. No, we can't hear you. Hello, can you hear me? We can, we can, can hear, hear you now, thank you very much. We, we lost you for a moment, but we've got you back. Good. Thank Apologies. you. Apologies, Richard, my connection failed for, for a moment. Uh, uh, th th these things happen. Um, Mr. Alwatt. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Jasper, can I just take you back to page 913, please? Uh, sorry, for, for or bundle one, that is. One, please. Uh, I'm on our page uh, 913. Thank you. We're just um, sorting out some, some technical issues, Mr. Jasper. So if you um, give me one moment.
are, are, we, all, are we all back? Uh, again, Mr. Jasper, can, can you still uh, see and hear us? Uh, I can indeed, Commissioner. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, we're, we're hopefully at page uh, 913, and this is um, part of the response to the position statement of the current governor. And so I've taken you to um, the argument that the FCDO has constantly pressed the government to reduce the size of the public service. And we looked at the paper that you brought forward. Um, what the um, response continues uh, it, by saying is that, that these no doubt these policies have led to serious difficulties within the public service and ministers consider a different and more balanced approach is necessary and it then refers to the current administration approving payment of annual performance increments for the years 2016 and 17 and 2017 and 18 and having and strongly advocating a comprehensive review of pay structures within the whole of the public service uh, but but in, it's this point um uh, uh, which you might be able to assist on, albeit I accept it's going to a, a response to the current governor. But what's said is no particulars are given as to any occasion on which a request to provide financial support for a serious, credible and coherent plan for transformative change in the public service has been declined by the existing or any previous cabinet. Uh, are you able to, to either confirm that to the commissioner or if you don't agree with it, explain why. Um, thank you, sorry, my connection is slightly cutting uh, in and out. Uh, I believe you are asking about a credible plan for transformation. Is that correct? Yes, well, financial support for such a plan. Uh, sorry, and which which aspect of financial support in particular, uh, Mr. Ard, apologies, I, I missed some of the first part of the question. The point was made that the governor's position statement doesn't give any particulars as to any occasion where a request to provide financial support for a serious, credible and coherent plan for transformative change in the public service has been declined by the existing or any previous cabinet. Uh, ca can you help with this? Uh, it, is it, is it right, first of all, um, that where plans for modernizing or transforming the public service has been put before a cabinet, then that cabinet has been prepared to provide financial support? Or if you don't agree with that proposition, can you explain why you don't agree with it? Thank you. Um, I don't fully agree with it from, from um memory uh, as part of the appropriation act the budget tax essentially that, that goes to cabinet um the as part of the preparation for that uh, there was pressure placed on bringing down the budgets um uh, for these kind of activities uh, through the governor's group the deputy governor's group um, i'm afraid i don't have the appropriation act to to hand here on the exact uh, uh figures uh, uh within it Secondly, as we discussed earlier, part of the, I believe the, the uh, problem was towards the end of my tenure, uh, was that the, the, uh, the plan for transformation, um, as we discussed earlier, did not make it to cabinet due to that exchange of letters from the premier, which meant that progress was uh, stalled um, in terms of taking the plan uh, forward. Thank you. Can I ask you uh, to turn to 916 in the same document, please? Paragraphs 45 and 46, the elected ministers respond to a point made by the current governor as to the challenges facing both the Royal Virgin Island Police Force and the Office of the DPP. Um, and those challenges um, amount to um, lack of resources uh, for training and for filling vacant slots. And what's recorded by the 
Governor, is that the outgoing Commissioner of Police in his 2020 report noted that the Royal Virgin Island Police Force regular allocated budget falls far below the reasonable costs required to maintain the competencies and highly skilled requirements and demands in investigating crime and bringing offenders to justice. It then points out that the police force has 67 roles unfilled. In the next um, paragraph at 46, there is a quote from the governor's position statement, which again points to the need for adequate financial resources being provided to the DPP and the Commissioner of Police. But at 47, what the elected ministers say is that they are unaware of any request by the outgoing Commissioner of Police for additional resources for recruitment that they have declined. Indeed, during the last budgetary discussions, the outgoing Commissioner of Police was specifically asked what sum he needed to finance the police, and his wishes were followed. Uh, can you, and it may be that, that you, you can't because it, it, um, of uh, the length of your tenure, but can you help at all um, with any information as to whether the um, outgoing Commissioner of Police was, able, was provided with funds to fill uh, um, or, or to meet the requirements he needed for the police force? I believe um, that funds were provided, whether they were fully adequate uh, is, is a different matter, but funds were provided um, uh, through the, the Appropriation Act for the budget. But the issue I believe that the Commissioner of Police faced was about the restrictions put in place by the Minister of Finance, uh, which delayed the filling um, of, um, of positions. So if I refer you to, um, uh, well, I, I remember corresponding in, in uh, July of 2020 um, to the Premier, um, following concerns raised to me by the Commissioner of Police, but also across the other areas where I held constitutional responsibility with the administration of courts as well, and through, through the independent, uh, uh, some of the independent bodies. Um, from what I have here on that, uh, vacant positions within the governor's group, um, that the even if the budget was being there, there were posts that had been agreed as part of the budget process as approved by the House of Assembly, but the, that the ability to go out to recruit is being held up financially by the Ministry of Finance. These posts include urgent positions, um, that included uh, within a magistracy, a magistrate, a senior administrative officer, a bailiff, within the Attorney General's Chambers, a solicitor, the Solicitor General post, a Principal Crown Council, two Senior Crown Councils, two Crown Councils. Within the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force, uh, uh, at that point, I mean, uh, there, were, there were 36 vacancies, which I was informed by the Commissioners, creating significant pressure on the RVIPF when they were at that time dealing with multiple challenges in the territory. Um, and some of those posts were specialist posts, including, uh, quote, one head of intelligence, one specialist officer for covert policing, one financial investigation, uh, financial investigator, a major investigations team comprising one detective sergeant and five constables, and a senior um, uh, investigating officer as well. I, I quote that slightly at length, partly because I believe the issue was um, even if money has been allocated, um, actually the, the assertion that was put forward and um, read out from the elected uh, minister's statement doesn't mean that actually in practice that money flowed through to enable the post to be filled and enable the full um, fulfillment of those functions, particularly as he mentioned the Commissioner of Police. I do believe the Commissioner of Police um, uh, was at one point, because uh, he informed me of it, summoned to see the Premier uh, about that, where he outlined uh, the vacancies and I believe the impact uh, that that was uh, having on the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force. Thank you. Did that, um, and what year are you speaking of there? What, what's the time period you're speaking of? Um, that is in uh, 2020. Um, specifically, uh, there was an exchange around uh, July 2020, um, which I, I just, that was at, at that point in time, uh, was when I highlighted the 36 vacancies within the Royal Virgin Islands uh, Police Force, but I know this was an issue that wasn't uh, just limited to that one point in time. Last thing on this topic, could you turn up please, uh, 
in bundle three, page 135. I have in front of me um, a letter of the 1st of July 2020 from the Honourable Premier to uh, myself. Is that correct? Yeah. And what, what he's writing in regard is a, a recent discussion that the two of you have had about your plans to commence one-on-one -on -one meetings with permanent secretaries in the government of the Virgin Islands. Um, the uh, Premier then sets out um, the follow what he says are the following provisions of the Virgin Island Constitution Order that are relevant to this the, the, the prospect of meeting with permanent secretaries. Uh, first is section 61, um, 60, uh, sorry, that's 60 open brackets, one close brackets, um, uh, which sets out your special responsibilities and includes uh, terms and conditions of service of persons holding or acting in public offices. Uh, two is that um, responsibility for the conduct of the business of government uh, including responsibility for the administration of any department of government shall be assigned to any minister by the governor in accordance with advice from the premier that's section 56 subsection one he then takes you to section 56 subsection five that the, it's for the minister to exercise direction and control over the department uh, including directing the implementation of government policy uh, he then takes you to section 56 five again and says the role of the permanent secretary is a supervisory one uh, subject to the department being under the direction and control of the minister and then uh, mentions um, and sets out uh, section 56 subsection 7 uh, which is the reference we've looked at as to the, the basis on which a governor can request uh, official papers and information uh, from a minister now, what, what the premier then continues is that i'm sure you would agree that the above provisions clearly identify the constitutional parameters that apply to the role of the governor in the system of governance in the Virgin Islands. The authors of the constitution in their wisdom were explicit that the governor's interactions with the permanent secretaries are limited to that of the terms and conditions of public officers. Venturing beyond these limits, you would agree, would result in breaching or overreaching of the constitution, which would be contrary to the principles of good governance. It is therefore imperative that all parties who would be engaged in your proposed meetings are mindful of this so that they do not run afoul of the constitution. In this regard, it will be necessary for measures to be taken for the enlightenment of the public officers so that they are aware of the letter and spirit of the constitution and why they must be careful not to step outside of these limits when having discussions with the governor. It is also important to note that constitutional protections such as confidentiality are intact only when conduct is within the scope of the constitution. Those protections become nulled when actions are committed outside of the constitutional remit. That is why adherence to the constitution is essential for everyone. Now, um, this was a proposal um, for you to have meetings with permanent secretaries. Did you in fact have such meetings? Yes, from time to time, uh, I did have uh, such meetings. Even after receiving this letter in which the, the Premier expressed certain concerns? So those, uh, the concerns that were put out there, and we actually covered some of this uh, earlier and are linked to that the proposal from the Premier to um, potentially act unconstitutionally by trying to restrict um, my uh, involvement with uh, ministers uh, solely by going through his office. That was obviously not a correct constitutional position as we discussed earlier. But as we've noted many times here, uh, as governor, you have responsibility for the terms and conditions of the public uh, service. That is even accepted, I believe, uh, in the position statement from the elected uh, ministers. We discussed that earlier, paragraph 18, I read um, out from their own statement, an important aspect of the governor's executive responsibilities is the terms and conditions of service, appointments to offices in and discipline of public service, including the skills, training methods, codes of conduct, practices, procedures, organisation of the public officers, that is from the elected minister's own um, 
statement para 18. So of course, uh, as part of that, from time to time, I would meet with the permanent secretaries um, as part of discussions on the terms and conditions of uh, 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 the public officers, uh, both them as individuals, but also the public officers that they as permanent secretaries are managerially responsible for within their respective areas. Um, but but did, would you accept that the, the, the Premier had a, a, a different and narrower view of what Section 60 allowed you to do as a governor? Well, I can't uh, speculate on, on the Premier's view. I uh, would, it, would accept that a number of times, and you would have seen for a number of these uh, letters, the Premier did uh, propose uh, different approaches, um, including ones that, as we discussed earlier, um, ran contrary to the Constitution. Um, but I was very clear throughout my uh, tenure, as I talked about earlier, I was guided by the Constitution, was guided by uh, the partnership approach, and was guided by uh, my overriding interest, which is to the, the interests of the people of the territory. In this regard, it was of course perfectly normal that um, uh, there would be discussions on the terms and conditions of public officers, as is uh, within my remit within section uh, uh, 60 of the uh, Constitution. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, I've reached the end of that topic. Good. Thank you, Mr. Rouse. Um, that, that, that's the end of that topic, Mr. Jasper, and, and, and thank you for agreeing to come back to, to, tomorrow at eight o'clock and we'll uh, recommence this um, ev evidence then. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll gather together um, the directions I propose to make at, at some um, later date, um, sometime later this week. But um, Sir Geoffrey, certainly in relation to um, section uh, 13 of the uh, Register of Interests Act, um, the criticism is put on this basis. Uh, that is that um, the governor requested information from the Registrar of Interest which could at least arguably be considered as a breach of her oath of office and section 13 one of the register of interest act 2006 um, ju just looking at that criticism it might it might be the um, attorney general's view uh, that it was not in fact a breach um, because it's put in a very uh, light manner and consequent I, I see you shake your head but that's that's literally true on the basis of the way in which the criticism has been put um, but, but certainly I, I would welcome uh, legal submissions on behalf of the um, uh, attorney uh, on uh, that issue. Um, j just to know really what it is that the re registrar is prohibited um, by section 13 and her oath, um, what she's prohibited uh, from um, uh, disclosing. Um, it seems if, I, if I may, if I may just rejoin that the, I agree it's put somewhat cautiously in this schedule. But if you look at the response to the governor's uh, position statement, you'll see that it's set out in much more express and clear terms. But I will certainly, I will certainly, sir, uh, clarify that and ensure that uh, you have submissions on it from us. Excellent. Um, th th that's as may be the the the. Uh, the minister's um, position statement uh, and their response to the governor's position statement um, uh, say all sorts of things. But the criticisms uh, which I asked for uh, from the ministers are set out in the table. Uh, those are the criticisms which they uh, expressly pursue. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's why uh, we are now focusing upon them uh, and why those legal submissions would be helpful. I can give I, I, I can give directions as I say on that and no doubt a number of other matters uh, later on this week. But... Of course, but let, let me say, if I may, that we would expect you to read all of the position statements and to take them into account and not be confined by um, the schedule of criticisms. What we've tried to do, what I understand was done, is that that schedule was intended to express the essence of what was set out in the position statements. So I wouldn't want you to feel confined or fettered from taking to account on some pleading basis 
uh, matters that are the, contained in the wider position statements. I'd be troubled if you thought you were so confined. Um, I, I mean, I hope that the schedule does cover it. Well, but, um, Jeffrey, it, it, uh, it would pain me if you were uh, troubled, but the, 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 the table of criticisms is clearly for, for, for one purpose, and, and that is to ensure procedural fairness uh, to witness I, it. I, I understand that entirely, thank you. But the point is that we've submitted evidence to you, and that evidence is before you, and it can't simply be ignored, we respectfully submit. And, and, and um, uh, to, to, to do that, um, I have to know what criticisms uh, can properly be, foot, be put, that need to be put. Uh, these are they. Uh, the e evidence is set out in the table. Uh, that's the evidence that is being put to witnesses. Um, and uh, that is what the focus will be. Uh, well, you must take your own course plainly, Commissioner. Forgive me. I, there's no point in a debate about it. This is a matter for you to decide. And if you choose to take that course, uh, nobody else can have complaint, not at least in the course of your inquiry. Um, and, and, and of course, I have read the position statements. I've read yeah. the responses. I've read everything. Um, but um, the criticisms made by the elected ministers, uh, which they consider should, as a matter of procedural fairness, be put to witnesses, are those that they have set out. And um, uh, you're right. It is a matter for me uh, um, to make sure uh, that um, all witnesses are acted uh, are, 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 are uh, accorded uh, procedural fairness, and that's what I'll right. do. Um, but right. we, and, and I don't seek to demur from it. I just invite you to consider all of the position statements and the evidence in front of you. Which, you, uh, of course, I will do. Can I raise? Then we're, then we're at one. The practical difficulty is that is that um, what is said in the position statement about the and it's not a position statement; it's actually in the response to the governor's position statement. Yes. What is said about the register of interest point is not uh, evidence; it's a submission. Yes, um, there is what that what I think the commissioner you will be assisted by is on the evidence that has been given um, so far why is it said this is a breach it would be we would be in a we would be in different territory if for example we had evidence that there was a register that existed and a registrar and i'm speaking entirely hypothetically i make this clear had shown us, uh, someone uh, uh, that register um, then it would be clear but we're in a different area and that's the area on which you would um, i think welcome assistance yes and, and in, in the form of a legal submission uh, and we'll certainly provide it, but nope. it is, of course, it is, of course, adumbrated very shortly at paragraph um, 108 onwards in the response to the governor's statement. Um, and I'm sure it's not difficult sir, to perceive, as Mr. Rowett did, that the oath relates to any information acquired by the registrar in the course of her duties, and they list of names, dates, and years of delinquency is information that she manifestly must have acquired in the course of exercising her duties. She didn't pick it up from the waste paper bin while cleaning the office. So uh, I will, of course, put that into writing uh, if you think it helpful. Yep, it, it, it would be helpful, and um, it may be that um, short, Sir Geoffrey, but uh, that would be helpful. Uh, so I know what the elected minister's um, uh, position is on it uh, on that and then i can come to a view on whether that uh, position is uh, properly taken good um what is it th 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 thank you again miss jasper we'll see you tomorrow at eight o'clock <coughs> what we'll do now is um I I'll, I'll i'll rise just for a few minutes uh, whilst we sort of reconstitute ourselves here uh, and then uh, we can hear um again from the um auditor general good thank you
Good, Mr. Rawat. Commissioner, our, our next witness is um, Sonia Webster, the Auditor General, and um, Ms. Webster has kindly returned uh, to uh, give further evidence to you uh, following an application by Sir Geoffrey Cox, QC, on behalf of the Attorney General and the elected ministers uh, to be allowed to uh, put questions to the Auditor General. Uh, you, you have um, allowed that um, application, Commissioner, but it is limited to a number of specific yes. uh, um, heads of, of questioning. Uh, the first is uh, relates to the Auditor General's uh, reports on COVID stimulus, and I think in particular the Farmers and Fishermen report, and that is the uh, use of the word inflate alongside the use of the word falsify. Uh, the second is in relation to uh, the uh, report issued by the Auditor General on the Virgin Islands Neighbourhood Partnership Project. And as Sir Geoffrey put it, the real question is, was it published or wasn't it published? The third uh, takes us back to the um, COVID uh, stimulus um, reports, and that is the timing of those reports. Uh, Sir Geoffrey wishes to know from the Auditor General uh, when she was asked by the governor to audit pandemic schemes, um, was she, uh, did she have discussions with the governor or anybody else about the timetable in which she should deliver her report? When did she know that she was going to be called to give evidence to the commission on the 28th of June? Um, and was she informed um, of the ground her evidence was required to cover? Um, the fourth is, um, as Sir Geoffrey put it, cabinet policy. Um, because uh, what isn't accepted is the auditor's position that uh, before you have a change of policy, um, a change of policy once approved um, by has to be approved by cabinet in short, uh, and that isn't accepted. Um, but what's suggested and what was suggested in submission to you um, is that it's open to a minister on good ground to alter an as aspects of a policy approved by the cabinet where particularly if he believes and where he, be he believes his colleagues will support the change. And as a political matter, it's appropriate to return to cabinet at some stage. Uh, that's, um, Sir Geoffrey puts that uh, on the basis of an interpretation of section 56. That may not be a matter since we are venturing into uh, legal submission where the Auditor General can particularly assist. Uh, the final area, uh, number five, is in relation to assumptions that the Auditor General has made. It is said the Auditor General made in her reports, and I assume again it's related to the Farmers and Fishermen report. Um, what Sir Geoffrey says is that um, those instructing him found puzzling some of the answers about the schemes themselves, and he points as an example, um, and I'm quoting from Sir Geoffrey here rather than the Auditor General, uh, he, he submitted that the Auditor General said that you would have to, to start such a programme, you would have to start such a programme by building up uh, the Department uh, uh, of Agriculture. And so he contended that the Auditor General's starting point was that the proper way to go about running such a scheme would have been to equip the Department of Agriculture with the infrastructure apparatus and equipment to deliver it. Uh, and that um, raises in Sir Geoffrey's submission, questions about whether or not the assumptions that the Auditor General applied to what is effectively emergency relief and stimulus schemes are really the opposite in the circumstances of the time. So um, with that um, introduction, um, I shall hand over to Sir Geoffrey. Good, thank you. That sets the background to Geoffrey. Yes, I'm most grateful, uh, Commissioner, and I'm extremely grateful to the Auditor General for coming in um, for what I hope will be a shortish period. Um, may I first put in a plea, both, or, or my plea in mitigation straight from the beginning, that is, first, my technological capability is not high, and all of the papers that I have are on, are on screen, so it may take me a little while to navigate between the pages. Uh, but there should be before the Auditor General, sir, a small bundle, at least I hope so, which includes in particular, and this would be the first document I'd ask 
you to go to, uh, Auditor General, please, the uh, Hearing Day 49 transcript. I don't know in which bundles that will appear, but we did ask that it should be before you. I think, I think it's in a separate bundle. I, I think I'm you're... most grateful. Got it, thank you. Can I assist, uh, Sir Geoffrey? Uh, the Auditor General will have um, the hearing bundles for the uh, COVID stimulus hearings. Um, she will also have a copy an, uh, of the Virgin Islands Neighbourhood Partnership Project report, and then in a separate bundle, hearing day 49 and hearing day 50. I, well, I'm extremely grateful, and it's today 49 at page 170, if I could invite you, Auditor General, first to go. And there you will um, see a, uh, uh, your answer at line 17 to a question that was put to you by counsel to the inquiry, um, which I shall read. Where you have a section 20 request from the government, does that affect the timing of the report or the timing of the work that you can do? Uh, now, your answer to that uh, Auditor General was it does, because if the governor, and I think the word government in the question may have either been a mistake or a mistake of transcription, because you answer it does, because if the governor is making a request, then you would expect to give it some priority. Why? Because he would have his own concerns aside from us having concerns about how the programmes might be run. He probably would have his own concerns for wanting to do that. Now, uh, Madam uh, Auditor General, you, I think, told the Commissioner that the Governor had, in fact, asked you to uh, look at these programmes with a view to carrying out an audit of them. Is that correct? That's correct. He requested that we look at the, the whole spending around uh, COVID, because I imagine that he had some concerns about that. Right. And, and can you help me when he first asked you to look at the programmes around COVID? Do you have a note of it? I think I do. minute. I believe it was June 2020, but I'm, I'm checking. Yes, June 2020. What is the note that you have there, um, Auditor General? The note I have here is simply of the date. And I should mention that when this was mentioned to me, we had already taken the decision to, to audit these um, programs. So um, anything in writing from the governor, because I told them that we were already planning to do these audits. So this was in an oral discussion between you and the governor, was it? This was in one of our meetings, yes. Yes. Uh, and um, had you decided to audit pursuant to Section 12 or Section 20? We had decided to audit it. Um, well, when we started the audit, it would have been a Section 12, but with the governor's input, it became a section 20. Thank you. Now, help me with this. Um, was his request that you should review or audit all of the pandemic schemes or only some of them? His request was non-specific. So in terms of the ground that you had to cover, or at least that you were being requested to cover, it was just generally pandemic schemes, was it? It was expenditure related to the pandemic spending. So. Yes. Now, um, at, um, I wonder if you could, keeping open if you can, the, the transcript that you have in front of you, go to the transcript, which I hope may be in a, the same bundle or perhaps a similar uh, another one but in any event of the 28th of june which was day 18 of the proceedings and if you could go in that uh, in that bundle to um, page 
page 93 of the transcript. Which page do you want to take the order to general? Page 93, please. At line eight. There, um, just to set the scene, you were being asked questions on your first appearance before the Commission about um, the request from the governor. Um, you'd said at the bottom of the previous page that you'd sent the reports to the governor because he'd made the request. Um, the commissioner uh, asks you, but it was your decision to audit, and you reply, it was my decision to follow through with the investigation. And you then said as follows, in fact, when it was brought to me, what did you mean by when it was brought to me? Well, it's impossible to answer that without reading the full context of it. Well, uh, j just have a look at the context. Uh, you, you're, you're saying it was my decision to follow through with the investigation. You then continue, that is to say, having been requested by the governor, you then continue, in fact, when it was brought to me, what I said is that I'd have a look at it. I'm simply asking, Madam Auditor General, what, what was meant there by brought to me? You, you, somebody seems to have been bringing you the proposition that you should do that audit. Was that the governor? Again, I would not answer that question before I've read the full context <clears throat> and I'm able to see what I'm talking about here. I, I think it's it's a little bit um, impossible to to actually make a statement on something that is unclear when when it is brought to me can mean anything. Um, right. But as you said, and I think I said this to the commission as well. This audit, we had already decided to do this audit, and we had been looking at it um, for some time. And when the governor mentioned it to us, then it became um, something the priority change changed somewhat because if we had concerns about it and he had concerns about it, then it was definitely something that needed um, to be followed up on. No, I quite understand. I just wondered if you could help me with what the meaning was of when it was brought to me, but you continue in any event in that uh, paragraph. I wonder if we could look at it because this is my uh, the main, main pur purpose of this question. You said, what I said is that I'd have a look at it and do a preliminary review to see whether or not it was an area we could actually look at, that we would not want to look at it. So the context of something being brought to you is that you'd said, well, I'll have a, an initial look. Is that right? That would be the context. But let me just say that without reading this and knowing whether it's referring to this particular audit or something else, I am unable to answer it clearly. Um, when it was brought to me, would mean that somebody brought it in, some, in any event. Okay. It does refer to this audit, Madam and Auditor General. I, if I were wrong about that, I invite correction from counsel to the inquiry. Um, it's plainly about this audit, and it's about, particularly as we follow through, farmers and fishers. And I, my question was this, what preliminary review did you do? Um, there's a reference at page 92, though, to, to four reports that were issued on the section 20. Right. Well, let, let's just have a look at this. Describe it in this way. All pa the pandemic reports is what we're talking about here. So you, you've had it brought to you. And what preliminary review did you do? You were doing an assessment of what um, it is in terms of um, the procedures for making payments, um, the monetary amounts that would be awarded to the various programs, um, who would be managing these programs, 
what criteria has been put in place to, to ensure that there are controls and that the amount still within the policy. Um, there are a number of things that we would look at before we decide uh, to go ahead. But in this case, if we are talking about the COVID spending and without me reading this bundle, I don't know what you're talking about specifically. Um, in this case with COVID, uh, one of the main issues why we flag this is because it's discretionary spending. And in, with discretionary spending, there are always issues. So the preliminary review would have preceded your actual commencement of the audit, would it? It would have to, yes. Yes. Um, and, and how long would that have taken from the date on which you were requested by the government to have a look at it? I would not be able to say how long that would have taken because it would it would take as much time and it would as we can in terms of the information we have. And in this case, um, we were still waiting to receive information. So it would take a preliminary review can take as little as a week or as much as a couple of months. And did you thank you for that? That's most kind. And and did you did you um, have periodic meetings with the governor to discuss this and other audits you were doing? We have occasional meetings um, uh, every six weeks, every two months or so, but not ongoing meetings to discuss what's happening with this audit. Did he ask you how you were progressing with the audit? The only time really I would discuss an audit with the governor is when I'm having issues with it. So may I ask you again, did, did he ask you how you were progressing with the audit? Not to my recollection, no, not this audit. Now, um, when were you first aware that the Commission of Inquiry wished to hear your evidence on the 28th of June, 2021? I do not have that date with me. I think earlier when you were being asked questions by Mr. Riot, you did say that you'd been informed that what the commission wanted to look at, correct me if I'm wrong, as you understood it, was any reports that you had completed. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Did the governor speak to you about the completion of this report once the inquiry had been called? This, it's not one report, it's several reports. Well, and the pandemic reports. Let's just use that expression, if we may. Reports. And I should point out that the governor changed within the period of doing this audit. And no, the, the governor did not speak to me about the completion of the reports, not at any time. If we go back to 170, where you mentioned that if the governor had requested the report, you would tend to give it priority. Presumably you were aware, were you, that the report would, it would be convenient for the inquiry to have as many completed reports as possible. Absolutely, yes. You can't help me when you knew that you were going to give evidence uh, first on these matters, but can you give me some indication? Was it a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month or two before you gave evidence? Sir, I can get that data and make it available to you, but I do not have that with me at the moment. Well, I'd be most grateful if you did. Um, so help me, help me with this. If you knew that the inquiry was keen to receive all reports that you had completed, and you knew that the governor attached significance and priority to the pandemic reports, and of course by then you would have known that the inquiry had been put into commission, would you not? So by February, you knew that there was a commission of inquiry, correct? Right. So you know that the governor attaches importance to this 
the or audits of the pandemic schemes. You know that it will be convenient for the inquiry to look at those pandemic schemes among your, among your other reports, correct? In my audits, I am not thinking in terms of the commission and being convenient for the commission. I am thinking in terms of completing it so I can move on. I and understand. But, but what I'm really asking you is this. I was not um, operating in my mind at the time. I'm sorry. No, no, finish, finish your answer. Please finish, yeah. That suggests that I find to be really borderline. But when we're doing our audits, we're not doing it for the commission. We're not doing it for any individual. We're doing it because it's our job. Quite. And no, I, I have no doubt about that, Madam yes, Auditor General. The audits, because unless we complete it, then it's useless. What, what so, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting for a moment that you're... For your... the programs, there were several different audits. And I was lobbying my staff to ensure that we can get them out quickly because we were in a period where we did not get the financial statements. And when we get the financial statements, that would be a priority. So I wanted to get these out so I can move on to that and not have them sitting on the desk. As it is at the moment, we have the financial statements and I haven't been able to, to do very much else with the existing COVID reports that we have. Well, um, thank you for that. Uh, I, as you know, the permanent secretary of the Premier's office um, wrote you an email. I needn't, we needn't look it up, um, but uh, it, it essentially asked you for one further week. On the 21st of June, she asked you for a week until the 28th of June. Uh, you, you sent your reports to the governor on the 21st of June. Uh, and um, on the 24th of June, the inquiry announced that you would give evidence on the 28th. Now, you haven't been able to help me um, when you first knew that you were to give evidence on the 28th. Um, just one, could you just give me one moment? Yes, of course. Just to assist, um, the Commission sent a summons to the Auditor General. Ah. The 10th of June, 2021. 10th of, 10th of June. I'm most grateful. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much. That, that's extremely helpful. So uh, do you happen, did the summons have a date on it, Mr. Rowett? May I just ask? Uh, yes, 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 it, it did. did. To the 28th. To, to the 28th, yes. Yeah. yes. Thank you. So you knew on the 10th of June that you'd be required to give evidence on the 28th, correct? Apparently, Yes. And at this point, the Premier's office was asking you for a delay, was asking you for time. And you decided that on the 21st of June, one week before you were due to give evidence, you would cut off the time that the Premier's office would have. And, and I, I, I'm simply asking, you'll understand why I'm asking, I'm sure, Auditor General. I'm, I'm sorry, we had both you should... And the Auditor General speaking at the same time. All what, right, so what, I, I would just like to correct him for a moment there. The Premier's office asks for time, and we give them almost a month, which is more time than we give other ministries, other departments when we issue draft reports. That was more than sufficient time. No, no, I, I'm not suggesting you hadn't given time, but you were asked. I'm sorry, they did not send us anything. Uh, we've been asking and asking. They've sent us nothing for 11 months. Are we to assume that within a week they're going to send us something? Well, the, the, the permanent secretary asked you for one more week. And I'm simply wanting to know why not give it to her since she'd asked just for one more week and she'd be ready with whatever it was she was preparing. Let's not confuse two issues. She asked you for one more week. But of course, if you hadn't, if you had given that week, those reports would not have been finalized to put before the inquiry, would they? Well, uh, uh, just, if she had uh, given I'm, I'm, me I'm, I'm, sufficient I'm, reason to give her another week, she would have gotten it. Well, um, uh, uh, and also the premise of the question isn't right. Um, right. It, it, well. that we could not have uh, dealt with that report on the 28th of June uh, if the report wasn't completed until the 28th of June or, or, or whatever the date was. Um, it doesn't mean to say that the Commission of Inquiry wouldn't have considered the report. At some later point, of course. Sorry? At some later point. Yes. Yes, well, at some later point. But 
as we know, you're particularly keen for your timetables to be to be uh, respected. Yeah. Uh, and the, the point I'm simply seeking to explore is, is it a coincidence? And the witness says it is, and now that's fine, that on the 21st, the reports are sent to the governor. The on the 24th, on, allow me to finish just for a minute, if I may. On the 24th, the, the inquiry announces it's time, to, it, the evidence is to be given on the 28th. And of course, the commission needed time to prepare. I mean, it is simply, uh, is it a coincidence? And Madam Auditor General, I hear you say it is. Well, sir, what I would say to you is then that in not getting a response from the Premier's office and having them ask me for an extension to that date, it did occur in my mind that they were actually trying to, to prevent the reports from being finalized. And, and thus not be available for the commission. And thus not be able be available for the commission or anything else. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Auditor General. So it was in your mind that this report was needed for the commission and you felt that the Premier's office was deliberately delaying so that it would not have be available for the timetable of the commission. Is that that's essentially what you've just said, correct? What I said is that it was in my mind that the Premier's office was actually using delay tactics to avoid the reports from being finalized. To the unavailable to the commission. Oh, well, you added that. Well, no, madam, I, I forgive me. You 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 said it first. I think the transcript will show that what you told us was well, that it was in your mind that it would not be available for the commission. Um, but I think I'm, I think I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. But it that it would not have been available for the Commission on the 28th of June. On the 28th, quite. We can see what the transcript um, uh, okay. said, but um, anyway, the, the, the Auditor General has, has, has given her answer, but is the, because I have to consider any criticisms that are put to a witness, uh, is the premise of your question that it was not coincidence? Well, I don't know. I can't assert that. I'm seeking to explore it. The, the witness has said not, so okay. I intend to leave it there. But, but uh, may, may I move on now just to my final question on this subject. At the top of page 170, if you just have a look, Madam Auditor General, for me, so before at line we, two. I'm sorry, Simon. before we move on, I need to clarify something. Um, I am not, I have not said that we were at any stage attempting to, um, to facilitate um, any processes. And I've said this earlier, when we were doing our audits, the intention is to do the audit to completion and do as finish as many of them as possible so that when we get the financial statements, we can move into that without having these sitting on our desk. And we were faced with a situation where the premier's office was not facilitating our request. And at that stage, we still needed to go ahead and complete our audits. Very well. At 170, if we may, uh, at line two. And that's facilitating the request. It did occur to us that this may be a delaying tactic on, on the part of the Premier's office. And this is my position with this. What would be the point of the delaying tactic? I don't know. You would have to ask them because they were not providing information. Well, yes, but what would be what was in your mind as to why there might be a, a, a desire to delay? Well, what was in my mind, there were several things, one of which was there might be some information in there that the Premier Office does not want us to see. And we did some specific searches that brought up some specific, um, in, some interesting in details that are not in this particular report and probably will be in the other reports. But we did some searches because we thought there might be information that the Premier's Office or people in the Premier, Premier's Office might be hiding or might not want us to see. Um, that was one of the things that was functioning in our mind. Right. Well, can we... Can... The, back, the, background, the background to your audit, as I understand it, is, is what is on page 170 at, at line 23. I mean, you've already touched upon this today, um, Auditor General, and that was this was, um, in audit terms, in accountancy terms, um, high-risk spending uh, because it was discretionary. Is, 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 is that the is that the yes is that the back, that the is background the background to the that's, audit this is why we uh, made a decision early to do this audit even before the governor had suggested it 
Yes, Sir Geoffrey. Thank you. Uh, top of page 170, just a slightly different point, but um, you see you say at the time there that it's not the first time, this is page 170 at line two, it's not the first time that we've gotten involved in the process early, and sometimes it's actually just necessary to get involved early. Um, and you mentioned about the, the, the sum of seven million it made sense for us to get an early look at it early and have a report ready, possibly to be able to assist the ministries, the departments that were working on this. D do you agree with Mr. Forbes, the financial, former financial secretary, that when he expressed his view that the Auditor General should not be involved during the currency of execution of a program, particularly in making recommendations about it, because when she comes or he comes later to audit it, she will to some extent be auditing her own recommendations. I think the former financial secretary, you started out by making a distinction between my office and internal audit. And he was right in that internal audit comes in during the process and they provide, they would look at the systems, the processes and so on and they would provide recommendations. Our job is different. We come in and we look at the money because that's what we have to report on. Um, in terms of what the financial secretary says, I do not agree with it because by extension, what he's saying is that at the end of an audit, for instance, when we make recommendations and a department adopts those recommendations, we then cannot moving forward audit that entity because they've ex accepted our recommendations. Um, for that reason, what he's saying doesn't uh, really follow true, um, doesn't ring true. And the other reason is that when we make recommendations, they're different to internal audits uh, recommendations. Our recommendations normally would advise the department to, to adhere to policy, adhere to spending um, plans and to ad adhere to what's already in place. Um, internal audit, would be a bit different, making recommendations on, on, on things that they see need fixing or changing or improvements that they would see. So our recommendations don't go to, to, the, uh, to the extent that you would see internal audits recommendations, for instance. Thank you. May I move on now to a different subject? And that is um, your uh, report on the Virgin Islands Neighbourhood Partnership Project. Um, now I wonder if you could go um, in the um, in this transcript. I hope I forgive me for a minute. I've got to navigate it myself and make sure I've got the right reference. But I think it's 115 of this transcript. Um, yes, 115. If you'd be so kind. One one five. Yes, of the day uh, forty nine. Now you'll see there, Auditor General, that you were, were speaking about um, right at the top. Section 12 audits are to be forwarded to the minister. Uh, but in a number of cases, the reports are not action. They're not taken before the House. So the general policy you told the commissioner is that once the financial statements, that is to say the main financial statements that relate to that audit have been tabled, the reports can be made public and you will publish them. Um, and you say, you explain at uh, line eight and nine that we'll publish them on the website. Now, subsequently, you made clear that in fact, and you again at line 18 of this page, you say we'll put it on our website, but if it's not tabled and the financial statements to which the audit relates are tabled, we will put the report on the website. Um, provided there are no issues of confidentiality or security. Now, 
do I take it that you did not, as I think you told the commissioner, you did not have a website in 2012, 2011, 2012. Is that correct? We did have a website in 2011, 2011, yes. But you didn't put your reports on it, I think you told us, because of some technical limitations of it. Is that right? We would not have put, we, we had a website and we did put our reports on it. And what I had said to, to um, the commission is that the website, um, we were not able to maintain it because the person who was actually managing the website moved abroad. Well, what you see I'm puzzled about is that what is your evidence? Was this report published anywhere in, let us say, 2012? Or wasn't it? We know it was not tabled before the House. We know that it doesn't appear to have surfaced in any cabinet consideration. Um, the, the Virgin Islands uh, newspapers reported that it had not surfaced or been published when it was leaked in early 2019. So what is your evidence, Auditor General? Was it published after at some reasonable point after you produced it or wasn't it? That report was published, I think, earlier this year on my report. Um, sorry, on our website. Right. So no, it no. Was, sorry, my fault. Carry on. Yeah, it was published, I think, earlier this year. And I, I believe it's earlier this year when we set up our website, when we finally got it up and running. Um, that's where the, when the report was published. And For the first the, time? For the first time, yes. Right. Thank you. Now... Help me with this, if you would. I imagine uh, on day 18, you, I think, gave evidence to the commissioner that it had been published more or less contemporaneously. Was that, was that simply an error? I expect it was. Sorry, Jim. Can you take us to the passage you made? Yes, I can. Yes, I certainly can. 28th of June at... Uh, Page 93, to begin with, please. Day 18. Have, have you got that, Auditor General? But, um, day eight, 18. What page? 93. Page 93. But we'll go to two references in this bundle, if we may. But the first is starts at line 13. Oh no! Wait a minute. I may have a. I may have a wrong. It, it's um, it's ninety four, not ninety three. I do apologise. Ninety four, not ninety three, at line twelve. The council, as you see there, introduced the report to you, and put this question at sixteen. I think that report was produced in or published in January 13. You initially said correct, but quite understandably, you then said, um, I'm, I'm not seeing the date on the report, and you thought that the date might have been a little earlier than that. So let me verify that date. Now, if you could then go to paragraph to page 124, of the transcript. Have you got 24? On page you'll 94. One, two, four, you'll see at line six, you say you're being asked about what the reaction of the ministry was. This is page 124 of the same transcript. You're being asked about what the reaction of the ministry was. And you said, I don't recall there being a positive reaction. I do recall the report, actually. I think this one, that this was one that was in the public. Was, and I, let, let's, just, let's just continue for a moment. 
And I can recall from outside, for instance, one of the institutions, somebody from one of the churches who ran into this, and she actually contacted us after the report went public, and he was pleased to see that it was being made public. Um, that the program hadn't done what it was supposed to do, and he wanted to know whether the ministry was going to continue with somebody who was actually going to do the job. And they told him to contact the ministry, and they might have an answer. So at, in your evidence um, in, uh, uh, on the 28th of June, although you questioned the date, it does appear, does it not, that what you were saying was it had in fact been published. It had been leaked into the press, yes. Right. So um, you didn't say that at this time. What you suggested was that you agreed with council that it had been published. I was agreeing uh, with council that it had been not? produced. Yeah. Well, have a, have, have, a look at, have a look at 94. Uh, I see the commissioner expressing dissent, so religiously faithful to his... We, we'll need to look at the document again. No, you uh, said, Jeff, it wasn't, it wasn't dissent. Uh, oh. it, was, it was merely a, um, a suggestion that that was a question which uh, perhaps could have referred the witness back to paragraph 94. Well, that's exactly what I'm doing now. So, so it's, it's, it's just that navigation is always easy. Let's have a look at the page. That's at page paragraph 94, uh, page 94, 16. Yes. The question was... It, was it produced or published? And it was actually produced at that time. Right. Um, so response was, was in re, my answer was in, in response to the produced, not the published. That report was leaked, and that report was leaked twice. It was leaked at the end of 20, yes. 2011, and again in 20, 2019. 19. But, but you see, we've, you, you were shown the Beacon report by council last time you appeared your report wasn't leaked what was leaked was a set of documents that had been provided to the assembly the article doesn't say that your report was leaked so again i, I mean i i'm simply puzzled when you gave evidence in 20 on the 28th of june what you're telling the commissioner is that you weren't saying it was published, is that right? What I was saying is that it was produced at that date. And to my knowledge, it was leaked all in December, 2011. And I may be wrong. You, it could be that it was simply, as you suggested, that um, the various, it wasn't just the beacon, by the way. It was um, on the radio, it was elsewhere. Um, the various entities, um, probably just got the information from from um, from the House of Assembly. From but what had been given to them. True, yeah, possibly. But going through one of the reports, and I can remember having this discussion with one of my staff, because um, my position was that they had gotten information from um, the House of Assembly. And she says to me, no, this is our report. And going through one of the reports, I realized that some of the things that were being said were actually taken from our report. And, um, which is why I say it has it was leaked. So, in other words, as at 2012, you would have known that although your report was getting partial leaks, it had not been published. Correct. It had not been issued um, by the ministry officially, and it had not been published by me. Quite. So if we can just look at that for a moment, if, if you could go to page 139 of the, of the day 49 transcript. You had, of course, um, Mrs. Webster at line eight, some scathing things to say about this project. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, a program where something is so blatantly false, so blatantly wrong. Um, you said we can't sit on it. Have you got that? 
No, not yet. No, I, I don't. Oh, I do beg your pardon. 139 of day 49. And Sir Jeffrey was reading from line eight. Line, line 10, roughly. You, you, you're saying there, you see how important it is in connection with that report that we can't just sit on it, as you put it. Have you, have you got it, Mrs. Webster? I'm not sure that I'm looking in the right bundle, actually. Page 139, day 49. It's, I, I, it's all difficult to deploy all these documents. I'm sorry. 139. Page 139 at the top. And then at line eight, um, the witness, that is correct. Yes. That's it. We, we've got yes. that. Thank you. Yes. I'm most grateful. And, and then if you continue on, you'll see how you're stressing the importance of this report, where something was so, as you put it, blatantly false, so blatantly wrong. You said you couldn't just sit on it because we can't get all the information. We can't just leave it, you said, on the side of our desks. Um, and you pointed out various other matters that concerned you about it. Now, my question to you is, given that importance, and if you'd look, at, if you'd look further on down the, uh, in the transcript, um, at 141, the same, the same one, So um, you say, you say um, for some time in this passage of evidence, um, um, the concerns you had about it uh, and what you felt the ministry should do. My, my question really is this, D did you ever inquire why the minister um, or of the ministry, why they had not tabled it, as it was their legal obligation to do? Sir, my job is to do the audit, complete mm -hmm. the report, pass it on to the ministry, and then their job commences there. Yes, but did you not have a discussion with Dr. Potter on the subject? It is their job to take the report forward. And I am not going to take any responsibility for the fact that they did not take the report forward. No, no but forgive me. This is a matter of public concern. You, you've said how important it is. It doesn't sit in somebody's desk. All I'm asking is, did you correspond with the, I think you said Dr. Potter was the permanent secretary at the time. Is that correct? That is correct. Did you advise Dr. Potter in any way? Did you say, for example, that she should use it for internal purposes? Or did you say, has she, will she be publishing it? Did you have that discussion? The permanent secretary knows what to do with an audit report, sir. But, but ultimately, you have the power to ensure it's made public, don't you? It's know what to do with an audit report then they would come back and ask me and I've had instances where they come back and ask me right but but this report was of particular significance you've drawn the commission's attention to it you said it was a very serious situation why did you not take steps to draw it to the public's attention we did we put it on our website but that was years later when we had a website yes well, you did it six, seven years later, but in 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, all the way up to 2019, your report did sleep in somebody's desk, didn't it? I'm sorry, okay. Sir, I'm so, I'm just, just, just one moment. Um, the, ju just to put page 139 into its proper context, which I'm sure, uh, Sir Jeff, you, you'd want that done. Of course. Um, the context of that, if, if, if the Auditor General reads from the top of page 139, uh, was um, the completion of the report by the Auditor General. Of course. So when of course. She, we, we can't sit on it. That, this, this was her explaining why uh, she completed it and uh, produced it. Yes, but, but there are many other examples. It, 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 where, where the, I'm sure the 
Auditor General isn't going to, I hope not, contest this. Um, you, you've repeatedly said in evidence to the Commission that it's important that material like this should be before the public, haven't you? Yes, I agree, agree with that principle. And my That's question right. is simple. Why did you not take steps to ensure it, the attention of the public was drawn to it until 2020? No, 2021. The report was sent to the ministry and within that report, if you've read it, there were a number of paragraphs that said to the ministry, you need to take further action on this. You need to get more information because the information that we have, the information that you have apparently begs the question, we'll get more information, otherwise try to recover the sums. But, but forgive me, you, you, you knew by 2012, 2013, they weren't doing that because nothing had surfaced. Correct. You might, you would have, if you didn't know by 2013, you'd have known by 2014, wouldn't you? By 2012, 2013, we would have been focused on other audits. But this was a very important matter. It, they're, it, all, it, they're, they're all very important. This is only important for a certain individual at the moment, but they're all very important. No, but I, I hear that. But but you've said that this was an important one. Uh, I simply need to understand, if I may, and I, maybe the commissioner would be assisted, why did you not, as you could, have taken steps to publish or draw to public attention that report at the time in 2012 and 2013? Because we were, at that time, engaged in other audits. And because this, this is an audit that went to the ministry and the ministry did nothing about it. Um, aside from the fact that we, uh, it's a particular ministry that, that we find uh, uh, reports tend to wind up in the press. On well, that makes it worse, doesn't it, Auditor General? It does, it does make it worse. So it why not publish? Why I don't publish, why didn't I publish it? Well, you had a, you, you take steps to draw it to public attention. I can't publish it until my um, financial statements have actually been tabled. Well, they would have been by then, surely, by 2013 at least. But they were tabled in 2013, yes. And, and the other thing you could have done is escalate it to a Section 20 report, couldn't you? You told the commissioners um, at day, we, we can look at it if you like, but day 18 at page 24, that you had a complete discretion to convert a Section 12 report into a Section 20 report. What, why not do that? So you put it to the governor. At the time, it did not occur to us to do this. It, at the time, it did not occur to us to do this. But quite apart from that, um, I am not sitting in my office wondering what's happening with N NPPVA report. I am not. I have other things to do. But this was a very controversial report, was it not? It was very controversial. And not I am it. not sure why you're focused on this one, because they're all very controversial. But, or, or did you know, um, who, in your, in your view, is primarily responsible uh, for publishing uh, the reports? Who is primarily responsible? I understand that once the financial statements for the relevant period are, are, are out, uh, or uh, the specific report has been tabled in the House, uh, you consider that you are able to publish it. But who is primarily um, responsible? The Permanent Secretary, it's her responsibility to move the report forward to Cabinet and then beyond that. Forgive me, I understand that, but you're the Auditor General. You occupy a constitutional office. You were concerned about the abuse of public money about which you've made excoriating criticism. Then you find that a minister has not followed his legal obligation, an auditable question itself, to produce this report before the assembly. And instead of publishing it yourself or taking steps to refer it to the governor, for some reason you take no action in connection with it until 2021, uh, this year, when earlier this year you put it on your website. And the question that I have for you is simple and legitimate. Why not? Oh. So just just let just let Sir Jeffrey ask his question, or okay. I'm why, sorry. Sir. Why not? Why didn't you publish it earlier? Is the question, Auditor General? 
because given those considerations. We did not have the means to publish it at that time. We have a website now, and that report, along with others, have been put on the website. But why not do it at the time by the simple expedient of, as you told the commissioner on day 18, uh, page 24, that you could easily do, which is convert a section 12 report into a section 20, thus referring it to the governor, who would have put it before the House? Uh, uh, the, the premise of that question, I think, is that a Section 12 report, once it's completed, you can convert to a Section 20 report. Can, can you do that? That's the Day premise. 18. Perhaps it would be helpful then to look at the transcript. And that we've done, but I'm thinking that it's possible. But my question is, why are we focused on one report when there are several that are just as important? Why this report? Well, uh, forgive me, that's a matter which I, I, I am permitted by the Commissioner to address questions to you on. I'm focused on it because I'm puzzled, as are those I represent, why this report seems to have been suppressed or withheld. And although one quite understands that the report may have been suppressed and withheld by the political government of the time, why the Auditor General took no steps that she could to bring so serious a matter to the attention of the governor and to the public thereby. Sir, I'm hearing you, but the Auditor General is not everything to everyone. And you have a ministry that has obligations there. It's their responsibility to take steps to ensure that this report is tabled. I cannot take on all the responsibilities of everyone they have to do their jobs. But had you happened to have a website in 2012, it would, it would have, have gone on to that. It would have been there, yes. Why do you think it was that no steps were taken to, for by the minister to refer, to table this report before the house? Did you discuss I, that with anybody? No, I cannot speak to that. Do you think it might have had something to do with the fact that in January 2012 and then in April 2012, Mr Skelton Klein was appointed by the then sitting government to a position as consultant to the Minister of Telecommunications and subsequently managing director of the port? I have well, no idea. But, but um, so, so Jeffrey, I, I'm not sure that um, the Auditor General can uh, speculate uh, as to that, uh, particularly in circumstances in which uh, you are representing the Minister and the Ministry. Well, not those Ministers, unfortunately. But the position, the position may, I, may I come back to the point, which and you're, you're maybe right, Mr Commissioner, so let me put, put the question rather differently. Was it not even more acutely in the public interest that this report should receive public attention when the person who was its subject had been appointing managing director of the British Virgin Islands port. Again, it was not my responsibility to move that report forward. We did our job, completed a report, we sent it to the ministry. I cannot do everything and I cannot be expected to do everything. No, thank you. Well, let me move on, if I may, to a, 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 another point. Um, and that is um, your report. I can put this fairly shortly because Council uh, asked, asked you questions. Um, that is to say, language. Um, Council for the inquiry put to you that uh, uh, the elected minister's concern that the language you had used in your report used the word inflate. What he did not put to you was that you had used the word inflate and, and also used the word falsified. Yes. In other words, you seem to have been accusing public officials of long standing of falsifying public documents. What did you mean? Did you mean they intentionally did so with fraudulent intention? I meant that they intentionally changed the figures that were sent to the Treasury. 
And those figures do not match what was submitted to them. Well, yes, but that presupposed that your theory as to how it was to, uh, to have been allocated the money was correct, but you were already in the possession of the knowledge that the banded system had been used, weren't you? We were not told that a banded system had been used, and I have not been given any, any kind of authorization for a banded system to be used. What we know from the policy is that individuals were to submit what they needed, their, uh, their wants, and that would be taken into consideration in terms of what would be paid. And that is in the, that is in the criteria that was um, publicized. Uh, everyone wrote and they complied. And then we saw where these submissions, the amounts in these submissions had been changed and then sent to the treasury. And as an accountant, you don't do that. That's the kind of thing that puts you in prison. And well, the, you use the word falsify. Well, that's exactly what happened. And the reason why we use that, um, that word, those words, falsify and inflate, is because a strong message has to be sent that you don't do this. Don't do it. But, but, but you had no evidence to suppose that anybody had a fraudulent intention, did you? I had the documents that show that the uh, amounts had been changed. But yes, but you, as you said, you base this on the fact that, that as you put it just a moment ago, the actual requests for the sums of money uh, that were being made by applicants were to be taken account of in the uh, uh, allocation of the money. It didn't mean that it needed exactly to equate to what they requested, did it? It'd be perfectly legitimate to adopt a banded system, wouldn't it? For ease and speed? If that was a policy, yes. Well, where was the policy that it wouldn't be? that it would be used uh, according to request and need. I, 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 can you help me where you find it set out in any cabinet decision that they intended any specific means of allocation of the money? Yes, they certainly intended evidence to be brought before those applying the scheme of what people were asking for, but that doesn't mean that they were going to allocate it precisely according to that, does it? They took it to a, they should take it into account, but what would be wrong with adopting a banded scheme? The banded scheme has not been approved by the cabinet. Well, no, no scheme had. What has been approved by cabinet is that individuals are to bring in what they need, bring in your photos, bring in the estimates, yes. and those will be taken into consideration in making you a payment. In yes. fact, what was approved by cabinet is that based on that information, the vendors would be paid on your behalf. That is what cabinet um, approved uh, during the period that they were putting this scheme together. But it said certainly that suppliers should be paid directly. So help me with this again to come back to the to the verb falsify. Do you not see that that connotes to many people reading it a deliberate fraudulent intent? Well, what I can say to you is that we saw the change figures, and we sent them a draft report, and we got no response. I see. Well, can we come on then to a different subject, which is um, the whole question of um, the assumptions that you made in the report? I wondered if you could go, um, I think you have there the Premier's Office response as it's entitled. I wonder if you could look at that. It should be in the bundle in front of you. I hope that message reached you. Let me try and find that for the Auditor General. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> That's in bundle one. Yes. I'm most grateful. Yes. But the um, preliminary report of 28th of June 2021, which um, Dr. O'Neill Morton said was going to be the response to the uh, Auditor General's draft report, is at 88. We're talking about the document entitled Premier's, Premier's Office Response. Not, not I think, that one. 
So this isn't the response. To, uh, uh, let me just make sure we've got the right reports here. Yes, yes. Reports. There was um, a, a, a report prepared by the um, uh, by Dr. O'Neill um, Morgan and, and her team um, at, at the time in draft, and then there's a response um, of the Premier. That's it. The, reports that, that there was there was a response to, to to the commission yes that's the one we're talking about we've got we've got that document that's the one at 220 excellent thank you and if you could turn to pa paragraph 58 of it I'd just like you to read paragraph 58, which sets out an example of a pandemic relief scheme that was used in the United Kingdom. And you will see, do you have it, um, Ms. Webster? We're getting there. Thank you. So let's just look at it together, if we may. Uh, for example, the paragraph reads, under the Small Business Grants and Retail and hospi Hospitality and Leisure Grant Schemes, um, in addition to the suspension of business rates, standard grants of £10,000 were made to any ratepayer, whether in active business or not, regardless of need and without application or request, which merely occupied premises that on the 11th of March 2020 were registered and eligible for small business or rural rate relief, which is in fact up to £12,000 rateable value, and to any retail, hospital, hospitality and leisure business that occupied premises registered for those uses with a rateable value up to 15000 and then 25,000 was given to retail, hospital and leisure businesses with premises up to a value of 51. Now, just pause there for a minute. I wonder if you could then go to day 39, sorry, uh, day 18, 28th, page 39. I'm sorry, Sir Jeffrey, I was just reading um, something. Yes, of course. Reference, please. Uh, but day 18, so the 28th of June, at page 39. At least I hoped it was. Um, bear with me just a minute, because um, it may be that I have the wrong um, wrong day. Just a minute. Thirty-nine. Yes, I thought it was, but I don't have that reference here, um, which is entirely my fault. Um, Bear with me just a moment, if you would. Well, I'm afraid I have a, 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 a what looks like a false reference. So, so the best thing for me to do, I think, sir, is um, invite the Auditor General to look at her report, um, which uh, on farmers and fishers, which um, You'll just bear with me a minute. I will find it is at uh, the the main bundle. Uh, if if it's before the auditor, I'm not sure. 
Uh, it is, but it's her report on the farmers and fishers scheme um, and the churches and schools scheme. I have it. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I haven't. Ah. I, I did ask that it be put. No, no, I, I, I personally haven't. I'm sure it's in one of the bundles, Sir Jeff. Yes. Um, Page 39. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, what one of the criticisms you make, and forgive me for not having the reference to hand, but uh, you, you, both in your evidence to the commissioner and in your reports, is that churches, for example, uh, made no application. Um, I think one reference, which we might be able to find, and I, again, it's my fault, uh, Ms. Webster, so please forgive me, but I think if we were to go to uh, 161 of day 49, uh, there are many other references, but um, sadly my reference note is not, um, is not accurate. But if you were to go to 161 of day 49, just by way of example. I'm just having to reach it by. Um, at line 20 on 161, you, you make the criticism of the scheme that which you found quite fundamental, which is that that many churches or some of them certainly did not apply and did not show any interest in being a part of the program and you say and what happened is that the government then took a million dollars and gave it to these individuals i imagine you mean churches even though they expressed no interest no need and no requirement now if you'd just reflect again on the document i showed you um that is to say, paragraph 58, you'll see that in the pandemic response schemes adopted in the United Kingdom, no application was required, no request, no indication of means, not even any indication that they were pursuing active business. Indeed, in many cases, they were boat moorings or empty lockups. And the point I make is that all of the strictures that you have adopted of the pandemic schemes before the commissioner could be applied, could they not, to the scheme which is summarized at paragraph 58 of the response. That, that's the UK scheme? Yes. I, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry, Sir Geoffrey, and this, if, before the Auditor General um, answers, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm completely lost. Well, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, well, sure why? I'm sure it's my fault, but I'm, and I'm sure you can clarify. Uh, the UK scheme had its own criteria, whatever those criteria were. Um, mm. Speaking for myself, uh, um, I, I have no problem uh, with a policy uh, that during uh, a particular crisis uh, involves um, giving money to people uh, for various reasons, including uh, stimulation of the economy, for example, uh, as a policy, uh, absolutely fine. But it depends, depends on what the criteria are. Uh, and so I think that the, isn't a, the, the right art question to ask the Auditor General first is, uh, what criteria uh, did she audit against? I mean... No, with, with respect, I don't agree with that. And of course, if you want me to examine the witness according to your scheme and pattern, then I will do that. But I would, I would permit, be asked to be permitted to continue with my examination, which has a point and to which I hope will become clear. Um, I wonder if the witness might be permitted just to answer my question. Could not the criticisms that you made, that no application was needed, that it was not based on means, these were the criticisms that you've made, Madam Auditor General, of the schemes that were before the Commissioner. No application, not based on means, gratuitous payments, as you described them, 
gratuitous payments made without merit. Now, how does that differ? Would, would that criticism not apply exactly to the scheme that is set out at paragraph 58? In all due respect, sir, I don't know what the criteria was for those payments. The, the criteria exactly is set out at 58. I've seen the cabinet paper for those payments. What you mean for, for, for the UK scheme? Yes. Well, I mean, I can assure you, madam, that that, that is an accurate statement of what how the scheme worked. Just assume it is for the moment. I do not but, understand why we would seek out worst case scenarios with no, which no, no, no. as but that's not that's not what I'm doing, Madam Auditor General. What I'm pointing out to you is that your criticisms of these schemes could be applied to many pandemic schemes that were, were, were used in the United Kingdom and for that matter elsewhere in the world, because they were not dependent on means, application, request, or even merit. Many people got massive windfalls. The point is that when you are administering an emergency scheme, blunt-edged tools are inevitable. Every country around the world found that. But your report does not seem to take account of that. Why not? I would go back to what you just said, and you said that this was a part of their criteria. It's not a part of us. That was not the criteria that was set out in our um, cabinet. So if, if indeed that was a part of the UK's criteria, there is absolutely nothing wrong with making those payments. That was not a part of our criteria. But, but forgive me, it, it, nowhere did it say that churches needed to apply in the cabinet policy, did it? The policy said that churches that did not apply would be given a nominal amount. I see. But just help me with, with, with the issue, please. If you are dealing with an emergency, a crisis, it is perfectly understandable, is it not, to adopt blunt-edged, often highly over-inclusive means to reach the targets. I see the, 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 the rhetorical gestures of, you, of the Commissioner. I wonder, I wonder what that means. It seems to me that that's a matter of policy and uh, the Auditor General is an auditor. But um, uh... I, I agree. But so, well, let me just, if I may, continue just a little bit on these li lines. 200 line if you could go to 206 of the of the hearing 206 page 206 I'll just bear with me a minute while my computer catches up. Now, at two, page 206, Auditor General, um, and I hope line 19, you, you make the point that the correct way to have started with the farmers and fishers scheme was um, to start by building the department so that they're in a position to get out there and help farmers and see what they need and make recommendations. That would have been perfectly possible if this had not been a crisis in which the cabinet had declared that immediate relief was needed. But what sort of time would it have taken to build up the department so that they were capable of doing what you wanted? Okay, first of all, that was in response to a statement that was made in your submission, uh, the Premier's Office submission, where they essentially said that the, the Department of Agriculture um, could not do what they were supposed to do because they did not have the resources. What I was saying, and then the starting point would be to actually help them to get to the position or get to the place where they could actually be of use to, to the, the scheme, to the program, rather but you than- you didn't have time in a crisis. 
Of course you had time. They were asking for help and you were giving away money left, right and center. What was wrong in providing them with what they needed in order to be a part, an effective part of this program? Well, the, 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 the Premier's office response, as you know, says not only did they want vehicles and various other pieces of equipment, they also claim that they didn't have the resources to help, not just in terms of equipment, but this was an emergency. How would you build up a department in the How middle of an emergency? You build the industry when you don't have any way of monitoring what is going on in it. And if you don't start with the department, at least put them in a position where they could be useful, then you've spent money that we can't really account for. Well, um, again, what I would suggest to you is that when you are delivering an emergency stimulus to a, a, an economy that is on the trauma table and has been shut down, countries all around the world have adopted highly over-inclusive, highly blunt-edged means of getting that money to the target areas. And the priority, uh, as the Premier's office response says, was to get the money to the people, wasn't it? As urgently as possible. We understand that the system would not have been perfect, but there are many things that could have been done. And, yeah. and mentioned one of them, which would be to, to help the department get up to speed so that they could work with this program. That was one of them. That was a key one. There were many things that could have been done that could have been done within this program to, to make it work better. Another one would be to insist that these people register their commercial farmers and fishermen. All right, we will assist you, but we need you in our registry so that we can follow how you're doing, see what your needs are and perhaps help you um, in any other way that you might need help. But this the announcement of this scheme produced a more than 25% increase in the number of registered farmers and fishers. We don't know, you see. Well, you said so. It's in your report. Yes, it is in my report. What I said is the number of registrations increased. We don't, know that, we, we don't know that those are commercial farmers or fishers. Well, they, I mean, if they were to be registered, they'd the have to be registered. The system works. The way the system works, I can register as a farmer. Right. Well, let, let, let me move on, because I don't want to detain you uh, unduly um, uh, anymore. You also said, I think, at, at page 220, um, when council was asking you about the checking of your assumptions relating to fishing boats and fishing crew, page 220, that uh, when the criticism was put to you, or the observation, uh, this is at the same transcript, um, Auditor General, but at, at, at uh, page 220. I'm sorry, which page, Sir Geoffrey? Page 220. In day 49. Day 49, same transcript as we've been looking at. Uh, line uh, right at the bottom, line 23. We're being asked about the boats. We won't mention the vessel's names, but um, as Council put it, one particular example you used did stand out in, in your report, and you were asked why you hadn't uh, checked that the three crew in fact owned their own boats before saying in your report that they'd all made claims for the same vessel. Um, multiple claims, as you put it, for the same equipment uh, for the same vessel. Now, your answer to that was at line 24 is, how are we to find the boats? Because at least the farms are supposed to be stationary, but boats move around. But you had the names of the crew, did you not? You're assuming that we also had their contact information. Well, uh, but they were registered at the Department of Agriculture. What I should point out with that is that the individuals who, um, if, if those two other individuals actually own boats, those would be unregistered fishermen, which no, means no, that... For, 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 forgive me, that's just not right. The point is that many of these vessels had been damaged since the hurricanes. 
And therefore, they couldn't fish on them because they hadn't had the money to be able to re-equip them with their engines and equipment. They were registered to that vessel, but they had their own boats. And your answer for not checking that was how would you find the boats? But you could person perfectly easily have found the individuals, couldn't you? Not necessarily. Again, you're assuming that the contact detail was available. Um, and my point was, even- well, Are you saying they weren't? My point was, even if they have boats, those boats should still be in the register. Whether or not those boats are functional, they should still be in a register. Did if they are registered, if they're registered captains, their the vessels should be in the register. But Sir Jeffrey, are you saying that they were registered? What I'm saying is they had other vessels and these men were, re re were registered as crew. And all it would have needed is a phone call to them. No, I'm, oh. so, I'm sorry, Sir Jeffrey. Are you saying that the, um, two vessels that these crew members of vessel number three um, were masters of were registered vessels. I'm not saying that. I'm saying they existed, but they oh. hadn't been able to be used for years. No, I, I, I understand that. So they were not registered vessels. So these two individuals um, uh, claim for an engine as crew members of vessel number three. Claim for different In addition, I would point I'm sorry, you froze there for a moment, Sir Jeffrey. Oh. Could you just repeat that? What, what they claim for was different engines. In other words, they weren't all the same engine. But my point at the moment, if I may be permitted to explore it, is why it was not possible simply to call these people or to get in touch with them. Their details are on the uh, with the ministry because they are registered as crew to that vessel why not just call them and check whether they were making fraudulent claims or not or making claims as you put it for the same vessel for the same equipment because sir the contact details may not have been in the register quite apart from that um, there is no indication there would be no indication that these are actually if they are captains or masters, there's no indication that they were actually registered or licensed captains. And as such, they still don't qualify because they're not licensed, they still don't qualify. Based on the well, Forgive me, there was, there was a criterion that you could say you'd been fishing. Was there not a criterion that you could, you could have an attested letter Yes. That somebody had been fishing, so they didn't need to be registered. That's true. We have not received any copies of those from the Premier's office. No, but before you make an allegation in an <laughs> audit report... I'm sorry, let me finish. In addition to that, we have not received any evidence from the Premier's office that these two other people actually own boats. So simply saying that that is the case doesn't mean that it is the case. We need evidence. Well, let's leave that. Let's assume for the moment it is. What I'm suggesting to you is that you could have explored it. And before you made an allegation that, it, that clearly implies potentially at least fraudulent conduct, wouldn't it have made more sense to have checked whether there was a basis for them applying for this or requesting this relief? So, Jeffrey, I don't think there's any evidence of this. But are you suggesting that the Premier's office did check this? Yes. But before the event? Well, no, no, no. What we, what we know is that, um, well, I can't give evidence. So I, if, if you want submissions on me, and I, I will certainly do so, the Premier's office response makes it abundantly clear, and that has been attested to by the Premier as well as the Permanent Secretary, that in these cases, I wonder if I might finish my question, if I may, that in these cases, in these cases, these persons owned their own boats and were applying for relief in connection with them. And the point I'm simply making, and it is abundantly plain, that before an auditor makes a suggestion that in its essence, deliberate claims have been made for the same equipment, for the same vessel, and money has been acquired from the public, essentially under what would appear to be a suggestion of false pretense, 
a check should be made to ensure that suggestion is safe. Of so, course, an auditor might well point out the anomalies. Based on our checks with a record, these individuals do not own licensed boats. That is what the record show. We sent to the Premier's office a draft report that they had for almost a month. They had the opportunity to come back to us and say, hey, this is not the case. They did not do that. So they cannot at this stage come to us and say, well, you know, this is wrong. They had an opportunity for a month to come back well, to I think, us. I think, I think they're entitled to come and tell the truth, Madam Auditor General. And say to and, them, this is the they... purpose of us sending it to them. And we have not received any evidence from the Premier's office to date, none, to show that these individuals, one, were licensed, two, they had boats, and in fact, that there were actually three different boats. No evidence. So, uh, as, as I said, you don't need to be licensed to receive relief. Basically, your word against the records that we have checked and verified that these people do not own boats. It's your words mm -hmm. against the records that are contained in agriculture department. But, but, all, but also, uh, Sir Jeffrey, as I understand it, um, the, the role of an audit the, the role of an auditor uh, is to audit. And is to observe careful language, which is properly justified by the facts before her. And the case of the ministers, as you know, and it is a matter for you to decide plainly, or at least for you to consider as part of your report, is that the language that has been used in this report is excessive and goes beyond the facts that existed before the Auditor General. Not to say that criticisms were not justified, and I not to not to say that a, may I just finish if I may which the, that is in that report matches exactly the evidence that we had I'm and sorry. it still matches the evidence that we had you have not presented anything different we what received I, we received let me finish we received a bundle of almost 800 pages and in that bundle no evidence what were we to do with that be careful, I would suggest, and use your language sparingly and carefully. All the time in the world to put together that bundle. What you could have done is presented us with copies of the information that we requested, which would include, which would include the notified letters, notarized letters that these individuals should have had. That is what I would expect to, to see in a bundle. That Madam did not Auditor General, I'm not disputing any of that. I'm but, not disputing that you should have had information. What time? I, I wonder if I, I wonder if I might be permitted to get a word in. Without producing any evidence at all, and how is that permitted? You can sit there and say this and that and the other. We have evidence that these people were not in the register. You say you have evidence of something else. Produce it. Send it to us. It's well, not sufficient and it's not satisfactory for you to come and sit there and say you you have something else and not send it to us. Well, if you look at my response, it's not, it's not that, me. But uh, okay, if, if, may I complete my question? For that particular issue, we said send us the evidence. We can make amendment in addendum. We have not received any evidence at this stage. I'm wondering. And as I'm trying to say, Madam Auditor General, it's, I don't want you to think for a moment that I, I disagree with much of what you've said about the availability of material. The point that I'm seeking to make is that your language, when you carried out checks on the farmers, you went and found 19 farms or expected them, your reason to the Commissioner was that you couldn't find the boats. Well. All I'm asking is, why not simply contact those crew members to ascertain what the facts were? Because the, in, the information was not available. But they have to give their names and addresses when they register as crew. How do you find someone with a name and address? But, uh, but Sir Geoffrey, I, I, I've heard the evidence. I've heard yes, your... I'm leaving it there. I mean, I understand your submission, and your submission goes not not really, as I understand it, uh, to the qualities of the audit as an audit, uh, but to the language that the um, Auditor General has used. Yes, I think in this case, case it, that is exactly right. That the concern is that that, that there has been a, 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 an expression, and um, may I say, as as you so know, my private opinions are one thing, and what the Auditor General 
uh, is understandably concerned about the questions I'm putting, but I put them as you, sir, no, sir, on instructions. And frankly, um, uh, the concern that I'm seeking to articulate here is that the language used in this report. My concern, sir, is no, that no, you are no, you no, are no, making no, statements that are unsupported, and these statements are actually going to be reported elsewhere. And we have not received any evidence of anything that you've said. And I think that is that is reckless. Well, no, no, it's not reckless because I've actually checked my facts. I have actually seen the evidence. Whether you will, when and where you'll get it you, uh, is a matter for others. But the reality is, the reality is that an exercise has been done. And certain of these people, as the Premier's office response sets out in writing, have confirmed they have other vessels laid up for various reasons uh, the for, which the, for which the applications were made, which is what the Premier's office response says. Now, I want to leave it there because but, I, I... Sir Geoffrey, um, yes. this, this is um, important. Um, you don't, as I understand it, on, on this particular um, criticism, um, seek to criticise the audit as an audit. Uh, the only thing you criticise under this particular criticism uh, is the language that the um, Auditor General has used. And I have heard... I think I, uh, yes. Heard I, the think we, I think um, we make two points. The first is the language. The second point is that the report fails to grasp the context and crisis nature of a pandemic scheme being operated against the clock in the immediate pressure of people suffering genuine hardship, where all around the world, these value for money principles were being relaxed, if not abandoned altogether. I know, but I've heard a lot of evidence about that. I've heard the yeah. evidence about the criteria um, that were adopted by um, uh, Cabinet, the criteria which is set out in the Premier's, um, uh, the Premier's office's response, initial response, for example, on page uh, 35 of that response, which sets out the criteria that Cabinet adopted uh, for farmers and on the following page uh, for fishermen. It goes on to set out how they were to be assessed under the, under the criteria as uh, the Cabinet uh, uh, required. I have those criteria. I've had evidence as to how those criteria uh, were changed, and um, I, I will have to make of all of that what I can. Uh, but in respect of, of, of this particular criticism, I've, I've, I've heard your submissions. Well, I just want then to move finally to this question, related question of cabinet policy. Just, um, one, just one moment, Jeffrey, Jeffrey. Before you move on, may, may I just um, raise one point before we forget it? Because I think the, the questioning has focused on what is um, paragraph 101 of the Premier's Office's response, which is at page 236 in the bundle. Um, uh, and that's the challenge. The, the Auditor General, um, I put that to the Auditor General, and, and Geoffrey has taken her to it. In fairness to the Auditor General, she then then go on to explain on page 221 uh, why her audit uh, drew the conclusion that she did uh, but what I would mention is that Sir Geoffrey has said uh, that he has seen the evidence there is no evidence cited in the Premier's office response um, which was prepared on the 7th of September or submitted to the Commission on the 7th of September so the evidence existed by the 7th of September it was not made available when Dr. O'Neill Morton gave evidence on the 8th of October and she was asked to produce it. It still hasn't been produced. And in fact, what the commissioner has been asked to do is grant another extension to provide it. If Sir Geoffrey has seen it, can we have it tomorrow, please? And, and with respect to Jeff, because we've been pressing for this information, uh, this, um, these documents, because they are relevant uh, to the evidence this week uh, and we still haven't, we still haven't. I, I'm aware of that and uh, urgent efforts are being taken. I, I have thought this was a session for me to ask questions of the witness. I realize that both counsel and you, Commissioner, wish to ask questions of me, but would it not be better at least uh, to finish this witness, uh, whom I was very anxious to be able to uh, release or to allow you to release as soon as possible? And I just have a few more questions to make, and then I'm yours. 
if you wish to continue to grill me rather than permit me to ask the witness questions. No, um, I, I, I've absolutely no wish to, to, to grill I'm you. I'm most obliged. Why don't I finish then? But, I, but what I, I would like uh, is for the questions to be um, uh, asked uh, on a procedurally fair basis. And well, if of course. You, if you have information upon which you're asking questions, which neither we uh, nor the witness, uh, despite the fact that I've asked for it, have not seen, uh, that may... My, my, my questions with respect are, do not, are not contingent upon what I have or haven't seen. The point that I have sought to address with this witness is that she makes assumptions based on the evidence she has that were not checked. It's as simple as that. And if before, before you... Let me finish, madam, if you'll be so kind. The evidence it, 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 against the record... Madam, it is important that we have a normal procedure. And while it's perfectly normal for judicial interventions during counsel's questioning, it's not normal for a witness to interrupt a question. So just allow me, if you would be so kind, to finish the question. And the point is that you had available to you the names and addresses of those whom you could have sought confirmation about in exactly the same way as you did with the farmers. And yet you chose not to do so, but rather to suggest that, on the, that, that you could be confident that applications were made for the same equipment and for the same vessel. And that is the criticism we make, sir. And right. the witness has addressed it. She couldn't find the boats. That's what she told you. Sorry, I said that we didn't go to look for the boats because we did not have the information. How are we going to find it if we don't have the details? You had the names and addresses. The, the names of the vessels. Uh, well, I would suppose that you go out and find the vessels based on the names. Now, with respect don't to... You the just with respect to the farmers, we were able to get additional information from the Department of, of Agriculture for those individuals, which allowed us to go out and look for those. That information was not available for the boats. So you just contact the individual and say, where's your boat? And how do I do that, Pretel Pigeons? Oh, you, you've got a name and address. We don't have the numbers. The numbers of what? The individuals. Well, visit them. You have their address. You went to the farms. Why not visit the individuals? I have the farms. And you, again, you're missing the point. These are boats. But the, they, they will be able to tell you where their boats That's are, the, won't they? Actually, besides the point, because our information is based on what was in the registers, those individuals are not in the registers as masters. All right. So, are, but perhaps we can move on just to the final point, which I wanted to raise with you. You assume, uh, Auditor General, uh, as I understand your evidence, that a policy once approved by the Cabinet could only be changed by the Cabinet. Is that right? Is that an assumption? The um, Constitution actually makes a provision that policy is made by Cabinet and that ministers carry out the policy in accordance with, with what has been provided in Cabinet. Well, so, so your assumption is then that a minister is not entitled in any circumstances to change a Cabinet or aspects of a Cabinet policy unless he returns to the Cabinet to get that approval. Is that your understanding? I haven't seen any legislation that permits that. Right. So it is your understanding. I have now, not you, you, were in, you were in the presence of evidence that the policy had been changed, weren't you? In fact, de facto. Refresh my memory, please. Well, you could see that the criterion adopted, criteria adopted by the Cabinet were not being implemented, but some other means of approaching it, payment to the applicants directly, for example. Yes? So we clearly that would be the change. Is, um, in, with respect to the application of the policy, the criteria, we saw changes um, within the ministry. Basically, they did not um, comply with the policy. Yeah. And, and if it were, in fact, legally available to a minister to change the policy um, on the basis that he would believe that he could return later to the cabinet at some point, but his, that his colleagues would be in support of it, would that somehow influence your report? 
if there was evidence that he had contacted them and um, and gotten their approval, and I've seen that happen. I've so seen, it I've would seen, make a difference. There is a round robin approval of a change per se. No, but I, uh, let, let's just assume for a moment that a minister is entitled in his ministry to make changes to policy um, in his own ministerial uh, field, um, would it change your report? An assumption? If it were so. I would not change a report on an assumption. Well, uh, I'm asking you to assume for the moment that the, the position could be that a minister had changed a policy perfectly legitimately, and you were in the presence of evidence that applicants were being paid directly rather than suppliers. Would it change your report? I would prefer to get the change policy in my hand. That would change my report. I see. Very well. Well, thank you very much, Madam Auditor General. It's, uh, I'm most grateful to you for coming. I'm, I'm sorry to have kept you as long as we have, but I hope not, not too long. Good. Thank you, Jeff. Those are my questions. Anything else, Mr. Howard? No, thank you. Good. Um, that, I think, concludes the business of the day. Uh, tomorrow... Well, I wonder if I might detain you. Need, no need for the witness, just for a moment. Uh, certainly. Um, Auditor General, uh, thank you for coming back and, and answering these questions um, uh, as you have. Uh, and um, it, it has been useful. Some of it has been useful. Uh, so thank you very much for your time and, and your uh, evidence. I'm pausing just out of courtesy to the witness because I didn't want to, it's got nothing to do with the witness. It's simply, if I may, an application that I need to make to you this evening. Um, in the course of the evidence of both the current governor and the former governor, and I think the Auditor General, uh, reference has been made by Mr. Riot to written responses to the warning letters. Um, and in the case of the governors, uh, if I can, um, I, I refer them uh, to them compendiously. Um, documents appear to have been supplied to you, sir. Um, the participant has not seen that um, those documents nor the written responses. And my application is that we should do so. The documents from to which Mr. Jasper referred today seem to contain relevant figures and relevant facts and details, which those I represent would like to have so that we can consider what, if any, uh, response or further inquiries need to be make, made in connection with them. So my application is, could we please see the written responses of each of the three recent witnesses? Yes, of, of course, of course uh, the responses of all of the um, uh, those to whom uh, criticism letters have been sent uh, have, have not yes. been. But I understand the application, Mr. Rawat. Um, well, um, I, I think in, in relation to the Auditor General, um, because I think the, the application is, is related to, as well as the Auditor General, as I understand it. Um, it, it may be better just to wait until we've collected all of the material because we're waiting in relation to that for um, the information in relation to the boats. Um, we're waiting for um, more material that's got to come in, uh, which was missing from the Premier's office response. Uh, we're waiting, although you've given an indication that if it doesn't uh, arrive, um, then you will draw a conclusion from that. 
uh, for Dr. O'Neill Morton to actually confirm which parts of her preliminary report actually responded to the Auditor General's reports. Um, so I think it might be better to take stock in relation to that. Uh, in relation to um, the, the governors, um, I think what I'd suggest to commissioners, we revisit it at the end of their evidence. Um, we can d deal with it tomorrow morning, but um, the material, I mean, it, it begs a bigger question because the, the material that um, I've been taking Mr. Jasper through is material that was provided by um, the Attorney General in response to a, a request from the Commission that uh, all relevant documents cited in the um, position statement of the elected ministers be disclosed and, and what we're finding is of course is uh, uh, and what um, Mr Jasper pointed out during the course of today is that um, the it's letters from the premier are being disclosed but letters from the governor which must have been received by the premier uh, because the premier responds to them have not been disclosed so, so I'd suggest perhaps we, we just consider it overnight and then um, see how the best and, and um, I, I, I'm, so, I'm totally baffled by that. Either the government, by which I mean the elected ministers, are participants in this, in which case they are entitled to see the material that you have seen, or they are not. And frankly, at the moment, the sense that we have as your sole, at least per continuous participant, is that participation is not really meaning a very great deal. Um, this is the first opportunity that I have examined witnesses. During the course of that examination, I have been interrupted. I have been subjected to argumentation, not only from counsel from Mr. Rowett, but rather more from you. I now apply for a basic and fundamental standard of equitable treatment, which is to see the documents to which Mr. Jasper referred when he spoke of figures, which you wrote down, I noticed, uh, of the amounts of funding provided by the United Kingdom government. And I'm told I, can, I, I may not be able to have them or I can't have them until tomorrow or the next day. What is the point of that when I may have to cross-examine? Well, uh, um, well, uh, let, let's just sort of break this down slightly. Well, I, I think we should, because it's a real concern. And, and if I may say so, um, the frustrations on both the inquiry team side and the participant side are all too manifest, both in the correspondence and in your frequent criticisms of those I represent and those who are instructing me. Uh, but we should try to put aside those for the sake of you reaching a proper conclusion. And all I seek is equitable and fair treatment of the participant. How on earth can it be wrong for me to not to see, or rather to see documents that you have that are influencing your thinking at the time I need to see them, which is when the witnesses are giving evidence? I simply don't understand the point of uh, delay. Sorry. Mr. Jeffrey, I, I haven't said anything about this application yet at all. Oh, well, in that case, I apologise. If I'd been premature and you were going to grant it, then I'd be most grateful. But because um, I want to see them as soon as possible. Yes, uh, but uh, firstly, in relation to the responses, uh, we have told all of the witnesses uh, who have had letters of criticism that their responses would be confidential. Uh, and therefore, um, to um, uh, release them to the participants, um, I, I would need at least to speak to the the the, um, uh, the responders, the, the the two governors in, in uh, that we're speaking about. Um, uh, not What's just about the documents. Not just as a matter of courtesy, but um, uh, as a matter of. Uh, secondly, in relation to the documents, um, I, I, I will I will look at the, the, the documents and see whether there is any good reason for not letting you have uh, the documents. Well, I'm uh, most grateful for that. As soon as possible, if I may. And, and may, may I observe this point? Sir Geoffrey, just one this, moment. Yes? Sir Geoffrey, I'm afraid you, you, you do. You have to let me finish uh, when I'm speaking. There's um, a delay. I'm sorry on the line that I've got. And, and, and I'm sorry because I, I know there's a delay and sometimes it's difficult to... I, I know it's more difficult to interrupt and not interrupt people remotely. 
Um, but I will look up them. Um, but uh, certainly some of the documents um, your, your clients will have um, because they will, because they're the... Um... No, 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 I agree, but there are plainly ones we don't. He's citing clear figures that have been prepared for your inquiry on this critical issue of funding for the public service, on which, if I may say, probably deserved its own separate section of your inquiry, um, because we now need to go away and look. A suggestion was made by Mr. Jasper that this government had imposed a pay a recruitment freeze. We need to go and look at that. We need to look at the figures that Mr. Jasper's quoted clearly from documents in front of him and which he served. But we don't, because I don't think we accept, uh, I'm afraid, quite a lot of what is said. So unless I'm able to have the documents, we can't put before you what the facts may or may not be. That's my point. Uh, I, I will look at the documents and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, uh, you. As you know, uh, where we can, uh, we share everything with not only the participants, uh, but the, the, the public. Uh, but we will look at these documents and come back to you as soon as we can. Um, I, I understand the, the, under, the, the foundation of the submission, uh, which is that the uh, elected ministers, uh, in defending their uh, position effectively, uh, well, not effectively, in defending their position, um, uh, need to see uh, the evidence, including the documentary evidence, uh, that um, the position that uh, they have to defend uh, is based upon. I understand that. Um, and uh, they will have that opportunity. Um, you, you will appreciate that um, uh, some of the evidence, when it's uh, given orally, uh, is new to us as well. Um, and the... the um, uh, but I, I will consider the application and come back to you as soon as as soon as we can, uh, both oh, with regard, both with regard to the position statements uh, and also with regard to the um, accompanying documents. Thank you. Now, do I understand that you have a directions hearing shortly? It will either be tomorrow or Friday. Uh, Friday. I think it would Friday. be a good a good time to to take stock and make directions for the next stage of the uh, inquiry. Yes, um, there may be a matter I need to raise with you at some point. Um, it may be perhaps first by communication with Mr. Wright. Um, uh, 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 but let me, it, it, Friday will probably do for that. Yes, okay, good. Anything else, Mr. Uh, Sir Geoffrey? No, thank you. Anything else, Mr. Wright? No, thank you, Commissioner. Good, thank you all. Um, thank you very much. Good tomorrow. Good tomorrow. Good, thank you.